Hi, my dear buddies, Punarvas Jayakumarya. So, guys, you have been asking me for the revision classes for so long. So, here is part number one. Are you all ready? So, this is the marathon revision for direct taxes. So, here we have part number one. And as and when I record part number two, I'll be releasing. This is purely for November 2023, my dear friends. So, here in this, very simple, please listen to me. Here, I'll just be doing the conceptual revision of everything and i'll also be releasing uh, the q and a series where we'll be discussing question and answers and mcqs in due course of time but this is purely uh, regarding concepts because guys if our concepts are not strong it's not possible for us to write the uh, i mean solve the questions properly so without further ado this is for ca final direct taxes november 2023 only it's not for May 24 or November 24, it is for November 2023, a complete revision. Uh, part number one, here goes, right, let's begin my dear friends. So, I will be doing it from my Taxverse book. So, the Taxverse book is a, you know, a colorful book which is this. So, I'll be doing the entire revision from this. It's more like a summary book and everything is there completely covered in an exhaustive manner. So, I'll be doing it from that and of course, from the... Uh, you know, for examples, I will, uh, you know, look into other things as well. So, without further ado, shall we begin, my dear friends? Come on, before we go ahead, I want a fist bump from all of you. All of you that from the screens, fist bump. All right, superb. So, let's begin, my dear friends. First of all, we'll have to discuss, like, what do you mean by the assessment year, previous year, etc. And little bit, initially, uh, basics, and then we'll directly... This basics, you would have said in inter also, anyway. But anyway, before we go into the law... We have to do the basics. You would have seen my uh, marathon revision of law and you have seen how exhaustive it is. This also I will try to make it as exhaustive as law itself. Right? Yes. So, the subjects may change but methodology will never change my dear friends. So, guys, uh, basically for November 2023, the Finance Act applicable would be Finance Act 22 and the previous year would be 22-23. And assessment year would be 23-24. Assessment year is the year in which the tax will be assessed, whereas previous year is the year for which the tax is assessed, as simple as that. Now, there are many such, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, you will hear many words during the course of the discussion. So, let's talk about those words. First is about rules. These rules are the procedures which are framed by CBDT, that is Central Board of Direct Taxes. It is very much part of the law itself. So, basically the rules when they frame, rules keep on changing. Rules are very much part of the law, right? The law is nothing but the Income Tax Act. Now, there are many such, uh, you know, uh, clauses that you will find. So, if there is something called, for example, uh, 7 one, it means 7 subsection 1. 7 1A, 7 subsection uh, 1, I mean section 7, subsection 1, clause number A. That is the clause. So, for every section, there will be a subsection and after that, there will be a clause. But, as far as definitions are concerned, which are given in section number 2, uh, since each of the definitions are separate in itself, for section number 2, there will be no subsections. For section number 2, it is only clause. So, for example, if it is 2, 1A, I will call it 2, clause 1A because that is agricultural in income, it is called clause 1A. So, wherever there are independent things, in independent lines, independent concepts in each of those sections, those are not called subsections, they are directly called clauses, right? That's what it is. Third one, a subsection is very much part of a section, my dear friends, yes. Then you would have heard the dialogue called notification. Now, what are these notifications? Notifications are legislation itself, subordinate legislation. So, this will help in what? Uh, you know, adding more to the law in itself. So, any exemption if the government wants to give and any more clarity if the government wants to give, if they want to uh, make certain amendments, all these things, it's a subordinate legislation issued by CBDT. All this can happen only by publishing in something called as the official gazette. In the official gazette, all these things will be published and without being published, it can never be called as a notification. So, official gazette is the, what do you say, uh, official communication, whenever a government wants to officially communicate, it will do through the official gazette. And a notification, mind you, is binding on each and every person. So, everyone has to follow, including the SSE, including the SING officer, everyone for that matter. Circular, on the other hand, guys, these are uh, guidelines and clarifications issued by CBDT purely for the tax officers. 
so how to collect how not to collect etc that's purely that's called a circular it is binding on tax officers and of course the chartered accountants also have to go through that because we have to advise our clients accordingly so recently there was this um, credit card if i use my credit card abroad will it be part of the liberalized re uh, remittance scheme is what the government wanted to intend so they gave many circulars these circulars are like guidance to the income tax officers to figure out what to do what not to do and how to manage the entire show what does a proviso or a proviso do a proviso either adds on to the section or gives an exception to the section so either it gives one more addition or it gives an exception that is what a proviso does uh, right so if i say you youtube students of pj or means the best students when i use the word means it is an exhaustive definition correct no other meaning can be given it is exhaustive however i can add a proviso some of the students are okay okay i'm just giving an example all of you are awesome just an example i'm giving so proviso provided that some of the students are okay which means what many of them are good some of them are okay it gives an exception or it i can add on to it what add on provided that most of them are awesome means what i'm adding on to the subsection so basically when a proviso comes they'll use the word provided that second proviso they'll use provided further that third proviso they'll use provided also fourth proviso onwards it is also only right now when the act uses the word means it means it's an exhaustive definition or a very restrictive definition no other meaning can be given it is quite exhaustive quite in depth then they also use the uh, words in the definition called includes right includes so inclusive definition is what includes means we know what the meaning is apart from that it also includes much much more is what it means right so let's see the example in the bear act itself right so if you see guys all these things most of the definitions are all exhaustive assistant director means assistant director of income tax this is not assistant movie director that's what i'm saying so if it is assistant director includes assistant director of income tax it will also include movie director and all that that's what i'm trying to tell right so if you see ah books of accounts you see books of accounts what do you mean by books of accounts as generally what do you mean by books of accounts you have your cash book then your uh, you know your uh, assets and liabilities your uh, incomes and uh, receipts and payments so, so to speak but that's it right that's all it is but you see here and your cost records this is as per companies act but see in income tax act it is an inclusive definition it includes what day books ledger cash book account book whatever book you can think either in written form or electronic form everything is covered in the definition of books of accounts because it's an inclusive definition that's what i'm trying to tell right now section 4 guys it's a revision session so in uh, my regular batch i go extremely in depth i show you the bear act i will we will decode each and every section and also in my fast track premium batch we will uh, definitely do the same depth but then of course the problems etc will be slightly lesser uh, but of course in uh, regular batch it will be more in depth even in terms of explanation uh, but in this i will not cannot sit and explain the logic behind each and everything it's a pure revision session right i am just clarifying it but all the concepts will try to cover all the important concepts for the november 23 examination and we'll try to solve few problems through other videos uh, q and a videos and quizzes right yes and of course the mcqs as well now section number 4 of income tax section numbers and all no need to remember it's okay but automatically you would have been accustomed to this uh, section numbers in various uh, you know heads of income in this particular video i will try to cover uh, pgbp capital gain and uh, pro properly clubbing of income ifos let's see this is my agenda at least those uh, main heads of income will try to cover and uh, your other areas assessment procedures etc we can probably do it in the next video right so tax on income of ssc basically section 4 says tax will be on the income of the ssc who is a person basically person so guys i need to understand what is tax what is total income and who is a person tax so there are two types of tax which is given in the uh, section 4 one it says rates in force and rates as per the act you will see many places where they say rates in force many places in the act where they say rate as per the act right rates in force means what whenever the act uses the word rates in force it is as per the finance act as you know the amendments in the law and the changes etc are being proposed every year by the finance minister in the finance act 
So, for example, if you go to section 194D, uh, it says that the uh, TDS rate will be as per the rates in force. Rates in force means every year the Finance Act may change the rates if they want to. On the other hand, if I see 194J, my professional services, there it clearly mentions 2% for technical services and 10% for others. Clear cut in the act itself, they have given the rates, which means what? This is the rates as per given in the Income Tax Act. Very, very simple. So, when they use the word rates as per the act, it is given in the Income Tax Act. When they give rates in force, it means as per the Finance Act. Coming to total income, total income is defined in 2 clause 45. They say the total income is the income as per 2 clause 45, but in a manner as computed under section 5. So, the computation will come under section 5 and the income definition itself is given in 2 clause 24. Guys, income is an inclusive definition. Everything is covered there. It includes even legal income. It includes negative income, everything. Because income is a wide, wide term. It's an inclusive definition. Generally, income is positive, whatever I earn. But everything is uh, covered in that definition because it's an inclusive definition. Then, tax is imposed on the total income of a person. Who is a person? Person is defined in 2 clause 31. In 2 clause 31, person is defined, my dear friends. So now, who is the SSE? SSE 2 clause 7, SSE is defined, is a person. Person is defined in 2 clause 31. SSE is a person who is required to pay tax, as simple as that. Earlier, person means what? Generally, you are an individual. But then, people started using this mechanism to uh, evade tax by creating a lot of associations. So, a lot of amendments came into this particular section and now, person means everybody is covered. So, you see, person means what? Individual. Individual means single person. Person is HUF, Hindu Undivided Family, right? Then, basically, there are two types. There is Mitakshara School of Hindu Law where the rest of India follows it and then we have the Daya Bhaga system of law where West Bengal and Assam, uh, you know, these uh, states follow it. Then we have partnership firm, partnership firm or LLP both are covered. So, Hindu doesn't include uh, Muslim, Christian, Judai, uh, Judaism, Parsi, uh, Sikh, Jain, etc. Whereas though some cases have also told that Jain and Sikh may come under the HF, that let's not get into all those things. But yeah, predominantly this is the meaning. So, firm Partnership firm, LLP, both are covered, right? When the act uses the word firm, it means both, so, so, you know, your partnership firm and a limited liability partnership firm because actually technically LLP is a body corporate in normal company law and in normal legal terms, LLP is a body corporate, separate legal entity. But you should see when in the Income Tax Act, when I use the word firm, it includes both partnership firm and LLP. In Indian Partnership Act, if I use the word firm, it will only include partnership firm. So, you should see the title of the heading, title of the, you know, the main uh, heading of the main uh, Bayer Act and understand what it tries to convey. In Indian Partnership Act, firm obviously means only partnership firm. But in Income Tax Act, firm obviously will mean anything, that is partnership firm as well as LLP. And when I use the word company, it is Indian company, foreign company and domestic company, uh, all things are covered. So, domestic company, there is a separate definition and all those things. AOP, BOI, Association of Persons, Body of Individuals. This is a group of people coming together who will not fit under the bracket of HUF, who will not fit in the bracket of partnership firm, who will not fit in the bracket of LLP. They are separate people. So, this AOP, BOI, you have joint venture, clubs, body of individuals, only individuals are there. And AOP, Association of Persons, any person can form the AOP. So, guys, body of individuals means many people coming together. That is individuals coming together. Association of person is any of these persons coming together. So, if I have an individual and a firm coming together and forming an association, that is not called body of individual. It is called association of person. If a LLP and five individuals are coming together and forming an association, again that is called association of persons. In an AOP, any of these persons can join hands. Whereas in a BOI, only individuals can come together. Your clubs, joint venture, etc. are examples of AOP, BOI. Then we have local authority, that is your municipality. So your uh, J Greater Chennai Corporation, then our, uh, you know, BBMP of Bangalore. All these people are called local authorities. Definitely, they also have to pay tax, undoubtedly. Then we have artificial juridical person. That is also definition in given in the person. University, temple, God. God is also... Artificial juridical person. You may say, sir, but God, etc. Now there are all uh, Tirupati, Tirumala trust is there. It is run as a trust. It is an AOP, BOI. That I agree. That is now. But what about thousands and thousands of years ago? I mean, 
or hundreds of years ago when i had to tax basically anything it's come from various things even god even in the uh, english british law the you know god jesus etc they were taxed because there were no separate trust as such so if there was a church with an idol or without an idol whatever the case may be the concept of god also what was taxed any income that you derive in the name of god will also have to be taxed now all these temples etc are run by trust so it will not come under artificial juridical person but a sole entity yes any money any income earned by him or uh, the entity as such that is the uh, soul s o u l i am talking about that also will be considered as artificial juridical person right university temple all these things anything which cannot fit into these brackets will come under the artificial juridical person so the finance ministry is absolutely clear whatever you earn money i am going to tax it as simple as that whatever form so in that sense of the term this thing is very interesting because as i told you there should be tax what are the tax either in the rates in force or rates as per the act total income to clause 45 right manner income etc percent to clause 31 guys all this i teach in ca inter this is actually ca inter notes for the basics i opened this is the depth that we have to study in inter we have deemed to have cleared ca inter we know so i'll i'll just we are going to unlearn all those things and learn it back again so in your mind even though it is revision even if you have not studied tax also decently you can you will be able to manage so what i need to do is what you need to do is control a shift delete delete of all the past baggage that you have with respect to these things and let's start afresh so i'll try to make it as exhaustive as possible that's why i'm releasing in two parts because i also don't know I mean, how long each of these chapters will take this is part number 1 part 2 we'll see as and when i record because now uh, dt uh, the fi fast track and even the regular recording everything is going on for uh, may november 24 but i thought i'll take some time off and record for you november 23 revision right moving on yes so guys with all these things in mind we have heads of income right so salary section 11 to 17 house property 22 to 27 salary and house property generally though it's very important for inter in final it is definitely included but generally people don't go into it in depth but anyway this is also very much part but my intention in this particular video would be to cover 3 4 5 that is pgbp 28 to 44 db then we have capital gains 45 to 55 a and income from other sources 56 to 59 and when these things happen some additional stuff also comes like clubbing of income in section 60 to 65 set off and carry forward of clauses 70 to 78 so my dear friends do not be bogged down by the section numbers i'm just trying to give you the structure as such and exemptions are given in section 10 and deductions we have uh, deductions uh, then your chapter 6 a deductions deduction under section 54 atc atd and all those things now deductions can be of two types that is intra head deduction that is your standard deduction with respect to uh, house property for example and also uh, other deductions are there and apart from that chapter 6 a deduction that is from your gross total income from your gross total income so all these taxation will happen in where will happen in india will happen in india so india means what india is your entire landmass the southern part of india entire landmass and basically the territorial waters of india up to 12 nautical miles up to 12 nautical miles so up to 12 nautical miles it is your india sir what about beyond 12 nautical miles so from the land mass to up to 200 nautical miles also it is called as exclusive economic zone so let's say in 150 nautical miles reliance is doing some uh, mining there for oil so then that also will be part of exclusive economic zone sir what about beyond 2200 nautical miles beyond 200 nautical miles my dear friends it is called as the international waters there you know you have you will have double tax avoidance agreement right just no if you see the southern part of india there is one more kutti country like one gobi manchurian small kutti cute country is a very beautiful country beautiful country guys it is you know wonderful please try to visit once upon once you know in your lifetime it is sri lanka now if i jump from kanyakumari you will get sri lanka actually if you jump correct so if you see but this part also what what will you say the sri lanka will tell bro it is my waters india will say bro it is my waters that's why there is a memorandum of understanding between the two so when there are closely placed countries with uh, you know water there so apart from this nautical miles also if anything is overlapping i will have 
a memorandum of understanding so generally the taxation will be on the day on that particular uh, you know year that is 2223 whereas the assessment will happen later but there are some special cases where in the same year itself assessment also will happen tax also you need to pay there are certain cases first one is shipping business non resident non resident from usa comes loads all the goods cargo whatever it is in india and he is about to go and we may, he he doesn't have a permanent establishment in india so this can be only a one time thing where he'll come load earn money here and go so at the time when he is going nirmala madam is waiting nirmala madam hey give me tax so this uh, usa fellow will say sir it's next time madam it's next time it's assess this previous year is now assessment the time of assessment i'll pay like hey nothing doing though the, there is an exception so what you have to pay then and there itself for a shipping business non resident who doesn't have a permanent establishment in india then the persons who are uh, what do you say uh, what do you say according to the assessing officer practicing the art of leaving india not a art of living art of leaving foundation where our uh, great shri vijay malya shri nirav modi so if the assessing officer feels that they are about to leave then he can tax it then and there itself then any aop or boi which is formed for a particular purpose let's say to celebrate the new year 2023 we uh, that is bringing in the new year 2024 we form an association of person or a body of individual for a particular purpose and what is that purpose only to have fun in the what do you say uh, create the entire program what program or what do you say uh, new year program and for that i will collect money i will make profit etc only for that event after that event the entire association is dissolved so that my dear friends again i have to tax it in that year itself then if i am likely to transfer any property to avoid tax that also the assessing officer can say then and there yes any discontinued business when i get the money back later uh, today is discontinued but two years later regarding that money i will get so in that year it is taxed you see you will also see in uh, deem profit cases in section 41 later we will check out these things so apart from this my dear friends in the basics what are the other things that are there let us see all that we have discussed now all that we have already seen definitions you have seen ssc person or aop boi local authority everything i have seen company yes the average rate of tax what do you mean by the average rate of tax my dear friends average rate of tax means whatever amount you are earning as income divided by i mean tax divided by the total income so if i am paying let's say uh, 30000 rupees tax as an example and my income is 3 lakh just an example so the average rate of tax generally you may have slab rates right but average rate of tax is exactly how much i am paying so here i am paying 10% tax so the total income of the individual is 5 lakh 50 and the tax payable is 23400 so the average rate of tax will be 23400 divided by 5 lakh 50 4.25 percent however 229c defines one more thing and that is called as the mmr marginal maximum marginal rate that is the maximum tax that you can pay highest rate of income tax that is one of the uh, you know highest in india so to speak that is your highest tax slab rate will be 30 percent right and then you have your surcharge 37 percent is the highest surcharge that you can pay plus of course you are higher education cess cess is also there for you know 4% so it is 30% and 37% of 30% and on the entire figure 4% so for individual hcf aop boi my dear friends it will come up to 42.744% so for assessment year uh, you know 23 24 so here let us change it is 42.744% so individual hcf aop boi this one corporate society 34.944 firm including llp 34.944 domestic company 29.12 foreign company 43.68 previous year the financial year in which the income is earned is called previous year and the year for which the income is assessed is called assessment year as simple as that special cases i just discussed now yes now the tax rates tax rates for individual huf aop boi artificial juridical person in the case of individuals both men and women huf aop boi and artificial juridical person the slab rates for assessment year 20, uh, 22 23 or even for our assessment year also it's little typo error that's all 
So even uh, you know for 23, 24 as such is the same slab rates, my dear friends. Up to two lakh fifty thousand. That is the basic exemption limit. Nil. Above two lakh fifty thousand, but up to five lakh five percent. Above five lakh, up to ten lakh twenty percent. Above ten lakh, it is thirty percent. So this is the. These are all the you know slab rates. Two lakh up to two lakh fifty thousand basic exemption limit. Nil. 2 lakh 50 to 5 lakh 5 percent, 5 lakh to 10 lakh 20 percent, and above 10 lakh it is 30 percent. But if you are a resident individual, mind you, you should be a resident individual, age 60 years and above, right? Senior citizen, but less than 80 years. This more than 60 years is Tata, less than 80 years is again Tata. If you are more than 80 years, you are what? Very, very senior citizen, super tata, right? Super tata. So, if you see 60 to 80, tata, more than 80, super tata, right? So, for this tata fellow, 60 to 80, how much is it? Up to 3 lakh. So, the 2 lakh 50 is gone up to 3 lakh. Up to 3 lakh basic exemption limit, nil. 3 lakh to 5 lakh, 5 percent. 5 lakh to 10 lakh, 20 percent. About 10 lakh, 30 percent. About 10 lakh is 30 percent. This is the scene. In case of resident individuals aged 80 years and above, very senior citizen, at any time during the previous year, at any time during the previous year, the slab rates are as follows, up to 5 lakh basic exemption limit, nil, 5 lakh to 10 lakh 20 percent, above 10 lakh 30 percent, this is for very senior citizens, it is going up to 5 lakh. So, in the exam, they can ask you like an MCQ, where, you know, you are a, uh, 65 year old NRI and you are earning let's say some 5 lakh rupees and they'll ask you for the tax generally suddenly we'll say okay 65 years okay he's a resident I mean sorry he's a what do you say uh, Tata and you will say 3 lakh rupees you will give the basic exemption made wrong mind you please be very careful guys resident individual resident individual for a non-resident individual this benefit is not there whether you are 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 for all of you it is the same rate if you are a resident, non-resident sorry if you are a non-resident this is what it is only if you are a resident individual 60 to 80 this, this lab will come above 80 this lab will come otherwise same no change The basic exemption limit of 3 lakh and 5 lakh will not apply to a non-resident as we have seen. So, for our Finance Act 22, as I told you, financial year will be 1st April 22 to 31st March 23 and assessment year will be 23-24. 23-24. So guys, sorry, there was some technical problem. Good. So guys, one more thing. If uh, let us say one guy's birthday is on one four sixty three, right? So when will his sixtieth uh, year be? One four twenty three. So if you see, my financial year is from one four twenty two to thirty one March twenty three. His 60th birthday will fall on 1423. His 60th birthday will fall on the assessment year. But if you actually see 31323, he is still 59 years. Because his 60th birthday will always fall on 1423. This issue went to court. Because should I take basic exemption limit of 3 lakh rupees or should I take basic exemption limit of 2 lakh 50 thousand because as on 31st March 23 I am still 59 the moment I go to 1423 only then I will be 60 years so should I take the benefit in the financial year 22 23 that is assessment year 23 24 or will I get the benefit next year issue went to court and many court decisions had you know uh, different views finally the CBDT released you know, notification or an exemption, so to, so to speak, saying that even though you were born on 1463, though you will turn 60 on 1423, you will turn 60 on 1423, 
I will deem it that you have turned 60 on 31 3 23 only so that you can take the benefit of that exemption limit. So, if you see, so I told you there is a Supreme Court decision also finally. Prabhu Dayal Sesma versus State of Rajasthan. The co Supreme Court observed that while counting the age of the person, the day starts from 12 a.m. midnight, it is specified on the preceding day. See, preceding day. So, it says, the day preceding the anniversary of the birthday would be considered as attained the 60 years. Such a person would have completed the age of 60 or 80 on the 31st month of the previous year. So, those born on 1443 and 1463, would have deemed to have finished 80 years and 60 years as the case may be on 31st March 23 and they can claim the benefit. Then my dear friends, we have the concept of surcharge. Surcharge is for individual HGF, AOP, BOI and all these things and for company surcharge we will see later. Ah, so you see, this up to 50 lakh if your total income is there, then there is no surcharge on Dividend income 111A, 112A. Guys, dividend income. So, triple 1A and 112A is your uh, capital gain on transfer of securities, right? So, special taxation rates are there for that. So, generally, surcharge, if you see, you know, higher surcharge is there if your income is above 5 crores. So, let's see for any other income. Forget about these three income. Any other income. Up to 50 lakhs, nil. 50 lakh to 1 crore, it is 10%. 1 crore to 2 crore, 15%. 2 crore to 5 crore, 25%. And above 5 crore, you have 37%. That is your surcharge. But these three, dividend and income under section 111A and 1128A. These are special rates of taxation given, but for dividend you have your normal rate. So, summarize under 111A, the tax portion is 15% my dear friends, reduced tax rate. Under 112A, the tax rate is, that is your long term capital gain on transfer of securities, it is 10%. 10% for what? Anything beyond 1 lakh rupees. There is 1 lakh exemption limit, beyond 1 lakh it is 10%. And dividend, dividend generally the tax rates are normal rates. Now, the surcharge for these things, if your income is more than 1 crore from these areas, the surcharge is, is limited to 15%. Surcharge is limited to 15%. Earlier, dividend was taxed in the hands of the company. Later, it is now taxed in the hands of the individual only. So, what used to happen was, the because of these incomes, your income would shoot up beyond 1 crore, 2 crore, 3 crore, 4 crore, whatever. So, the thing was, the ideal thing, up to 50 lakhs to 1 crore, surcharge is 10%. But beyond this 1 crore, if I have this particular income, that is dividend income, and 111A income, and 112A income, the CBDT decided that surcharge portion on that should be, should remain at 15% itself. Surcharge portion should remain at 15%. So, there should be no change regarding that. Surcharge will remain the same. So, for any other income, you see this unit, remember, up to 50 lakh nil, 50 lakh to 1 crore 10%, 1 crore to 2 crore 15%, 2 crore to 5 crore 25% and above 5 crore is 37%. But, what do you say? For the uh, income derived from dividend, for which normal tax rates are there, 111A and 112A. As I have already shown you, 111A you have 15%, 112A long term capital gain on transfer of securities you have 10% for the amount beyond 1 lakh rupees. For these things, the surcharge is restricted to only 15%. That is 15%. So, 111A is your STCG on listed shares and 112A is the long term capital gains. There are possible scenarios and situations that we can think of. This is important for the exam. Generally, in uh, computing, we should keep in mind. If the income that is including the specified income, specified income means dividend 111A, 112A, is, does not exceed 50 lakh, then both it is nil. It's easy. In total income, including specified income, that exceeds 50 lakh but does not exceed 1 crore, in both the cases it is 10%. Total income 
including the specified income if it exceeds 1 crore but does not exceed 2 crore then both are 15 percent now total income if it excludes specified income and it exceeds 2 crore but does not exceed 5 crore so i will not have to, i should not take into account the specified income in that case my dear friends surcharge on total amount is 25 percent but for that portion, that is for dividend income 111A, 1128, it is still 15%. Similarly, total income excluding specified income, if it exceeds 5 crore, surcharge on total amount is 37%, but on dividend income 111A, 1128, it is 15%. Sir, but what if situation for 5, what if everything exceeds 2 crore, but including the specified income? So, that is the one more thing that uh, doubt was raised to the MCA, so, sorry, to the CBTT. Sorry, guys, I was, you know, law faculty, right? So, keep on telling MCA, MCA, sorry, it is, now I handle uh, the, for the SPOM, that is your self place on online module law. Then we have this, of course, DT, and we have paper 6 also, where I will be handling uh, law, audit, and direct taxes. So, sorry, sometimes when I tell MCA, I, I meant CVDT. Okay. So, total income exceeding 2 crore, how much? So, the total income including specified income exceeds 2 CR, which is not covered in situation 4 and 5 because in situation 4 and 5 exclude, then the rate of surcharge on the entire amount shall not exceed 15 percent because I am adding everything and going beyond 2 crore. We will see an example, you will understand everything. Check now. Capital gain income 7 lakh, 6 lakh. Other income 65 lakh. So, you see this will come under the first case. Second case, total income including everything is more than 50, less than 1 crore. More than 50, less than 1 crore. So, for other income portion it is 10 percent. For sir, this is also it is 10 percent comes under situation 2. Trish is earning 12 lakh, 75 year, 11 lakh, 50 year, 1.7 crore year. Overall, 1.94 crore. So, this is situation number 3. Total income including everything is exceeding 1 crore but does not exceed 2 crore. This one. Exceeding 1 crore does not exceed 2 crore. So, for this portion also 15 percent. For this portion also 15 percent. This one. Excluding this, it is going beyond 2 CR. It is going beyond 2 CR. So, it will come under situation 4, excluding. So, for this portion, 322.75, it is 25 percent and I told you for this portion, it is 15 percent. Now, everything excluding it is going beyond 5 crore. This I will not even take into account. For this, it is going beyond 5 crore. So for this portion, it is 37 percent and for this two portion, it will be 15 percent. Total income is 13 crore. Next. Everything included is exceeding 2 crore. This part. Everything including. Here it says it does not exceed 2 crore, right? If I exclude that also, this is just 73 lakhs. But if I am adding everything, it is going up to 2 crore. This comes under this. Total income is exceeding 2 crore. Well, I include all, everything. The final surcharge will not be more than 15 percent. Capital gain 6.42 crores, 85 lakhs, 7 crore, doesn't matter, same thing, 15 percent. 1 lakh 40, 10 lakh, 41 lakh. Everything is just how much? All inclusive is more than 50 lakh. So, it is 10 percent, 10 percent. 51 lakh, 30 lakh, 82 lakh, 1.63 overall. So, it is 1.63. Everything including is 1.63 crores. More than 1 crore, less than 2 crore. So, 15 percent each here. So, everything including is less than 50 lakh. So, both it is nil. And here, 7.22 crore and 4 lakh. All inclusive, my dear friends, it is more than 2 CR. So, both cases 15 percent. So, basically, government did not want to charge more surcharge for 
earnings from 111A, 112A and dividend income. Dividend income anyway is taxed at the normal rates. Health and education says is 4%. I hope you understood this, guys. Health and education says is 4%. And always you should round off the total income and round off the amount payable and refund you all those to the nearest multiple of 10 rupees. Then there is something called as rebate. Rebate is for the individual resident of India only if the total income does not exceed 5 lakh. Basically, income at the tax on 5 lakh rupees would be 12,500. So up to that there is a rebate. So basically there is no need to pay income tax up to 5 lakh rupees. Now this is important because for the next assessment year, the alternate tax regime has taken uh, you know more importance because of which there have been amendments there, which means the last time ever where they can play around with the rebate will be 87 capital A, this time 5 lakh rupees. Just remember this and go. So up to 5 lakh you will get a rebate. Is what they say. And for cooperative societies, these are the rates 10, 20, and 30 percent surcharge is available. Let's see for the uh, firms, LLP, and companies, which are more important. So, for firms and LLPs, my dear friends, tax rate is 30 percent. Surcharge, if you see up to 1 crore nil, 1 crore to 10 crore, 12 percent, greater than 10 crore, 10 percent for the for, you know firms, LLPs, etc. Domestic company. If their total turnover during the previous year 2021 does not exceed 400 crore, only during 2021 I should see the income. I should not see, uh, my financial year is how much? 22, 23. I should see the previous year 2021. Only that. If my income, that is my turnover, does not exceed 400 crore, does not exceed 400 crore, then the tax rate is a reduced tax rate of 25%. No surcharge up to 1 crore. 1 crore to 10 crore it is 7%. More than 10 crore it is 12%. So still it is reduced surcharge. If you see the irony is for individuals only surcharge is 37%. Crazy. For companies it is still less. So it, it actually makes sense to start a company and do anything rather than have everything in the individual name to be honest. And also the tax rate is also less. Of course, when you see, take the average out, that may become less, but surcharge is crazy, you know. For those of you are minting money above 5 crores and all that, it's better to do it through the, through the mechanism of company, to be honest. Any other domestic company other than this, whose, uh, you know, turnover does not exceed 400. Turnover must be less than 400, less than or equal to 400. If the turnover does not exceed 400, then 25%. If the turnover exceeds 400 crore, then it will be 30 percent and here also 7 and 12. Foreign company on the other hand, whatever the turnover may be 40 percent. But since it is a higher tax rate, the surcharge will be slightly less here up to 1 crore nil, 1 to 10, 2 percent, greater than 10, 5 percent. Right? So guys, let us take an example to understand. Let's say Anniyan is there, Mr. Anniyan and Mr. Ambi. Anniyan is earning 50 lakh salary, 50 lakh amount income. Ambi is earning 50 lakh 1000. 50 lakh 1000. So if you see, the tax for Anniyan will be 13 lakh 12,500 if you compute. Whereas just because of this 1000 extra, you will have to, since it's more than 50 lakh, you have to pay a surcharge of 10%. Guys, just for earning 1000 extra, Anni, I mean, Ambi has to pay 14,44,080, which is almost 1.3 lakh more. So, Ambi goes to Nirmala auntie and says, Nirmala madam, this 13,12,500 is on 50 lakh. And this extra 1000 you only keep, I don't want. Why the hell should I pay 14,44,000? You please take 13 lakh 12,500 plus that 1,000 1, extra you only take. For the remaining amount, that is 14 lakh 44,080 and 13 lakh 12,500 plus that 1,000 whatever extra I am paying for that balance, please give me some relief. And that relief, my dear friend, is called as marginal relief. 
marginal relief because of the surcharge amount if it is increasing because of the income crossing the surcharge limit because my tax is increasing the balance portion i will can claim it as something called as marginal relief right so that is the marginal relief portion so first what i should uh, do tax on total income right so tax on total income in this example if you see i have com computed to be 14 lakh 44 80 14 lakh 44 80 tax on surcharge limit just before the slab this is the before just before the slab 13 lakh 12500 and what am i saying restricted amount step number 2 plus nti minus surcharge limit correct so what is step number 2 13 lakh 12500 plus i am telling 1000 rupees extra i am paying no you please take that 1000 rupees surcharge limit is 50 lakh what is my earning 50 lakh 1000 1000 you only keep the tax payable will be either 14 lakh 4480 or this one 13 lakh 13500 whichever is lower so i will pay how much guys i will pay tax 13 lakh 13500 i will pay 13 lakh 13500 plus says what is the marginal relief my dear friends marginal relief obviously will be step number 1 minus step number 3 So fourteen lakh forty four eighty minus whatever I am supposed to pay thirteen lakh thirteen thousand five hundred. The balance will be marginal relief. That is the relief that the government is providing me. So this is the concept of marginal relief. So if you see income definition, everything is covered here: profit, gains, dividend, voluntary contribution, export incentive, all that. This forms base for my which one? PGBP. So the next chapter is going to be where we are going to discuss. This is just the basics. Where we will go fully in depth will be the profit and gains from business or profession, my dear friends. Let's go into that. So yes, my friends, let's begin our discussion now. After having finished the basics, let's dive into profit or gains of business or profession. A very very important chapter, as you all know, goes without saying. So without further ado, let's begin, my dear friends. So. i'll be doing from my tax first book as i told you uh, but i'll also be doing through my running notes because i'm condense all these things also wherever needed so the term business is defined in 2 clause 13 it will include what trade commerce or any manufacturing activity so trade commerce or any manufacturing activities anything that we do in life uh, with with an intention to earn some money would be deemed to be business <coughs> so if you see uh, profit or gains is coming from where first is profit and gains must be there and it should be there of something called income so income is defined in 2 clause 24 anything that you think of is defined in income guys it includes negative income also yes and it should be as per the method of accounting prescribed in section 145 and it can be a trading activity whether on individual level or on a community level also and even losses are covered negative income is also income and it says profit and gains of business or profession business or profession now what do you mean by business what is a profession and what is a vocation because profession includes vocation and everything is part of business so when i say pgbp it also includes vocation so simple words guys business is a term wide term so anything that i if i put effort and i get something in return whether it is in an organized format or a disorganized format would be called as a business so you're going on the road and uh, you know in the signal you would see these uh, street vendors street hawkers they would come to you and sell an umbrella is that business yes do you think they have a company do you have a, they, do you have an entity no so is that business though yes so anything whether it's organized or disorganized it is called as business at the end of the day profession on the other hand requires some skill set either an intellectual skill set or labor skill set uh, intellectual skill set is like ca cs architect etc when as per labor skill set is like a surgeon a surgeon performing a surgery and getting money would come under profession vocation is like your calling calling means not phone calling it's your inner purpose let's say your inner purpose is to propagate your religion 
your inner purpose is to probably you know speak to everybody about the bhagavad gita for example so is that also uh, part of the income tax yes nirmala madam says whatever you do if you earn some money you give me tax as simple as that right so politics is deemed to be a profession any social work is a vocation uh, preaching christianity is a you know a vocation which anyway comes into profession because profession includes all vocations and the best part is profession and business are mutually exclusive if you use the word business you cannot use profession and likewise but friends all professions are businesses but all businesses are not professions because all businesses like if i am selling an umbrella that does not include intellectual skill or labor skill labor uh, skill means skillful that is your surgeon surgeon that if you cannot say sir if i am giving an umbrella that is also labor no what i am trying to tell is skill set with respect to working or skill set with respect to intellect so if i give a raw diamond to a, a skilled you know jeweler and that uh, you know stone maker actually carves out a beautiful diamond that is definitely a profession it's not a business because he is using his uh, ability his skill set to perform something on that particular rock to make it excellent right so that is what it is all professions are business all businesses are not professions vocation is wider than business what does not amount to business will be vocation as simple as that everything is covered in pgbp my dear friends now what is the taxability portion of it though right taxable portion is it a capital receipt or revenue receipt as per many decisions and generally the rule of income tax is revenue receipts are taxable capital receipts are not taxable and whether it is capital or revenue you and i will decide but the ultimate authority because many of these cases are all based on what whether it is capital receipt or revenue receipt and it is all done at the high court and supreme court level because high court and supreme courts are the ultimate judges of what questions of law questions of fact is done by the lower courts questions of law will be decided only by the high court as well as the supreme court so i think it zoomed out sorry so the high court and supreme court will decide what guys questions of law always so moving on the next part of the story is uh, yeah if i am receiving the profit when i say pgbp what is tax what is not tax if i am receiving some profit whether in cash or kind would it be taxed yes if i receive in cash also we receive in kind also everything will be taxable uh, taxable because it doesn't uh, specify whether cash or kind what about reimbursement of expenses now i am um, a consultant of the company and i will say i want to uh, i'll come to your company and do whatever the work is so 3 days project is going on uh, i will book my uh, a room for myself and all the uh, expenses of the room as well as my uh, all the you know food expenses you will have to reimburse so let's say i'll charge 2 lakh rupees for 3 days and this reimbursement of expenses will be some 20000 so my taxable income is 2 lakh 20000 or 2 lakh only so again many court decisions have clearly told that reimbursement of expenses will not be pgbp it will not be a part of your turnover what about voluntary payments right let us say i have my friend is a lawyer i have told him boss uh, one of my friends is there other friends who is uh, doesn't have so much money anyway you do some free cases free cases are called pro bono cases so why don't you help him out man is in really uh, in bad shape so my friend who is a lawyer helps my other friend who doesn't have so much uh, who is not a man of means who doesn't have so much money and eventually he will win right he'll ensure that the my other friend wins the case so out of happiness i will gift him something because he did something for free let's say i'm i'll gift him a nice gift of worth some 20000 rupees would that be pgbp income for the lawyer so i on behalf of my friend because this guy won the case for him and he did it for free I have gifted him something worth twenty thousand. Let's say I have gifted him a phone worth forty thousand rupees. So would that be PGBP for the lawyer? Yes, guys. Here the key word is nexus. Since there is a nexus between the profession or the business and what the fruits of the labor, so to speak, definitely he has to be the the you know PGBP. Uh, it will be charged. Similarly, uh, let's say you work. You uh, let's say I do uh, a work for. some let's say film actor and let's say rajni khan so i do a work for rajni khan rajni khan becomes very happy and like boss thank you so much for this take my watch so he'll give off his watch to me right he'll give off his watch that watch 
is worth let's say one lakh rupees. One lakh rupees watch will give me. Say I am very happy for that. You are not even taking fees. You are like sir, how can I take fee from Rajni Khan sir? Not possible, right? So the thing is, he'll say, okay, at least keep this watch as a token of my love. That is also an excess, guys. So will that be counted? Yes, voluntary payments also will be PGVP. Let us say there was an old client of mine. Of course, uh, he was. I was doing work for him. All that he was paying me, all that. But we also shared a very <coughs> good personal bond. And let's say since he was very elderly, he always treated me as his uh, son. And at the time of his passing away, in his will, he has written one full property for me, guys. In the nature of a son, he always used to look at me as his son, and is let's say he's gifted me his property worth one crore. This was one of those cases. It went to court. Is this what you think, uh, PGBP? The answer is a resounding no, because there is no nexus between what I got and what I work. For all the work, I've anyway received payment for which I've already uh, shown it in the shown it as uh, PGBP. But this there is no nexus, so that will not come there. Sir, will it be even taxed though? That we will see later. So any gift receipt will be taxed in IFOS as you know, right? Yes. Then uh, I am a chartered accountant. I am floating a company and uh, oh, I am helping somebody float a company. Because I did a very good job, apart from my fee, I also received shares for 20,000 rupees. Would that be PGBP? Yes, because there is a nexus. And let's say I worked for some uh, person. Uh, he paid me 50,000 also. But let's say I am working for RCB. And to see RCB lose miserably in Janaswami Stadium, they have gifted me RCB versus CSK VIP box tickets. So that in VIP, very important person, I can sit there and wipe tears uh, after seeing our amazing team win. Okay, Only RCB fans can troll RCB, other people not allowed. Yes, cool. Then Swami Nityananda, let's say 5 lakh rupees is given by Swami Nityananda's Bhakta, let's say Ranjana. Uh, Ranjita, whatever her name was. So she gives 5 lakh rupees to Swami Nityananda as you know, taking as token of gratitude for whatever, uh, what he did, God only knows for that. Okay. So now what do you think? That is taxable or not taxable? Yes, taxable, nexus to profession, all these things. But at the same, if an employee is getting some uh, car, employee is getting a servant for his, uh, you know, work, household work, employee is getting a driver, guys, all these things are perquisites, these are not taxable in PGBP, but they are taxable in the hands of the employer's salary, right? But if you are working as a consultant, as a contract of service, consultant if you are working, uh, then you will obviously, sorry, contract for service, as a consultant if you are working, then my dear friends, you will definitely get, that will be a PGBP income. Any isolated venture, even once in a year I will do that, that's all, that also will be called as PGBP. What about non-refundable deposit? So guys, non-refundable deposit is a trade receipt, which is not taxable as per, you know, many court judgments. Refundable deposit, on the other hand, I will have to take it and refund it later. So yes, that will be uh, definitely taxable under PGBP, if it is forfeited, so to speak. Then, um, you know, uh, anything smuggling smuggling business from smuggling also yes any business is taken into account it says profit and gains of business any business or profession so everything my dear friends will be pgbp so the same thing is given in all these things uh, that is what we are seeing there has to be something called manufacturing transformation of one object to another which is having a different character and use method of accounting obviously i can follow cash system or i can follow uh, you know a cruel system, but there can never be a hybrid system. And of course, everything I have to follow the ICDS, Income Computation Disclosure Standards. Now, chargeability, charging section is section number 28. So first one is profit and gains of keywords, any business at any time. So even one time in the year, value of any benefit or perquisite, as I already told you. Guys, if it is for an employee, it will be taxable under salary. Any, uh, what do you say, this thing also, if I have received any gift in the nexus of business, that also will be taken into account. Then, under 35 AD, that is, you know, your specified businesses, there, if you have taken a capital asset, anyway, under that specified business, you will claim 100% deduction for all capital expenditure. Now, let us say that has been destroyed, or that has been sold, that has been uh, whatever, uh, demolished, whatever the case may be, any money that you receive there will be PGBP because guys, if you have bought an asset for 1 crore and you have used it for specified business under 35 AD, you would have taken that full deduction in that year anyway. 
So next year when you are selling it and you are getting let's say 10 lakhs from it, that has to be taken as the credit to your PNL account for sure. Then your normal clubs, association and other things, they are principle of mutuality. All of us will come together to do, uh, make, to form a trust, to form a club, sorry, club uh, for mutual, mutual on the principle of mutual benefit, mutual benefit society. So in these cases, whatever money I earn, which I you give specific services, basically these clubs, etc. will have uh, party hall, clubs will have rooms, et services, etc. These services provided to the, uh, you know, club member and whatever profit they make will definitely be chargeable to that particular club is what they say. Now, any compensation, any compensation made or payment due or received by any person in connection with termination or modification of terms of a business contract. So, for example, a telecommunication company appointed an agent, Mr. Z, to sell SIM cards both in North Karnataka, whole of Karnataka. Then slowly they changed that, modified that agreement and they said, you handle only South Karnataka, whereas I will give that other deal to a person from North Karnataka. So, South Karnataka I am handling, I will say, sir, you had given me whole of Karnataka, now you are only giving me South Karnataka, please give me some 5 lakh rupees as compensation. That compensation will also be PGBP is what they say. Apart from that, uh, one part of the story was, you are not supposed to, what do you say, share your know-how. One is sharing the know-how, other part is what? Not non-compete. So, any non-compete if you enter into, let's say you have a, uh, let's, let me give you an example. Let's say you are a person who is creating an additive, an additive in a petroleum uh, product. So you are a manufacturer of an additive. You have patented technology. So basically you are selling that additive. You add that additive, the efficiency of the petrol will increase. So Shell Petrol Bank, Shell company has bought your additive and they have told you, you cannot use this additive anywhere else. I am exclusively using this. I am taking this entire royalty. Uh, I am giving you so much royalty every month, um, every year. This is the payment that I am making to you. So, is that PGBP? Yes, very much it is PGBP. So, they will tell you, you should not compete. You should not sell this uh, formula to somebody else. Yes, non-compete fee, definitely PGBP. Instead of telling that what they will tell, they will say, out of 10 crore that I am making payment to you, 1 crore is for non-compete. 1 crore is for non-compete, means you cannot compete outside, you cannot sell this elsewhere. Then they can tell 9 crore is for not sharing. I am not saying not compete, they use the words not sharing. Please do not share this with anybody. Guys, whatever the term you may use, non-compete you may use, you may uh, use non-sharing. Either way, the lawmaker clearly says whether it is not carrying on any activity or whether it is not sharing any know-how, whatever the case may be, my dear friends, it will be. 28 5A PGBP. So, for example, an employee who worked at Maro, a medtech organization on medical content, was paid 5 lakh rupees to not share the medical content with Unacademy, another online platform. One is you should not work elsewhere. That's called moonlighting. You cannot work in two-two companies. You cannot work elsewhere. That's okay. As a consultant also. Second part is what? You are not supposed to share this data with somebody. That not sharing also. And if I am giving you that money for not sharing the content anywhere, then also it will be PGBP is what they say. On the other hand, guys, this is when I am taking it on, what do you say, like royalty basis. What if I sell the right only completely, the entire right is transferred, then PGBP will not come. The same will be chargeable under the head. Capital gains, it is not accessible under section 28, it is accessible under capital gains. These are the things. Apart from that, guys, key man insurance policy. Key man insurance policy. So, who is this key man? Key man is a KMP, key managerial personnel. So, that is your, as per Companies Act, it is your CEO, CFO, CS, MD, man, uh, manager. Then, one level below the KMP is also called as a KMP, who has been designated as such. So, on the lives of these people, they take insurance. Not just on the lives, also, what if they commit fraud tomorrow? So, the company to protect other directors and to protect itself, it will take insurance. They keep on giving insurance premium every single year. Now, is that key man insurance premium allowed in the PNL account as a reduction is one part of the story. Secondly, 
after a few years surrender value they will get who will get surrender value the key man uh, the key persons also will get surrender value company also will get surrender value if company get surrender value is it taxable if the kmp get surrender value is it taxable is the question as simple as that earlier my dear friends it was not taxable now it is definitely made taxable how insurance premium i asked you a question insurance premium paid by the company they pay 1 crore insurance premium every year that 1 crore is it allowable expense yes under 371 it is allowed because 371 is a general deduction it should be wholly and exclusively used for business it should not be capital nature it should be revenue in nature it should not be used for personal purposes so in this case all the elements are matching hence it is what 371 insurance company it is allowed on the other hand surrender value received by the uh, company earlier was not taxable and even for surrender value received by the employee also was not taxable now everything has changed my dear friends as of now amendment has come whereby if you are receiving surrender value as an employee it is taxable under 1617 salary if you are receiving as a consultant surrender value it is taxable under pgbp if you are receiving as a chairman emeritus for example narayan murthy is appointed as a chairman emeritus like a honorary chairman position he is not exactly a chairman of infosys anymore uh, but since he started infosys is given is being given the position of honorary chairman so for that honorary chairmanship what do you think section 56 will apply ifos basically nirmala madam says if you are getting money a uh, surrender value of the key man insurance policy you please have to pay the amount no questions asked and even if the insurance amount earlier which was if there is a fraud if there is a fraud earlier any insurance amount received was not at all taxable now also what do you see is it taxable or not we'll see it in a slightly later scenario so the thing is section 28 says any amount that you receive from a key man insurance policy any sum received under key man insurance policy including the sum allocated by way of bonus on such policy so my dear friends any amount that you receive would be taxable apart from that there are some incentives and duty drawback on all these export businesses selling of exim scripts duty drawback dpb dfrc guys this is a marathon session so i'll not be explaining in depth of all these things in regular batch ftp i will explain each and everything what it means so basically any drawback so if you uh, what do you say export certain goods the government will give you cash assistance government will give you duty drawback where the duties will be given a reverse back to you and credited to your account all those credits my dear friends will be pgbp definitely yes and which year should i recognize the year in which i actually receive it or the year in which it is reasonably uh, what do you say reasonable certainty i can say that the realization can be achieved because when i export goods money whatever i get no it has to be repatriated back to india within 9 months as per fema regulations now that 9 months can be in this financial year also next financial year also obviously let's say if i'm making a sale in january 2023 the realization will come sometime in uh, september october 2023 which is the next financial year so when should i take as per 145b export incentive shall be deemed to be the income of the previous year in which reasonable certainty of its realization is achieved so reasonable certainty of the realization is achieved until the realization is achieved this reasonable certainty so if i know that it's going to come next year and i have to take that next year now you are a partner of a partnership firm my dear friends and you are getting interest salary bonus commission etc so guys partner is not an employee right so what he salary will not come so for him tds under section 192 will not come any partner remuneration etc will be under 285 so interest salary bonus commission or remuneration received by a partner of a firm from such firm so firm is paying some salary to the partner it will be taxable under pgbp right so even though it is termed as remuneration there is no tds on partners remuneration there are many cases also because it is though it's remuneration it will not come under section 192 because partner can never be an employee of a firm he is a partner he is there as a businessman as an entrepreneur and what he gets is a share of profit nothing else right on the other hand when i am making payment of interest salary whatever the case may be if it is disallowed under 40b because there are 40b limits my dear friends 
under 40b limits you will have to either take you know uh, the entire 90% of the value or 150000 whichever is higher after that in excess of that you should take something else all that we'll see later right so for that <clears throat> some technical problem yeah so guys as i was saying uh, in 40b let me show you 40b limits yeah, 40B limits, I told you, 1,50,000 or 90%, whichever is higher. That is on what? On the first 3 lakh rupees. Book profits. You have to compute something called book profit. Remuneration allowed is only as a percentage of book profits. How much? Either 1,50,000 or 90%, whichever is higher you should take. And on the balance, 60% is what you need to take. So, only this part is allowed. Anything else will be disallowed. Anything else will be disallowed. So, for example, if uh, the... Uh, what do you say? Book profits. Book profits is coming up to 4 lakh rupees. Right. So, on the first 3 lakh rupees, it is what? 90% or 1 lakh 50,000, whichever is higher. So, 90% will be 2 lakh 70,000. So, 2 lakh 70,000 remuneration is allowed. On the balance, 1 lakh. How much? 60% is allowed. So, 60,000. So, 2,70,000 plus 60k is allowed. That is 3.3 lakh remuneration is allowed. Let us say I pay 5 lakh remuneration to partners. What is the excess amount? 1.7 lakh. This 1.7 lakh will be disallowed. With whom? Disallowed to whom? Disallowed to the firm. Since it is added back to the profit, firm has to pay 30% tax on 1.7 lakhs. What does the partner show as his receipt? He will show 3.3 lakhs or he will show 5 lakhs. Obviously, he has received 5 lakhs, so he has to pay uh, tax on 5 lakhs. But guys, company has already, sorry, firm has already paid tax on 1.7 lakhs. And partner is showing it as 5 lakhs, which also includes 1.7 lakhs. The problem is, if he pays tax on the 5 lakhs, it will be double taxation because firm also has paid on the excess 1.7 lakh. So, that is the reason why this point is there. Now, so much, you know, to cover all these things only, this point is there. If you see, if such interest, salary, etc. has been disallowed under section 40B, in the case of the firm, the same shall not be taxed in the hands of the partner to the extent disallowed. So, that extra amount of whatever, uh, 1.7 lakhs, if the firm has paid tax, it is not taxable in the hands of the partner. It is not taxable in the hands of the partner. Moving on guys, next one, conversion of inventory. So, for example, I have a building. Let's say I am Shoba developers. I am into development of uh, real estate. I have a building in which the first floor here, there are two rooms. I will convert these two apartments into offices. Essentially, what I am doing, I am converting my inventory into, that is, I am converting my stock in trade into a capital asset. The moment I convert my inventory into capital asset, I am bringing it into business as a capital asset. So obviously, it will come into the block of assets concept. So, what would be the actual cost of the asset is point number one that comes for depreciation. But here, what would be the PGBP income? Let us say the cost of the inventory of these both the buildings are 2 crore. But on the date of conversion, the fair market value is 10 crore. What do I do? So, the lawmakers have told that the fair market value of the inventory as on the date on which it is converted if or treated as a capital asset will be PGBP. So basically guys, opening stock will be 2 crore, 10 crore is the FMV, so 10 minus 2, 8 crore will be eventually my PGBP income. Though I should record 10 crore in the credit side, opening stock will be 2 crore, so the net effect will be 8 crore will be charged to tax. The moment I have paid tax on 8 crore, Obviously, in my actual cost under section 43.1, actual cost of the asset, that I have to record it at 10 crore. Depreciation can be claimed on 10 CR is what the lawmaker says. Got it? So, that is what they are trying to tell. In case any disc uh, discontinued business is there, so my business gets discontinued and later after 
a couple of years some money that i receive from there then whatever it is any sum received after the discontinued business that also will be deemed to be profit this is also concept of deemed profit in section 41 so that is the same concept here any money that you receive after your business has been discontinued will be charged to tax any subsidy received by government so government grant cash incentive duty drawback anything that you receive from the government will definitely be two things one if you have bought an asset and against that asset there is a subsidy it will be reduced from the cost of the asset on the other hand if directly you receive for your business any government grant subsidy that will be deemed to be your income and that is under 224 sir that will be your income right got it but guys any lpg subsidy if the government has uh, given and you have received any lpg subsidy that will not be read as subsidy it's just a welfare subsidy given and hence it is not in connection with business or profession and hence not chargeable to tax all these can be mcq questions or any other thing they can keep asking then as far as speculative transactions are concerned that shall be treated as a you know separate and distinct business so to speak and everything will be done on a reasonable basis more on that slightly later cool as far as computation of income is concerned the income is computed under head 32 43d so all the general expenses which is prior to setting up of business so if you take setting up of business as the criteria so for example uh, there are certain pre incorporation contracts let's say the business came into force on let's say 10th october before 10th october uh, it was all the incorporation which was happening that is your moa OA creation legal uh, expenses for various things all those expenses will it be allowed generally it is not allowed but there's an exception that is 35d amortization of preliminary expenses so this section 29 says generally pre-incorporation expenses are not allowed unless otherwise allowed in income tax act and income tax act has one section which talks about preliminary expenses 35d which we'll see later and what about the profits made till the incorporation so pre-incorporation expenses just before incorporation company is not at all in force when company is not at all existing uh, you cannot charge in the hands of the company hence these expenses are not allowed but exception is 35d under 35d you get to amort amortize one fifth of the preliminary expenses but if you have earned any income in this particular time this income will be chargeable to tax not in the hands of the company guys because company is not in existence when company is not in existence it cannot be called as an SSE for you to be called as an SSE you should be a company company means registered under companies act if it is not registered under companies act still in the process of registration this period whatever income you earn will be taxed in the hands of the AOP or DOI that is in the tank hands of the promoter so promoters will have to pay tax as a association of person or a body of individual so this also okay, they can ask in MCQ and all that how the taxation will happen for the pre-incorporation income that you earn that is what they say So if you see embezzlement by a director or an employee of the SEC during the course of business, if the money is taken away by the director and he runs away, can I claim it as a business expenditure? Can it be claim it? Can I claim it as a business loss? Yes. Expenditure you cannot claim, but you can claim it as a business loss as per a Madras High Court decision. So basically they are trying to tell after incorporation, whatever you do for the business, whether it's income or expense, you can claim. And if there is a loss arising out of business, that also can be claimed, even though the loss was, you know, the entire thing was cheated, the cheating or the fraud happened by the concerned director as such. Now, these are all the basics, guys. Still now, what we have discussed is the uh, charging section 28 and, of course, section 29, which speaks about the uh, method of accounting and also the admissib admissibility of the expenses and computation of income under 29. Now comes the allowability of deductions, that is section 32, 36.
this talks about whether the uh, what do you say deductions are allowed or not allowed this is what this section speaks about right so let us go into those areas first whether the expenses are allowed or whether the expenses are disallowed and after which we will understand the important concept of depreciation so guys section 30 talks about expenses relating to building only used for business or profession first of all it should be expenses secondly it should be used for the building only not any other asset third one used for the purpose of business or profession if you use it for any other than building section 30 will not come if you use the building for personal purposes section 30 will not come and this section only and only talks about current repairs or current expenses or revenue expenditure it does not include capital expenditure so three important things in section 30 first of all revenue expenditure second one only building third one used for the business or profession Owner cannot pay rent to himself, so it is not deductible. Tenant paying rent is deductible, uh, you know, for him. Obviously, it is deductible under this particular section. Rent, rates and taxes, insurance and revenue repairs. All repairs will be revenue repairs. On the other hand, as far as building is concerned, yes. Come, uh, coming to repairs, let me talk about other things. Rates and taxes. Municipal rates, municipal taxes paid by owner is deductible by him. But if it is paid by tenant, he also can take it in his p &L account. Insurance also same thing. Capital repairs, my dear friends, in both the sections, both for both the people, that is owner and tenant, it is not deductible. As I told you, this section only talks about current repairs. Now the interesting part is what about revenue repairs? Revenue repairs. So here this chart will help us understand. Building. Tenant, there is an agreement undertaken by him where they, he has told that I will bear all the repairs. Generally, this should be there in the agreement. If agreement is silent, generally owner only will bear all the expenses, especially capital expenses. All revenue repairs, that is from the general wear and tear, let us say there is a sink, you have sink suddenly breaks while wear and tear. And for example, uh, electricity bulb, bulb bursts because of wear and tear and use. So all these expenses who has to bear? Obviously the tenant has to bear. So revenue expenditure allowed by tenant under section 30. Uh, as far as the owner is concerned, I mean, capital expenditure, that is capital repairs. Let us say a main motor, a water motor or an electricity motor or electricity fuse is a different thing. But the entire transformer or the entire electricity board, there is some problem and it's not working. That is not my duty, that is the owner's duty to replace. So, capital repairs are definitely not allowed. As far as other things are concerned, revenue repairs, current repairs under section 30, it is allowed if it is paid by the owner. And guys, if an owner only builds one additional four floor, that cannot be coming under section 30. For him, it is uh, added to the block of the building. So, capital repairs will be added to the cost of the building. Very simple. Now, whenever the act says, you know, the tenant has to undertake to bear the repairs. Is it current repairs or capital repairs? Always current repairs. Section uh, 37.1 also, obviously it comes there and also section 30 also very clearly tells it is only current repairs. So, capital repairs are not covered, guys. Now, this particular section says paid by him. When I say paid, is it include payable or actually paid? That's the question. Generally, whenever act uses the word payable, it means accrual. Whenever act uses the word actually paid, it is payment basis. But in this particular case, based on various judgments, when I have used the word paid, it will include both payment and payable also. It will include payment and payable. Some of the rates, some of the uh, sections will be allowed only on actual payment basis as per section 43B. When we come to 43B, we will link it later. But now, for the purposes of section 30, I repeat, the word paid will be both payable as well as actually paid. Now, tenant revenue repairs we discussed, owner revenue repairs we discussed, owner capital repairs we discussed. What about tenant capital repairs For of the building? I am a tenant of the building. I wanted one more floor. So, I will tell the owner, can you please construct one more floor? He will sell poda. 
no better better work or what you only construct on your own i will tell okay sir i will construct i will construct it for 10 lakhs the owner will say you do whatever you want when you are giving back the uh, building to me that time we will see i will settle the dues but now you please i don't want the headache of construction now the question is i went and asked nirmala madam madam i am spending 10 lakhs from my pocket and you have told in section 30 capital repairs are not allowed which means 10 lakhs i cannot debit to my pnl account at least that 10 lakhs allow me to show it as an asset nirmala madam said how can you show it as an asset you are not an owner i said yes that's what i'm saying 10 lakhs i have spent if you don't give me any tax benefit how will i build a building you should do something for businessmen who are ready to take up the responsibility of construction of one more uh, floor later we i will settle with the uh, owner later that's a different issue five years later 10 years later or maybe never because i'll never vacate that place many people are there for 20 25 30 years and all so i am asking at least do one thing add it to the let me add to the building so guys a wonderful concept called deemed building has come in you know section 321 explanation they have told you are, if you are a tenant you can be called as a deemed owner and it will be added to the block and you can claim depreciation readily you can only claim depreciation right very simple now one more question will arise sir okay 10 lakh rupees i will take and i'll claim depreciation no problem sir later 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 5 years later i am that building value was 10 lakhs now wdv has become 5 lakhs sir i am selling this entire 5 lakhs i am giving it back to the landlord i don't want this building i am giving it back he had agreed to settle it now he will obviously pay the wdv wdv is 5 lakh so the owner tells okay take it 5 lakh the owner gives 5 lakh and takes over the building from the owner's point of view what is it so many court cases have told for the owner's point of view it would be cost of improvement so guys in a marathon session i am assuming that you already know all the uh, you know areas so i am just discussing from an overall point of view and, and like this from this point of view what will happen that point of view what will happen like that both if we discuss it will be very easy for you to understand in uh, regular batch we'll go very much in depth uh, reading the bare act each and every line why this is paid why this is payable all that is different but here we will be discussing in a very very different way got it it's just revision so i hope you understand we are revising so again guys capital repairs is a new concept called deemed building so if you see where the ssc carries on business or profession in a building not owned by him any capex incurred by the ssc for the purpose of business or profession on construction of any structure renovation or extension of the building such capex will be treated as building as if the building is owned by the ssc and ssc can claim depreciation on the expenditure incurred concept of deemed building section 30 is about current expenses that is revenue expenditure on building used for business or profession whereas section 31 talks about expenses relating to machinery plant and furniture used for business again this is current expenses 31 talks about current expenses machinery plant furniture only and used for the purpose of business or profession owner paying rent to itself not deductible tenant paying rent rent is not covered under 31 so this is deductible under 37 whereas here rent to the building is covered under 30 not 37 so it will come under 30 whereas rent to rent paid to machinery plant furniture if he has taken it on rent deductible under 37 insurance whoever pays deductible revenue repairs whoever gets it done deductible capital repairs obviously not deductible it should be current repairs if i replace the part also that repair versus replacement if it brings about a change in the entire efficiency of the product building then it is advance or structural change that is called as normal what do you say replacement and that will uh, be added to the cost of the asset but if it is just for through normal wear and tear then it will be current repair so to speak so what is replacement whether it increases the entire value it should be seen on a case to case basis now comes the very interesting part my dear friends depreciation in normal traditional method depreciation is always on a single asset method but in income tax it is based on what concept of block 
so there is no difference between the asset and the group of assets all the assets will be clubbed together and then it will be created in a block so block of assets is what is taken into consideration so it is not company wise my dear friends it is sse wise so basically if you have many ventures under you so if i am a sole proprietor and i have one let's say uh, agarbatti division and i have chocolate manufacturing division all the assets of all these businesses should be clubbed together it's not that for, for one business separate assets other business separate assets no everything should be clubbed together and then it should be done so it is not company wise it is ssc wise so basically very simple this is the entire format let's see so depreciation is a reduction in the usable value of fixed assets due to normal wear and tear it is not the single asset method it is the what do you say block concept block concept it is based on the class of assets and there is a various rates of depreciation and method of depreciation will be either w wdv or it will be on the straight line method we'll see normal depreciation there's something called additional depreciation also and depreciation of power sector undertaking you can either use slm or you can use wdv all those things so the main conditions of depreciation is you should be the owner of the asset even if you are a part owner because the law says you should either own wholly or partly even if you are a part owner of the asset you can claim a corresponding depreciation so you should be first condition owner of the asset even fractional ownership is recognized but there are certain exceptions to it one is deemed building already discussed if you are a tenant having a building and it's a deemed building concept yes then you can anything that you incur towards renovation extension or improvement can be claimed as depreciation second thing is when i use the word owner should you be a registered owner or should you be the beneficial owner is the question registered owner or beneficial owner so basically the for example if you are owner of a motor vehicle and uh, it is registered let's say i have bought motor vehicles around 7 8 trucks and i have given it to somebody to run the show so somebody else is running the transport business i am the actual owner but as per the motor vehicles act it is registered in the name of somebody else i am the actual owner actual owner means all the benefits come to me i am the beneficial owner but registration as per motor vehicles act i did not get it done i got it done in somebody else's name there is a proper agreement everything is uh, fit there now the question is depreciation who will claim i can claim or the other fellow who is using it as a business he can claim i am also using it the business i have given it uh, to that other person on rent but ultimately i am the owner but the as per motor vehicles act registration is in his name so this issue went to court in many cases and it was held that you know ownership is legal ownership is not mandatory what is mentioned in the motor vehicles act is not at all relevant what is relevant is beneficial ownership so who has a beneficial ownership i have the beneficial ownership as simple as that so if you see in uh, nidish transport company kerala case law they clearly told that motor vehicle registered owner need not be there you just have to be a beneficial owner and even as per icds uh, versus i mean there's a case law icds versus commissioner of income tax supreme court case law there also they told that registered owner you need not be you should be a beneficial owner you should be an exclusive owner you should have given it for a limited period and you have a right to inspection in all these case uh, the main uh, owner beneficial owner had the, had the exclusive ownership of the uh, motor vehicle uh, he was he had leased it or given it on rent for a limited period and moreover he had the right to inspect every time that's why the lawmaker the court said yes it is not the registered owner my dear friends it is the beneficial owner and in accounts you have many things called finance lease operating lease and now in the new uh, indas the concept of operating lease finance lease is not there everything is under lease only whatever the case may be whatever the accounting treatment may be most important to know depreciation is always and always and always given to a lessor and not to a lessee so lessee or registered owner will not get depreciation depreciation is always for a lessor that is the most important thing that is why it's an exception 
So it is not mandatory for you to have a legal ownership. If you have beneficial ownership, then it is okay. I told you, Mysore Minerals Limited, Supreme Court judgment. In case of higher purchase contract owner, you will be the owner only after the last installment is played. However, depreciation can be claimed by capitalizing the value equivalent to cash price from the beginning itself, you can claim, no problem. In case of all leasing transactions, owner of the asset only is entitled to the depreciation, that is the lessor is entitled to depreciation, even though it may be used by somebody else. Right? So, depreciation is for what? First condition is, it should be, you should be the owner. Second condition, you should use the asset. Guys, it's not based on ready to use. It is based on the concept of put to use. If I have bought an AC and not installed it in the office, I was just lying somewhere. As per Companies Act, you will claim depreciation because it is ready to use basis, a fluxion of time. But as far as Income Tax Act is concerned, it is not uh, taken into consideration because it is not put to use yet. It is just ready to use. So, basically it should be put to use and not ready to use. However, there are certain, there is an exception to this. Certain areas, even if it is ready to use, you can use it. Those are standby equipments. For example, fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher on, so you know, basically fire extinguisher, what happens? It is based on ready to use concept. Fire extinguisher, actually you should pray that you will never use fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers are installed everywhere. Is it ready to use? Yes. Is it put to use? May or may not be. May not never be put to use. So there are certain exceptions. Standby equipment. I have a generator. My entire factory runs on this generator. And if the generator fails, I need a backup. So backup will always be there. Similarly, a server is there. If that server which stores all the data crashes, immediately there is one more server which always constantly keeps taking backup after every one minute. So that also will be deemed to be, depreciation will be on that particular thing. So if you see, some special points, if any amount, if any expense, I am doing less than 5000 rupees. If I am buying an asset of less than 5000 rupees uh, and I am disposing it off, for example, so I will claim expenditure, I will not, I will, you know, completely write it off in the Companies Act, but in Income Tax Act, if even if I buy an asset worth 1 rupee, I should add it in the block of assets. So it's all the block of asset concept. Then revaluation concept in accounting, it is different. I will have different, different revaluation techniques, etc. In Income Tax Act, the entire concept of revaluation is ignored. And as far as put to use is concerned, exception as I told you, generally it is put to use. What is the exception? Standby equipment, fire extinguisher, servicing equipment like UPS generator, etc. Spare parts. Spare parts are always added to the asset. If it, if it increases the capacity, it is capitalized, otherwise it is expensed off. So, spare parts, important spare parts which are necessary to run the show. Like for example, in a car, battery is there. To fix the battery, there are many spares required uh, which will connect to the entire ignition. Now, if that only is not there, that will, by inserting a new one, I have to capitalize the same. So, these are all the various things to be kept in mind. So, is it mandatory to claim depreciation as per Companies Act? Yes, definitely. Section 129 of Companies Act says it is mandatory to claim depreciation. As per Income Tax Act, once upon a time it was not at all mandatory. But Explanation 5 to 32.1, Explanation 5 to 32.1 has clearly said that it is mandatory to claim depreciation. You have to charge depreciation. That's why. Basically, there were many people who were telling that depreciation may not have been required. Many people were not even claiming depreciation. So, the lawmaker suggested that nothing, nothing doing, you have to claim depreciation because you cannot just escape from the concept of depreciation. So, explanation 5 was added to clearly remove those stupid doubts that were arising. The removal of that hereby declared that the provisions of this subsection, what subsection? Depreciation shall apply whether or not the SSE has claimed in computing his total income. I don't care. I don't care in your books if you have not shown. Depreciation is mandatory in nature. So, though usage of assets, so first condition, my dear friend, should be, I again repeat, you should be the owner. Second condition, 
uh, there are exceptions to that. Second condition, you must use the asset. Active use, passive use. Generally active use, some cases passive use. Third condition, usage should be for the purpose of business. But in some cases, it is uh, even though it is not for the purpose of business, there was an excess in various cases where they have taken, it's okay, even if it's not used directly for business, indirectly it's helping in business. For example, a recreation center. Many companies you have seen, there are TD tables, billiards table, then also, you know, a chess and other carom board table, etc. And generally, there is an outdoor game area, all those things. This is providing recreation for the employee. Because the employees are happy, they will put double efforts in the work and it will eventually aid business. Point number one. Second, also, for example, if there's any uh, a temple, if I have bought, if I have constructed a temple, church, mosque, whatever the case may be, these things what? These things aid in, you know, giving peace of mind to the employee. It will also help that person in doing what? In uh, absorbing the faith and becoming happy, being at peace, and then definitely going ahead with his life. So that also a standby machine is one thing that we saw and here usage of asset you see a temple for or a recreational room is for the benefit of employees and still eligible for depreciation all these are eligible for depreciation and that asset must be put to use in the previous year guys if it is not put to use no depreciation even if it is used for the part of the year you will get depreciation if it is used for more than 180 days you will get full rate of depreciation if it is used for less than 180 days you will get Part depreciation is what they say. So ultimately, as I told you, it should be the block of asset concept. So what are the block of assets divided into tangible and intangible assets? Tangible assets will be building, furniture, plant and machinery. And intangible assets will be patents, know-how, copyright, licenses and franchisees. A very important change came in assessment year 21-22. Goodwill. Earlier, people used to claim depreciation on goodwill. Now they said that goodwill is not at all a intangible asset. Goodwill of a business cannot be considered as an intangible asset. So, it will not be considered as an intangible asset because of various Supreme Court judgment. There was a lot of confusion whether to take it or not. Later they said, no, I should remove it from the block completely. So, the rates of depreciation and from, I mean, intangible block as on 1-4-2020, I should compute the WDV of the goodwill and remove it completely from the block. And what are the blocks, my dear friends? As I told you, what are the rates of various blocks? So as far as blocks are concerned, we have already discussed. These are the blocks. Furniture block, building block, plant and machinery block, patents block. Furniture, it is at 10% generally. Building, if it's residential, it is 5%. Other building, 10%. Residential building means what? Basically, Infosys has a uh, quarters for its employees. Those quarters are maintained by Infosys. So that is called residential building. So that, what rate can you claim? 5%. Other building, 10%. Plant and machinery, you have 15% and 40%, depending on the various cases. And intangibles, patent, copyright, etc., it is at 25%. So this is what the rates are. If it is a purely temporary building, it is 40%. Residential building, 5%. Other building, 10%. Furniture and fitting, 10%. Machinery and plant. For motor car, it is, if it is used in the business of uh, like a taxi, 30%. Otherwise, it is 15%. This 45 and 30 is irrelevant now. You can leave it. Uh, ships is 20%. All other cases, it is 40%, my dear friends. And one last thing, windmill. Windmill bought after 1-4-2014 is 15%. Oil well is 15%. Any other missionary is 15%. So, 40% will be your aeroplane, computer including computer software and all those things. Computer software. Again, amendment came. Computer software is not at all part of computers anymore. Computer software is now called royalty. And will be allowed as an expenditure, it is definitely not asset. So, two important changes. In intangible asset, which is of 25%, goodwill has to be subtracted completely. Whether it is purchased goodwill or acquired goodwill or it is, you know, self-generated goodwill, both should be removed. And as far as computer software is concerned, royalty must be totally excluded from that particular thing. As simple as that. Electrical fittings will include all these wiring, switches, sockets, etc. Computer software means any computer program. Goodwill is not there. What about water treatment system? So, Infosys has a separate water treatment system whereby 
all the uh, you know dirty water will come out of these toilets get recycled and again it is used for beautification gardening of the entire infosys that will include desalination demineralization purification of water everything it will cover uh, what about you know what about this when i say building there are like for example four buildings here and i will connect roads and there is a small well these roads are also part of the building this well also is part of the building footpath is also building everything will be building my dear friends all this will be part of the term building is what they say so block of assets is tangible and intangible right these are so in block building there are three blocks namely 5% 10% 40% 40%. in plant and machinery there will be five blocks 15 20 30 40 45 ships is 20% Furniture and fittings, one block of 10%, intangible asset, one block of 25%. And building, as I told you, will include everything. Bridges, roads, culverts, etc. Asset which does not qualify for depreciation like land, etc. will not be forming part of any block as such. Furniture is not defined in Income Tax Act. Generally understood that anything that provides a proper decoration and anything which provides convenience and comfort is furniture. Machinery is also not defined. Anything which aids in the production or manufacture of a product is called machinery. Now, plant. Plant was not defined properly before. But what about, I am a, a company which is also has animals with me and I am using animals to transport lots of goods because these are in mountainous areas. Cars, etc. will not go. So, you have to carry it on the horse's back or the donkey's back. Mule, mule they call, mules back. Now the thing is, I am using it as, um, is it an asset is the question. If I have, if I am a, what, if I own a kennel and I sell dogs, never ever purchase dogs guys, always adopt. I am just saying, if you sell dogs, there I am treating animals as stock in trade. So there it will not come. But I am talking about this, carrying the, you know, load on the donkeys and mules, etc. and horses. What do you think? Is that a plant? So many such discussions had happened. In 36, there was an amendment where they said, when you sell an animal after it is dead, whatever money you get from the carcass, it should be subtracted from the cost of the asset. For example, if I buy a horse for 1 lakh rupees, and once the horse dies, I will sell off the skin for 10,000 rupees. 1 lakh minus 10,000, 90,000 is allowed in the year in which it dies. And when I sell it, but can the as a horse be used as an asset? No. So, one, 36 was inserted to tell it's a revenue expenditure. Second, plant definition was amended to exclude what? Tea bushes, livestock, livestock. See? So, plant includes ship, vehicles, books, scientific apparatus, etc. used for the business, but does not include tea bushes because tea bushes, it's separate. Livestock, it's separate. Building, it's separate. Furniture and fitting is separate. So, in a movie theater, what about those uh, nice recliner seats, etc.? Is it a building or is it machinery? Can I, should I claim 10% or should I claim 15%? So, basically, this also went to a couple of, uh, you know, quotes. And the quotes mentioned that it should be, cannot be treated as a plant. They are still building. So, in PBR recliner seat, if I sit, it is not machinery. It is still part of the building. So the functional test here, it should be helpful in manufacturing of something. Then only it is called as a plant. So if I have a prawn making division or an oyster division, where in a farm I have divided into four water bodies and I am manufacturing prawn there, I am growing fish there. In my fisheries division, I am growing fish in these, uh, you know, uh, curated areas. Now this, my dear friends. It is not land, mind you. This also is plant because I am helping it in manufacturing of fish, production of fish. Imagine these are all, these are the questions that they will ask in the exam. In MCQs, just to trick you. Okay. Hope you understood this, my dear buddies. All right, guys, moving on, right? Let's see other areas. Uh, plant is what we discussed previously in the immediately previous segment. Uh, so now what we will see is we will see the theater building, theater building, hotel building. So generally I am a movie buff. So I keep going to these movies almost uh, uh, roughly to the theater at least twice a week to be honest. So there like if we sit on a recliner chair etc. Now tell me is that a machinery or is it a plant or is it just a building? 
so was the question raised in many cases it was held that it cannot be treated as plant for the purpose of depreciation it will still essentially be buildings it will be buildings so guys if you want the material you can purchase the uh, module 1 which has everything uh, whatever we are doing so you can purchase that material soft copy cannot be provided guys so i hope you understand moving on if the uh, you know SSE is engaged in more than one business also you need to understand that the block of asset is SSE wise and it is not business wise so everything will be taken as an entire whole and you will be uh, charging depreciation on the same thing so if supported by fundamental income should be computed source wise and not for the business as a whole so here it is for the entire source so to speak and if the unity of control management everything is with one person so you should take the SSE the entire that is the source source is the SSE so he has multiple businesses which will be taken from a single SSE point of view even if one uh, business gets discontinued it's okay other businesses will run so it will not amount to the discontinuance of the entire business it's just discontinuance of a uh, one division which can be taken into account Method of depreciation as discussed for uh, power generation, etc. It is straight line method or WDV and for others it is written down value method only. So guys, as uh, far as WDV is concerned, so we have seen all the block concept, what are the blocks, etc. that are there, 5%, 10%, 40, 15, 20, 30, 40, 45 and one black block of 10% and one block of 25% for intangible and 10% for furniture and fittings. Now, if you have to see the concept of WDB under 43.6, this is how the entire uh, structure would be. So, first, WDB of the assets in the immediately preceding uh, previous year, I should take first, less. Depreciation actually allowed in the immediately preceding previous year, actually allowed. Then you will get the WDB of the block at the beginning of the previous year. Then what will you add? Add actual cost of assets acquired during the previous year. Put to use for 180 days or more, put to use for less than 180 days and ac acquired but not put to use. Because the depreciation is on put to use basis and not on ready to use basis. So acquired but not put to use, I should write it separately because for this there is no depreciation. And if it is 180 days or more, it is full depreciation, less than 180, day, 180 days it is, you know, 50% depreciation. Less money is payable. Guys, money is payable means money is receivable. In respect of any asset in the block which is sold, discarded, demolished or destroyed together with the scrap value, if any, the deletions during the year. So, all deletions during the year I should subtract. And then, if at all there is a slum sale in capital gain, you will understand. If there is a slum sale, WDV of assets transferred in slum sale will be subtracted. And finally, what you will get is WDV for the purpose of depreciation. Less you will now do the depreciation calculation of actually allowed and then you will get the closing value of the block of assets. So guys as simple if it is 180 days or more full rate of depreciation less than 180 days half rate of depreciation assets not put to use no depreciation. So money is payable as I told you will include anything that you receive in respect of that particular asset. So money is payable will include any insurance, salvage, compensation etc. Where any asset is sold and the price for which it is sold also should be taken into consideration. It is money is payable to the SSE hence money is receivable. So in case it is completely destroyed and nothing you get not even 1 rupee for that you should take it as nil as simple as that. On the other hand, like for example, if the WDV is, I mean, whatever WDV of the amount of the uh, thing before this money is payable is uh, 10 lakh rupees and some of the assets you sold it for 15 lakh rupees, WDV, final WDV should never be negative. It can never be negative. It should be nil. Always it should be nil. The extra portion can either be short term capital gain or loss that we'll see later. So technically, if the asset is used for uh, after 4th October of the previous year, then half rate of depreciation. If it is put to use before 4th October, then full rate of depreciation. Because if you com compute 180 days, exactly 4th October will come. April, May, June, July, August, September and October 4th will become my 180 days of use. Now, goodwill. There was an amendment in the uh, you know uh, assessment year from the financial year 2021 uh, and assessment year 21-22 that goodwill is no longer a part of block of assets. 
goodwill portion whether it is acquired goodwill or whether it is self generated goodwill has to be extracted from the intangible block so from the intangible block goodwill portion we have to remove but you would have what do you say uh, taken depreciation on goodwill for the past 5 years assume so what should i do today standing on 1st april 2020 how will i treat goodwill let's say goodwill was acquired 5 years ago i have already given depreciation to for, you know for the goodwill portion 5 years ago only what will i do so basically the law maker says you should take goodwill as if it was a separate asset you should take depreciation as if uh, depreciation on goodwill was already allowed and then that wdv portion of goodwill has to be removed from the total intangible value for example if you see x purchased intangible asset consisting of goodwill and patents for 20 lakhs goodwill was purchased for 10 lakhs the opening block of wdv was nil actual cost of asset acquired during the previous year 20 lakh money payable nil and less depreciation 1819 so for closing wdv is 15 lakhs then for 1920 again 15 lakhs i will take i will subtract the depreciation this is the closing wdv now as i told you on 1st april 2020 i should take the goodwill portion out how will i take it out wdv of goodwill as if it were the only asset in the block so if you see if it was only asset in the block how will i take what is the goodwill value you see 10 lakhs so 10 lakh minus 25% minus 25% 2 years i have to subtract so guys what i will get finally was 5 lakh 62000 mind you this 11 lakh 25000 has this 5 lakh 62500 that's what it means so on 1st april 2020 i need to subtract the value of goodwill from that so from 11 lakh 25000 i need to subtract 5 lakh 62500 from it and whatever remains that will be my wdv for depreciation less depreciation for the previous year and then whatever i will get that will be my closing wdv so goodwill guys with effect from 1st april 2020 i should remove from the block and it should be treated separately is what they say now there could be a scenario where what do you say uh they have used the word actually allowed here see check it out they have used the word here actually allowed now what do you mean by actually allowed very simple whatever depreciation is allowed as per the act so here if you think about it whatever depreciation is allowed as per the act uh, so in this example for instance what is depreciation actually allowed 5 lakh 5 lakh is actually allowed can there be a case where depreciation is disallowed also sometimes yes possible especially if i am in my uh, what do you say manufacturing of tea coffee rubber etc there are rule 8 and other rules will apply whereby some part of it is uh, business and some part of it is non business correct so in tea business etc some part of it is business and some part of it is non business so just for example i am telling if let us say my income is 100 crore of which let us say 40 crore is considered to be business income and 60 crore is considered to be agricultural income fair enough similarly my asset value was 1000 crore of which now 400 crore is deemed to be what do you say oh, let's say 100 crore okay let me make depreciation here and 1000 crore is the wdv of the asset my dear friends let me take a depreciation of let me make it 2000 crore let me take depreciation of 200 crore 200 crore is depreciation as yes, randomly i'm telling now the question is in this 200 crore correct 80 crore and 120 crore 80 crore represents what depreciation on business income 120 crore talks about depreciation on agricultural income so the question now was when i am taking the income as only 40 crore let us say this is income before depreciation correct income before depreciation the question is should i subtract depreciation of 200 crore or should i subtract only 80 crore as depreciation should i subtract 80 crore as depreciation and carry forward 
So 40 minus 80 is minus 40. 40 will be unabsorbed depreciation. What is the depreciation I should take? Some of the companies were taking the income portion as 40 crore, but depreciation they were taking full 200 crore. So they were making 40 minus 200, that is 160 crore. 40 minus 200, 160 crore. They were carrying forward as what? At as, what do you say? Unabsorbed depreciation. Or if this business income happened to be 1000 crore, and this is 400 and 600. So 400 minus 200. 200 crore they were offering to tax. So the question was, should I offer 400 minus 200 or should I offer just 400 minus 80? Because 400 represents business income and 80 crore represents that portion. Now this is what is actually allowed. Right? So the question here was, what do you mean by actually allowed? Depreciation actually allowed was, was it the full amount of 200 crore or I should take only 80 crore was the question. Many conflicting judgments etc happened that is why this explanation was added here. Check it out explanation number 7. When SSC derives income partly from agriculture and partly for business the total amount of depreciation shall be computed as if the entire income is business income. And the depreciation computed shall be deemed to be the depreciation actually allowed in computing the WDV. So what the office, I mean what with the company is doing was, when I am computing my WDV, I used to take 2000 crore minus just 80 crore. And here I was taking, what do you say, 1920 crore. Ideally, what you should take? 2000 crore minus 200 crore, 1800 crore. So they were okay with this guys, 400 minus 80, 400 minus 200, all that was immaterial because here, if I take 1920 crore, I would charge, I would get a higher depreciation over the years. But if I took 200 crore, I would just get almost, you know, 120 crore less depreciation. WDV would reduce by 120 crore. The question here was, what should I do? Should I take the depreciation full 200 crore or should I take the depreciation 80 crore? Because actually allowed, my dear friends, is just 80 crore. That's what is actually allowed. So basically, my entire business would be what? 400 crore minus 80 crore. For 320 crore, I have to pay tax. That is undoubtedly true. Only 80 crore was actually allowed. So should I take 2000 minus 80 or 2000 minus 200 was the question. If I take 2000 minus 80 which is actually allowed, my WDV will increase by 120 crore, thereby in over the years depreciation I can claim. So to ensure that this anomaly does not continue, this particular explanation was added which you can see in the notes. When the SEC derives income partly from agriculture and partly from business, total amount of depreciation shall be computed as if the entire income is business income. And the depreciation computed shall be deemed to be the depreciation actually allowed. Which means I should take, what is the depreciation computed? Full depreciation 200 shall be deemed to be the depreciation actually allowed. Why deemed? Because actually allowed is 80 crore, not 200 crore. But I should take full 200 crore and only take reduced WDV. 1800 is what I should take, not 1920 is what this particular section talks about, guys. Hope you understood. So half rate of depreciation, all that you know, that is, uh, you know, fine. So if you see here, for example, let's take one example just to understand. Plant and missionary 15% depreciation at an opening WDV of 1000. A new plant and missionary of 500 rupees at 15% was purchased on 15 March 22. Part of the plant and missionary was sold for 300 on 20th March. In this case, opening value of the block 1000, add purchases. Assets for more than 180 days nil, less than 180 days. Why? Because it was added, 500 was added on 15 March 22, guys. So add this. Assets not used is nil, total asset is 1500, 
but 300 was sold on 20th March 22. That also I should subtract. So value for calculating depreciation 1200. So guys, the sad part of it is even though if it was used for full year and almost just 10 days before the year ended, you have sold it off when you subtract it. Depreciation you will not get on that 300 crore. 300 crore. So what is depreciation? This 500 is used for less than 180 days, hence half depreciation. Balance, balance. For balance, you will 700, you will get full depreciation 105. What is the total depreciation? 142.5. Closing WDV of the block will be 1057.5. In the above example, value of the asset sold was 1100 instead of 300. WDV for calculating depreciation will be 400. Depreciation will be calculated at half rate as this balance value remaining in the block from the new acquisition. So in this particular thing, instead of 1100 here, this instead of 300 for 1100. So what is the balance left? Just 400. This 400 should be assumed that it is part of the new 500 that you have acquired. So you will only get 400 into 7.5 depreciation. If the asset was purchased in July of the relevant previous year, but put to use only in December of the relevant previous year, my dear friends. So can I say it is purchased, what do you say, more than 182 days? Yes, but the question here is, depreciation must be calculated from the day it was put to use. Even though it was acquired for more than 182 days before, it was put to use for less than 180 days, hence half rate of depreciation. Even if you purchase on 1st April, but you put to use only in, on 1st December, half rate of depreciation, because in uh, Income Tax Act, it is based on put to use. Then example 6 is very interesting. If the asset was purchased in July 21, but put to use only in December 22, depreciation will not be charged for previous year 21-22 as the asset was not at all put to use. And guys, for Previous year 22-23, most important thing is depreciation will be charged at the full rate and not half rate. Because for half rate of depreciation, the wordings are, it should have been put to use in that previous year, that previous year. Which previous year? The same year in which it was acquired. That previous year in which the asset was acquired and put to use for less than 180 days. So guys, if you buy two years before but put to use today and that two in December, it is not half rate of depreciation. You will get full rate of depreciation. I hope you understood this. In case of this is just, you know, simple quick revision. So you need to make a note of all these things and move on. WDV in case of business restructuring, my dear friends. Yes, basically it will be as, as per the actual cost minus whatever at the time of depreciation you will reduce. Uh, at the time of, sorry, uh, reconstruction, amalgamation, demerger, conversion, etc. And then predominantly everything what they'll do is they will split between amalgamating company and the amalgamated company. In all the things, it's the same case. Immediately before the transfer, whatever it will be, that only will be recorded. So at the time of transfer, at the time of amalgamation, if the WDV is, uh, let's say, 10 lakh 50 thousand rupees, that same thing will be shifted to the amalgamated company is what this particular section tells. Same with uh, conversion, succession and all those things. And of course, proportionate dep uh, depreciation in case of succession of business taking place during a previous year, full amount of depreciation is computed and then it is apportioned between the predecessor and the successor in the ratio of number of days of use is what they say. Now, let us go into a very, very interesting concept of actual cost. Most important because a lot of explanations are there in this actual cost. So, very much applicable for our examination. Yeah. So, the next part of the story is uh, actual cost. So, let's go to actual cost and understand what are the various elements here. So, actual cost means the cost of the asset to the SSE as reduced by that portion of the cost which has met, met directly or indirectly by any other person or authority. Met directly or indirectly by any other person or authority. So, actual cost will be the actual cost whatever I bought minus that po portion of the cost is met by some other person. Some other person means it can be government grant, it can be somebody else has bought on my behalf. So, whatever the case may be, that portion has to be reduced. For example, if I buy an asset worth 1 crore of which 20 lakh is donated by somebody else, 
and that portion has to be reduced from the actual cost. But if it's a gift, we will see how it works later. So that is regarding the actual cost of the asset. So let me check if there are other areas. Along with actual cost when we go, there is also additional depreciation which will come later. But after all these explanations are done, we will go to the additional depreciation concept as well. It will come here, all these other areas. <clears throat> and unabsorbed depreciation and other things and the SLM basis which will come. So this is how it looks with all the examples here. So that will end obviously the depreciation chapter. So first we will do actual cost then we will do the other parts of depreciation. We can do either way, we can do depreciation also and then go there. Okay, let's do one thing, let's finish off types of depreciation and then come to actual cost. So types of depreciation, you have normal depreciation and there is something called additional depreciation. So additional depreciation you will get at 20% my dear friends and it is for new plant and machinery. So first of all it should be new plant and machinery, it should be used for manufacture or production of an article or a thing and then it should be in the business of generation or transmission of distribution or power. So either power generation or manufacturing of any article or a thing. And it should be for either new business or existing business, doesn't matter, but it should be new plant and machinery, which means old, not allowed, second hand, not allowed. Even if it is imported into India for the first time, still not allowed. Imported into India also, not allowed. Traditional, basically if it's used somewhere else, but imported into India, and in India it's used for the first time, still not allowed. So you should not get confused for additional depreciation, New plant and machinery will mean new plant and machinery, but there is something else, specified business, etc. In specified business, even if you import it from outside India, that will be allowed there. So, you should not get confused. Here, new plant and machinery means brand new, as simple as that. Additional depreciation is not allowed in relation to building, furniture, intangible asset, plant and machinery installed in office premises, plant and machinery installed in residential premises office appliances or road transport vehicles, second hand plant and machinery whether used in India or outside India, ship and aircraft and all these things. But guys, you would have seen uh, in the factory forklift vehicles, these are also trucks. So if you see, it doesn't apply to road transport vehicles, but it will apply to forklift ve vehicles used in the factory. So this forklift vehicles you would have seen, large vehicles which are used with a forklift which is used to, uh, you know, uh, transport goods, etc. from one place to other place in the factory. Those forklift vehicles are very much part of the entire deal. For that, additional depreciation will be allowed. But for these things, additional depreciation will not be allowed. But for newly set up manufacturing units in notified backward areas of Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Telangana and West Bengal, additional depreciation instead of 20%, the rate will be 35% is what they say. An additional depreciation is allowed in the first year when it is put to use. So if it is put to use for less than 180 days, then you will get instead of 20%, 10%. But the best part is the remaining 10% you can claim it the next year. So there is no bar on it, definitely you can claim. Uh, and additional depreciation is used only and only when WDV method is used. If SLM is used, additional depreciation is not allowed. Then it says for the manufacturing of a thing. So if I am into uh, broadcasting of, uh, you know, uh, I am a TV channel, I am into broadcasting. I am basically, I am manufacturer, I make movies and then I broadcast. I make web series and I broadcast. I am a FM radio channel, I create content and then I broadcast, telecast, broadcast, whatever. All these things, is, whether it will involve manufacture or not is the question. So if I buy a brand new camera and I create a new web series and I then broadcast it on uh, television, would that amount to? Uh, telecasting, broadcasting would amount to manufacture. Similarly, I am uh, an FM channel and I will now create something, uh, a, a new show I will create, a radio show uh, where, where I will talk about let's say mental health. 
right it's and mental health among students and then the special segment on ca students now that part if i uh, created on my own and then i am broadcasting there are a lot of interviews with various mental health uh, you know uh, executives and mental health what do you say psychiatrist now the question is would that amount to manufacture that's the question so yes my dear friends all this will amount to manufacture and shall be eligible for additional depreciation if you use a depreciation partly for business and partly for personal purposes definitely proportionate expenses for business personal purposes will not be allowed under 382 then for example if my profit before depreciation is uh, 40 crore and my depreciation happens to be 60 crore 20 crore will be my unabsorbed depreciation now that as per 322 interesting use of words it can be utilized set off for any number of years it can be used subsequent years indefinitely is the word they have not used that it will only be used for 4 years 5 years 6 years indefinitely so unabsorbed depreciation can be set off against any income except the head salary so salary income you cannot set off any other income you can set off and let's say i have unabsorbed depreciation today of 20 crore and 2 uh, years later i discontinue my business 5 years later in a new business can i claim this unabsorbed depreciation of an old business yes i can because in the bear act nowhere it says business should continue continuation of a business is not a criteria then generally guys losses etc can be carried forward only if you file the return but there it says if you have not what do you say filed the return you cannot carry and set off uh, set off set off and carry forward the losses of you know section 72 73 like that they tell they don't know where they speak about 32 2 so interesting point is the fifth point unabsorbed depreciation is allowed to be set off in subsequent year also even if no return has been filed by the ssc for the relevant assessment year then as far as power sector undertaking is concerned the concept there is slm method and you can use wdb also but if slm method is used very simple uh, for example if the asset value is let us say the wd the, the wdv is uh, let us suppose it is 10 lakh and the sale value happens to be 8 lakh basically we will sell the asset of the slm which was used in slm basis it was 8 lakh 2 lakh rupees is the loss that 2 lakh rupee loss is termed as terminal depreciation and it is debited to p and l account on the other hand let's say the original cost of the asset was 15 lakh original cost of the asset was 15 lakh and the wdv is 10 lakh you sold the asset for 12 lakh you sold the asset for 12 lakh mind you this extra 2 lakh rupees is an income and it is treated as balancing charge credited to the pnl account but interesting to know original cost of the asset was 15 lakh your wdv was 10 lakh and you sold it for 16 lakh more than the original cost so from 10 lakh to 15 lakh this will be called as balancing charge and 15 lakh to 16 lakh 1 lakh extra will be my capital gain under 50 capital a will be capital gain under 50 capital a that is what it is and guys generally in a block of assets when i sell off the asset in the entire block if my wdv is let's say 5 lakh rupees and i sell either all the assets or one asset in the block for more than the wdv let's say 6 lakh rupees that remaining 1 lakh extra will be called as capital gain so generally guys when will the block concept exists exist block concept will exist when there should be at least one asset in the block plus the block should have some value right there should be at least one asset in the block and the block must have some value block must have some value if the block has no value then obviously capital gain will arise and if the block has value but there are no assets only allowed then of course section the block concept will cease to exist so basically as i told you there must be at least one asset in the block and some value for the block on which prescribed percentage can be applied 
Even if one of the above conditions are not satisfied on transfer of any asset from the block, provisions of section 32 shall cease to apply and automatically the provisions of section 50 will come into play. So here if you see for example, there are 8 assets in the existing block which has an opening WDV of 8 lakh, 2 more new assets were acquired during the year which had an actual cost of 3 lakh. So if you see opening WDV 8 lakh, actual cost of asset acquired 3 lakh, totally it is 11 lakh. And less sale of asset, all 10 assets were sold for 12 lakh rupees here. Asset also is not there and the value also is not there. Hence in this case, block concept will cease to exist. And the, there is a short term capital gain from because 12 lakh is the full value of consideration and cost of acquisition is taken to be the WDV 11. So totally it is 1. Mind you, if I sell the assets in the block such that the WDV becomes nil and the WDV, the sale value is more than the WDV, it is always and always and always short term capital gain. Even though if the asset is used for 5 years, 6 years, 7 years, if I sell it, it's still short term capital gain because if I make it long term capital gain, you will get it at a discounted rate of 20% tax rate. But if I make it short term capital gain, except triple 1A in all the areas, it is always normal tax rates. Hence, here since depreciation benefit of 30% has already been taken, it is always deemed to be short term capital gain. In this particular question, 10 assets were there for 11 lakh, all 10 assets were sold for 10 lakh, there is still 1 lakh remaining, but unfortunately no assets are remaining. In this case there are no assets left in the block but it's a WDV for the block as one of the conditions is not satisfied, provisions of section 50 get attracted and the provisions of 32 will cease to apply. And in this case there will be a short term capital loss of 1 lakh. 6 assets are sold at 12 lakh 50 thousand. So there are 10 lakh, 10 assets at 11 lakh, 6 assets are sold for 12 lakh 50. So what is the WDV for depreciation? Only 4 lakh is the WDV for depreciation, the number of assets, but the value will be nil. Here also my dear friends, you will get what? 1 lakh 50 thousand rupees worth of short term capital gain. 6 assets are sold at 8 lakh rupees, 6 assets are sold at 8 lakh rupees, remaining are 4 lakh assets and here 3 lakh. This is the only scenario where Assets are also remaining, amount is also remaining and hence in this particular case provisions of 32 are attracted and the block is subject to depreciation. To summarize, if assets are not there, WDV is also not there, depreciation will not come, capital gain will come. If either of the two cases, assets are there, WDV is there, assets not there, WDV is not there in both the cases, capital gain will come, depreciation will not come. The only case where depreciation will come but capital gain will not come will be assets are there, WDV are there. Both the cases depreciation will come, capital gain will not come is what they say. It is always short term capital gain. So this was regarding why capital gain. Now let us, this completes depreciation by the way, this completes depreciation in all aspects. But one additional thing that we have to keep in mind is uh, if at all they ask the stamp duty value also, if they ask the stamp duty value also, then my dear friends, it should always be to the tune of stamp duty value. Because in capital gain, the selling price is 40, stamp duty value is 60 lakhs. And in that case, section 32 will apply. Uh, for example, the WDV of the asset was 52 lakh, let's say, WDV of the block was 52 lakh, selling price was 40 lakh, but the stamp duty value was 60 lakh. Then 52 minus 40, so that 12 lakh is still there, no? 12 lakh is still there. So WDV, does it exist? Yes. So since WDV exists, 32 will come, section 50 will not come and section 50C also will not come. 50C is regarding stamp duty. On the other hand, a WDV is 52 lakh, selling price is 60 lakh, but SDV is 80 lakh, my dear friends. Now you see 52 minus 60, obviously the block will become nil. Now both will come, section 50 also will come, 50C also will come. 50C will tell that if the stamp duty value is more than the selling price, the stamp duty value is more than the selling price, then you should take the stamp duty value only as the consideration. So. For capital gain purposes, I will take the selling price to be the stamp duty value. So I am just connecting capital gain.
So my dear friends, let's come to actual cost. In fact, we finished depreciation and now we're coming to actual cost. Yes. So actual cost means what? Cost of the asset of the S, uh, to the SSE as reduced by the portion of cost has been already met directly or indirectly. So I told you if what is met directly or indirectly by any other person, if there's any government grant, etc., then that has to be subtracted. So what is actual cost? Cost of purchase or construction of the asset that is a purchase price less amount of GST. So guys, if GST or customs, whatever it is, if I have claimed ITC, since I've already claimed ITC, that will not be forming part of the actual cost. So if the value of the asset is 1 lakh and 18,000 GST separately ITC is claimed, 18,000 will not be taken into account. On the other hand, if ITC is not claimed, then you can definitely add the GST portion also. Especially when there is any block credit, for example, if the company buys a car, obviously there is no uh, ITC on, G on that car, so that portion can be capitalized. Then subsidy or grant, all subsidies and grants should be subtracted, that is what it means here, as reduced by the cost directly or indirectly by any other person. Third one, so guys, <laughs> if there is anything that is more than 10,000 rupees if you are spending and that too, other than cash, other than cash or even by, what do you say, cross check, which means if you are only using ECS, electronic clearing system or an account payee check. So there's a difference since I was a law trainer, I still am a law trainer. What is the difference between account payee check and, you know, cross check? Both have the crossing, which means both have to be paid to the accounts only, but an account payee check on the other hand, it is to be paid to the respective account of the person to whom it has been drawn up to. Whereas normal cross check can be paid into the account, but this can be negotiated further. So if I give it to a person A, A can give it to B, B to C, C to D, D to E like that negotiation. And finally, the last person can deposit in his bank account, actually withdraw cash and give. So basically you can do indirect cash dealing. So to curb that from happening, very clearly they have told that it should be an account pay check. Account pay check, account pay bank draft because if it's a normal cross check, it can be converted to cash eventually. Even though it has come into the books, it can be converted to cash through other means. So that is not covered here with regard to acquisition of the asset for which payment. So basically, if you spend anything more than 10,000 rupees other than ECS, other than account pay check, other than NEFT, other than IMPS, other than what do you say, Beam, Paytm, UPI, all that. So your even Paytm, your phone pay, all this will come into picture. Other than that means what? If you use normal cross-check, if you use cash, if you pay more than 10,000, if it is a revenue expenditure, my dear friends, it will be disallowed under 40 capital A3. And if it is a capital expenditure, it will be subtracted from actual cost under 43.1. That is the gist of the story. So that's what it says with regard to acquisition of the asset for which payment to a person in a day, a person one day exceeds how much? 10,000. Otherwise than any of these things, then it will come into that picture. So if you see single payment, aggregate payment to a person in a day, if it goes more than 7,000, sorry, 10,000 rupees. So basically if the SSE is a buyer and Bakra seller is there, Bakra seller. So 1 lakh, 10 lakh rupees asset I bought in which 7 lakh I paid check. Let's say it is a account pay check. 10,000 rupees I paid for 20 days, 2 lakh and one day only I paid 5,000 rupees into 20 times. So my dear friends, overall as far as 7 lakh is concerned and 2 lakh is concerned, how much can I capitalize? 10 lakh, 7 lakh, 9 lakh how much? Buyer can capitalize 9 lakh. Why? 7 lakh is paid by check. 2 lakh is paid by what? It is maximum 10,000 for it. You know, I have not exceeded 10,000. So can I take that into account? Yes. So it can be 7 lakh plus 2 lakh, 9 lakh. Remaining 1 lakh, 5,000 into 20 times. Remaining 1 lakh has to be ignored, has to be subtracted from the total cost. If I take 10 lakh, I should subtract 1 lakh. Or I can directly take only 9 lakh. Right, so 500, 5,000 into 20 times, 1 lakh. 5,000 into 20 times, 1 lakh. So basically overall how much guys? 9 lakh.
This is for the buyer you leave. Bakra seller you see guys. For Bakra seller, this will be coming under a section called 269 ST. You have to think from both the points of view. What will come? 269 ST will come. And under 269 ST it says that in case you have taken cash. Cash means other than ECS, other than NFT, other than Bheem, other than um, account pay check. If you have taken more than 2 lakh rupees, either singly like this, more than 2 lakh. You can say, sir, this is less than 2 lakh, so it will not apply. No, it says either 2 lakh at once or as part of a transaction. This entire is a part of transaction. What is the transaction? Selling of a, of a asset. As part of this transaction, if it crosses 2 lakh rupees, in this case, what? 3 lakh rupees. So, under 271DA, the seller has to pay penalty to the tune of the amount. 3 lakh full amount will go deadly. So, you should analyze from buyer point of view, also seller point of view. From buyer point of view, two sections will come. 40A3 and 41, uh, you know, 43 one. that is actual cost. 40 capital A3 if it's an expenditure, revenue expenditure, 43 one if it's a capex. From the seller point of view, Bakra fellow, 269 ST will come and 271 DA will come. Right? This is what I am trying to tell. Done. Then guys, if I purchase one asset at US dollar 80 rupees, where the time of payment of that particular asset, 2-3 months later, I'll have to pay, let's say, I'll pay 50% of that and I'll, and unfortunately it has coming up to that time $1 is 84 rupees. Right, $1 is 84 rupees, INR. So that extra 4 rupees, it's not $80, I meant $1 80 rupees. So if it is 4 rupees extra, then what I should do, that extra 4 rupees, I should keep it in mind. Which means, I have to add the asset by 4 rupees. Correct. Forex fluctuations, that is decrease in the liability in respect of asset acquired from a country outside India, then you see you add increase in liability. If 80 rupees become 84 rupees, 4 rupees should be added to the cost of asset. If 80 rupees, let's say become 78 rupees, 2 rupees will be deducted from the cost of asset. That's why this thing remains the same here. Right, yes. Then expenses incurred towards acquiring the asset like freight, insurance, unloading, loading, everything to be taken into account. Expenses incurred in connection with installation of the asset, technician fee, erection fee, all that should be taken into account. I have to add it to the capital, add it to the asset. This is very interesting. Interest on borrowed capital. So basically, if I have certificate of incorporation is here, certificate of commencement of business comes here. This is where you have incorporated and this is where you have commenced business. Whenever they say business has been set up, it means it is running. Just by incorporation, you cannot say business has been set up. Set up means what? There are various cases for this also. Set up means what? Actually, the operations are going on. <coughs> so, until the operations are going on, that is still the here, CCOB. From beginning till the CCOB, what comes? If I have taken some money here, I have borrowed 1 crore and till here the interest I have to pay is 1 lakh and from here to here interest I have to pay is 50,000 on that asset that I have borrowed, I mean the money that I have borrowed, right? Using this money I will buy the asset here and I will put to use here. For argument's sake, let me say that put to use will happen, let's say, on the commencement of business itself. For argument's sake, it will be easy to understand also. So, on this day only what I will do, put to use. After this, during the year, interest is coming up to 2 lakh. So, the question is, this 2 lakh, should I capitalize or should it be expensed off? So guys, under 36, 1, this has to be taken as an expense. Clearly, it is given. Whereas this one, from the day you borrow till the day it is put to use, it has to be capitalized. Has to be capitalized. After this, this cannot be capitalized. It has to be expense. That is what the section says. 
here interest on borrowed, ca borrowed capital payable up to the date on which asset is first put to use it should be added to the cost of the asset so you have your other expenses the incurring for acquiring the asset so until I'm, as if I am manufacturing the asset also and if I am acquiring the asset whatever it is salary is paid for erection, stock, travelling, vehicle, general expense everything should be forming part of an actual cost if I am setting up a plant so to speak administration and general overhead expense are specifically attributable to a fixed asset etc will be forming part of actual cost whereas general administrative expenses of not a factory where I am setting up the plant but office expenses of your uh, accounting office etc that should not be capitalized and when I am doing some test run let's say I have created a new uh, cola which will now uh, go against Pepsi and uh, thumbs up and all those things for example Shunya is there Shunya is uh, zero aerated it's an aerated drink but it doesn't have all this high sugar etc zero sugar Shunya drink now Shunya drink there will be some test run expenses now test uh, turn expenses in some cases it will be part of uh, uh, you know actual cost and in some cases it will be not forming part of actual cost depending on the facts of the case so to speak. So in actual cost concept there are various uh, what do you say explanations that we need to keep in mind one by one. Explanation 1 to 43 1 asset is used in the business after it ceases to be used for scientific research. So if asset is used for scientific research then very simple guys already I have taken a full deduction in scientific research under section 35 so even if it's a capital expenditure of 10 lakh rupees rather than showing it in the asset I would have taken a full deduction under section 35 which means I would have debited to my p and account 30, uh, 10 lakh rupees but still after that can I avail a deduction again depreciation can I add it to actual cost no if it is used in scientific research and later it is brought into my normal business still I have already taken the full benefit of the same so at what amount should I bring in the asset to the actual cost it should be nil it should be nil that is explanation 1 explanation 1a very simple if I have a stock in trade I told you the other day already in the previous part of the video I have already discussed if there is a building of which two apartments are there it is converted to capital asset I will make it into an office in that case on the date of conversion same FMV of such asset will be taken as the actual cost because this for example if the building value is uh, 2 crore FMV is 4 crore I will have to pay tax on the difference of 4 crore and 2 crore I have to pay tax on it anyway so since I have already paid tax on it this amount can be taken as actual cost and claim depreciation in the near future huh. if the asset is acquired by way of gift or inheritance isn't it met by any other person yes so since it is met by any other person rather than subtracting something for this explanation clearly says if the asset belong to Mr. A he had purchased it at 1 crore and it came down and depreciation after 3-4 years in 2010 he had acquired in 2020 he is giving it to B gifting it at the time of gifting whatever is allowed to him if you consider everything the WDV would be 40 lakhs and is giving it for free to Mr. B. B will record it at what rate? 40 lakhs or 1 crore? Or at random figure you can uh, you know take no. If the previous owner had used the asset for business, if 1 crore was used in business, actual cost is cost to the previous owner minus depreciation actually allowed the previous owner. Let us assume this fellow had used it for personal purpose but this was used in business. A had used it for personal purpose but B is using it for business then what will happen? Then very simple. If the previous owner had used the asset for personal purpose actual cost is cost to the previous owner that's all. What is the cost to the previous owner? 
one crore. So it depends on whether you actually used it or not used it. That is this part of the story. Interest portion we had seen. Explanation 1A we just saw. Actual cost 10 crore resume. But if I bringing it into business, the difference will be taxable and all those things. So guys, if the donor, for him it's a part of the block and the donee it's part of the block, explanation 2 will apply. For the donor it's not part of the block, but for donee it is part of the block, explanation 2 will apply. With explanation 2 says it will be the actual cost. When will no depreciation effect come? When for the donor it was part of the block, but for the donee it is not at all part of the block, he is using it for personal purposes. Donor had a car which he had used for business. He gave it to me. I am using it for personal purposes. Will the block concept come? No. Will explanation, when block only doesn't come, will this explanation come? No. Very, very simple. One important thing is when the donor WDB was one lakh ninety six eight thirty gift, he gifted it to Doni at one lakh ninety six eight thirty. Assume, right? For the Doni, should add one lakh ninety six eight thirty to the actual cost that we know. That is what explanation two says. But for the donor. He has just gifted the asset. What will be the money is payable? Money is payable will be zero. Means has he received any money? No. Legally, no. If you read the Bayer Act, there also it says no. But ICAI believes that since he has given the asset worth 1 lakh 96 by, uh, 830, that has to be reduced from the block. With whose block? Donor's block. Keep that in mind, my dear friends. So ICAI says subtract 1 lakh 96 830 from the donor. And add 1 lakh 96 to the doni. 1 lakh 96 to the doni should be added in explanation 2. And in explanation, I mean, sorry, in uh, as far as the uh, donor is concerned, 1 lakh 96 should be subtracted. Hope you got this point, my dear friends. All right, buddies, moving on after this point. Yes. Next, we will do the actual cost and uh, what do you say? The explanation with respect to actual cost that is 43.1 is what we'll have to check now, right? So let's go back. All the explanations to 43.1 we need to see. So as discussed in the uh, last segment, 43.1 is nothing but the actual cost in that uh, whatever is the actual cost of the purchase of the asset minus if it is used by I mean, if it is given by somebody else, all the money amount given by somebody else should be taken into account. We saw the entire thing of actual cost, which has been met directly or indirectly should be subtracted. And moving on, apart from that, we saw explanation 1, uh, 1A, that is FMV, we saw 2. Yeah, now we have to see explanation 3. So what does explanation 3 uh, say? Very simple. So if... I have taken an asset at an enhanced cost. For example, there is one guy, Motabai, another by Chotabai. So, Chotabai, what does he do? An asset which has a WDB of 60 crore and an FMB of 80 crore. He sells it to Chotabai at 95 crore. So, what WDB is 60, FMB is 80, sells it at 95 crore to Motabai. So, Motabai records it at 95 crore. Why did why is he a fool to take it at 95 crore? No, very simple. FMB is 80, recorded it and bought it at 95, gave a check of 95 crore. Very, very simple, guys. That is conversion of black money to white money. No fool will purchase any asset worth 80 crore at 95 crore. So what is Motabai doing? He is overshooting the asset, overvaluing the asset, taking it at 95 crore, giving a check worth uh, 95 crore and Chotabai has black money so he will give 15 crore back to Motabai. Motabai needs black money as simple as that. It's always black money 
white money dealing is always one person will be in need of black money and the other person will have excess black money. So Chota Bai, whatever black money he has, he has shifted to Mota Bai and Mota Bai has given the check of 95 crore and now double benefit for him, he is recording it at what rate? He is recording it at 95 crore and claiming exemption, I am claiming sorry, uh, depreciation on that, imagine. So on an enhanced cost of 95 crore, now this obviously a lot of things were happening like that because of which explanation 3 was added saying that boss if you do all these nonsense things first of all under 270 capital A 200% will be the penalty apart from that my dear friends here asset acquired from any other person which was previously used for his business or profession with a view to claim depreciation on enhanced cost and reduced tax liability so in this case what they have told the assessing officer with the prior approval of the joint commissioner will be determining the actual cost. So the assessing officer of Motabai Limited will say, bro, it is not 95 crore, it is only 80 crore. That is your FMB. You have overshot it. I am not going to allow. That is uh, explanation 3, my dear friends. Explanation 4 is uh, interesting. So what happens is in explanation 4, Motabai has an asset worth 5 lakh, sells it to Chotabai at 5.5 lakh, Chotabai sells it to KDY at 6 lakh, KD buy to Rocky buy at 7 lakh, 7 lakh Rocky buy will give a gift or whatever it is to QT buy at 7.5 lakh and QT buy sells it back to Mota buy at 5 lakh, brilliant. He had an asset of 5 lakh and is getting back the asset at 8 lakh, he is recording it at 8 lakh. This is not this explanation 3, why because in explanation 3 he never owned the asset, he just bought another asset, here it is reacquired by him. This sort of reacquisition etc will not be allowed. So what does the law say? Very simple. What amount you bought for? 8 lakh or this 5 lakh that you sold it for or whatever value you had minus the depreciation that is allowed on it. Original cost minus depreciation or whatever you reacquired. 8 lakh whichever is less. Whichever is less is what they say. So if you see Original asset transferred by the SSE motor buy and reacquired by him motor buy. Actual cost shall be original cost less depreciation allowable to him, assuming that is the only asset in the relevant block, right? Only that one asset to sit single out and calculate the WDB as on that day, as on the day of the transfer or the day of the reacquiring, whichever, whatever price he reacquired for, whichever is less. Price paid for reacquiring, whichever is less. Very, very clearly given, whichever is less. In previous year 2021, Mojo Limited sells an asset whose WDB was 2 lakh to Devil Limited at of a selling price of 5 lakh rupees. Mr. Devil sells his asset to Fuzzy Limited at 7 lakh. Mojo reacquires at 7 lakh rupees. Actual cost will be the WDB at the time of original transfer. How much? 2 lakh rupees. Or you can say original actual cost less depreciation. In this example, he sold it for 5 lakh but assume the uh, WDB was around 4 lakh. The original cost minus depreciation was 4 lakh. So 4 lakh or 8 lakh, whichever is less. How much? 4 lakh should be taken into account. If this was 2 lakh, 4 lakh or 2 lakh, whichever is less, 2 lakh. That is what we should think of. That is explanation 4. Explanation 4. <laughs> One more example. So basically, I am a company which is producing, uh, which is which is a factory, runs a factory and during those days, the pollution control equipment had 100% depreciation. So this company bought a pollution control equipment, claimed 100% depreciation, let's say I bought it for 5 crore, claimed full 5 crore depreciation and the WDV became 0. Then what happened, this asset was bought, WDV, this asset was bought by Motabai. He acquired this asset as let's say 4 crore rupees. He acquired it at 4 crore rupees. The best part is he leased it to this company again. Under Income Tax Act, the lessor only can claim depreciation. So he will claim depreciation on 4 CR. Right? Something where other party has already claimed full benefit 
because it is transferred to somebody else he is claiming full benefit again on 4 crore and he is claiming depreciation because the lessor only can claim depreciation for the factory is a win win situation for the factory it is getting the asset back at 4 cr and whatever was at zero it sold it at 4 crore so 4 crore will be the short term capital gain and this business was undergoing lot of losses so this capital gain will be set off against the loss so first of all the gain will be set off against loss also and second of all i am getting to use the asset again plus for motor buy also it's a win situation because for cr my dear friends to curb this from happening explanation 4a is there explanation 4a says bro bro cheating 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 nothing allowed what is allowed just zero it will be taken as nil it will be taken as nil so if you see basically nil in this example nil wdv actual cost of the sse motor buy will be the wdv of the seller factory zero that is what it is Explanation 5, if a building is used for private purpose, subsequently brought into business use. Mind you guys, first of all, it should be a building, not any other asset. Second, it should have been used for private purpose and now it is brought into the business use. That's what they are trying to tell. So, again I repeat, building, private purpose and subsequently it is brought into the business. So, if it is any other asset, this will not come. And uh, if it is used for business before, it will not come. And it is used for personal now, it will not come. It should have been a, it must be a building, should have been used for private and now brought into business. So here, the cost of purchase or construction of the building as reduced by the notional depreciation. Why notional depreciation? Because it was used for personal purpose that time. At the rate in force on that date, which date guys? On the day it is brought into business. So, even though the building was, let us say, 10 year old and that 10, year ago, 10 years ago, the rate was 20 percent, but the day I am bringing into business, that is yesterday, the rate is 10 percent for building. What should I take? 10 percent or 20 percent? 10 percent at the rate in force on that date, up to the year of bringing the asset to business. Correct? So, Anuj purchased a building for 20 lakh rupees uh, on 25th December, on 17th September, he brought this building into business. In this case, actual purchase price of the building will be reduced by the notional depreciation charge on the building for the period, this period. <clears throat> actual cost will determine the manner only when the building is brought into business. If any such, this is the best part. If any other asset is brought into business subsequently, for example, I have uh, a car which was used for private purpose. It is brought into business. I bought it at 1 crore, now actual value if you think about it, car depreciates quickly, actual value of just around some 10 lakh rupees. But still guys, you see, actual cost will be the original cost at which such asset was acquired. So when I am bringing the car into business, I can record it at the actual price of 1 CR. So this can be a tax planning tool for sure. This is explanation 5. In the same breath, let us see explanation 11 and come back to the other explanations. Explanation 11. Asset brought into India by a non-resident SSE for his business or profession. So, this fellow was a non-resident, right? He has a business there and now he brings one asset into India. Let's say computers. He has computers abroad. He, the computers are fully depreciated and almost gone. But still, he brings into his new business in India. SSE is the same. He had, old, he had one business. He opens a new branch in India and he brings his business here in India. Now... Purchase price as reduced by the amount of depreciation notionally calculated at the rate in force. As if the asset was used in India since the day of acquisition. So, rate in force means what guys? As and when the rates keep changing, same rates have to do. So, for example, if 5 years ago, uh, I had bought laptop abroad and that, that time computers, it was let's say, I am just giving an example, 30%. Next year it became 40%, next year it became 20%, next year again it became 
so i have to compute as if the uh, asset was bought four years ago every year whatever depreciation rate is there i have to reduce that is the meaning of rate in force i have to uh, depreciate and whatever wdb comes now that value only i should take is what they are trying to tell mr david a non resident purchased a machine for 20 lakh on 25th december on 17th september he brought this machine into business after 5 years in this case actual purchase price of the machine will be reduced by the depreciation charged on the machine for the period 25th december 17 to 17 september 22 using the rates in force in india <coughs> using the rates in force in india so like that i should uh, do it so 5 and uh, 12 why i did is in explanation 11 it's about non resident in explanation 5 it is about resident or non resident in explanation 11 mind you it is any asset in explanation 5 it is only building which is used for private purposes in explanation 11 it could be used for any purpose in explanation 5 private purpose bringing it into business in both the cases of course at the rate in force explanation 5 is depreciation rate on that date the date when you are bringing into business that is explanation 11 will be the rate in force that is the respective rates as per the assessment year is what i want to tell you this is what it is guys that is explanation 5 and explanation 11 okay then as far as 6 7 7a and all these things are concerned whether it is an amalgamating company asset transfer to amalgamated company whether it's a holding company transfer to wholly owned subsidiary or either other way around basically holding company transferring it to a wholly owned subsidiary uh, provided the wholly owned subsidiary is in india for example if um, uh, for instance my what do you say An, an Indian company and hundred percent only one subsidiary outside India. For example, if Reliance transfers some of its assets, or other, you know, subsidiary company is transferring to hundred percent holding company, correct? So there are. So if you see, shares of the subsidiary company should be wholly owned by the holding company. Very clearly, they have given. And here again, asset transferred by a holding company to its subsidiary company, or by a subsidiary company to its holding company. So Hamleys US uh, UK. Hamleys UK, which is a hundred percent subsidiary of Reliance, transfers its assets to Reliance Industries India. Is Reliance Industries a holding company? Yes. Is it a hundred percent holding company? Yes. So, at what rate will they take it into account? Actual cost for the transferee company, transferer company is Hamleys, transferee company is Reliance. At what rate will they record? Actual cost for the transferee company will be WDB of the transferer company. Which WDB? Whatever WDB they have recorded at Hamleys, same rate they will take it here also. Explanation six, explanation seven, explanation seven A, and all these things. Same. Even in a demerger, the WDB of the immediately preceding year. Shall be reduced by the return down value of the assets transferred to the resulting company for the demerged company. Demerger means what, guys? If there is a company which hypes off, hypes off. So, for example, Wipro Lights Limited can hype off from entire Wipro Limited. Wipro Software can hype off from Wipro Limited. Geo, there was a demerger and it split into three companies. So, the final company is called as resulting company. The company which was there. Existing before also is called demerged company. So, Wipro, one part of Wipro, Wipro software is hived off. So, what will be the asset value WDB of the asset? I told you depreciation and WDB is always considered SSE wise. SSE is Wipro. So, for Wipro, they will take the full block minus the block all the assets which have been removed from Wipro. That's what they say. If you see. Demerged company WDB of the block of assets in the immediately preceding year shall be reduced by the WDB of the assets transferred to the resulting company. But for the resulting company, uh, that is for Wipro Software, what will be the uh, actual cost for the resulting company Wipro Software WDB of the demerged company? Very simple. So whatever WDB you should calculate from that, I will take it and record it at actual cost. And from the demerged company. Whatever the entire asset is, their value take the entire asset value. In that part of it will be hived off. 
so overall asset value is 100 crore and 20 crore worth of asset is hived off so for the actual cost of the or rather the wdv for the demerged company will be 100 minus 20 80 whereas for the new company resulting company what will be the wdv 20 that's all very simple guys from there it is split and come here it's coming here no change same with amalgamating company amalgamated company everything it's the same no change all these things are the same so if you see regarding that where did this go suddenly right because section under section 47 subsidiary company transferring asset to holding company is not an asset and uh, not a transfer sorry holding company transferring to 100 percent subsidiary is not a transfer under section 47 similar to demerger all those things etc so ultimately the transferor company the transferor company and transferee company for both they have explanation 6 and explanation 2 explanation 6 to 43 1 which we have seen and explanation 2 to 43 6 so 43 6 is the wdv so what they are trying to tell is from the wdv of the demerged uh, company you should subtract that part of WDV which is hived off is what they are ultimately trying to tell. An actual cost of transfer or company will be the same actual cost. Basically, at the WDV is what they are trying to tell. Then, explanation 8 we have already discussed. If I have acquired some funds, borrowed funds, actual cost will be the purchase price of the asset. I have taken a loan and then bought an asset. The actual cost of the asset is the purchase price of the asset plus interest on the loan borrowed till the asset is put to use interest on loan borrowed till the asset is put to use so till the asset is put to use whichever date it is purchase price plus interest on loan borrowed till the asset is put to use this is for what asset acquired out of borrowed funds purchase price plus the interest on loan borrowed till the date asset is put to use because after put to use it will be expense under 36.1 till put to use it must be capitalized similarly asset acquired subject to levy of excess duty etc where if senvat credit is availed already senvat credit shall not form part of the actual cost we have already discussed in the previous segment these are all the explanations my dear friends And under 35 AD, your specified businesses, it is already allowed, the expenditure is already allowed, debited to PNL account, then it will not be forming part of the actual cost. Means if I buy an asset, I can take a full 100% reduction under 35 AD. If I have already debited the full amount to PNL account, and then that asset is later brought into business, how can I take double deduction? I have already taken 100% in the PNL account. I cannot take a double deduction. So, all these things are covered here and if you see, essentially in act, actual cost here, add all the expenses, subtract all these things. One more part is again I am telling you, as reduced by that portion of the cost which has been met directly or indirectly by any other person, this will also as I mentioned is subsidy. Government subsidy, government grant, it's the same. That also has to be subtracted and that only will be my actual cost. All these portions are done. All this we will do in shortly. As far as subsidy is concerned, as I told you, subsidy also is a different thing. I have made a master chart for subsidy. Quickly we will revise that. So guys, subsidy is defined in 2 clause 24, clause number 8. So sub, it can be named whatever name you can give it, subsidy, grant, cash incentive, duty drawback, waiver, concession, reimbursement, etc. It excludes explanation 10 to 43.1. Explanation 10 to 43.1, what does it say? Any subsidy, etc. will not be part of actual cost. Very simple. 
because it should be subtracted from the actual cost because that is borne by the government or some other authority. So, uh, as far as so, subsidy can be given for depreciable asset. Subsidy can be given for non-depreciable asset. For example, land. So, if you want to buy land, government can give you subsidy for that also. It is non-depreciable. What's the treatment? And if it is depreciable, what's the treatment, guys? Please understand income tax act cannot be read section by section at the final level. It should be read concept by concept. We understood the depreciation concept fully. We understood the actual cost concept fully. In that actual cost concept, one small subsidy portion is there. Now I am taking up the subsidy portion. I will link it with ICDS 7. Like this you study, I can also assure you and I can also see how you will not get 60 plus. Questions are not easy anymore like the way it used to be before. So you should constantly keep revising. There are many, many new things that are happening. You can always not go with a single set track mind that, you know, it is all easy and all that. You have to keep on revising. So, 2 clause 24, 18, right, depreciable. Subsidy is identifiable against the asset. So, subsidy is not identifiable against the asset. Subsidy is identifiable against the asset. In that case, guys, depreciable asset, then explanation 10 to 43.1. Cost of the asset, less subsidy will be my actual cost. Very simple. 20 crore, I bought an asset. 3 crore is subsidy. 20 crore minus 3 crore, 17 crore will be the actual cost. What if it is not identifiable with respect to given to a asset? For example, the government has given subsidy for everything put together. I have bought some 5 machinery. For 5 missionary put together, they have given me subsidy. For example, I have 4 assets, 10 lakh, 20 lakh, 30 lakh, 40 lakh. So, overall 100 lakh, they have given 10% subsidy. Overall 10 lakh subsidy. How should I reduce now? Each of is in a different block. This is missionary, this is plant, this is something else, this is building. How do I subtract? So, in that same ratio, 1 is to 2 is to 3 is to 4. Very simple. So, from P1, I will reduce 1. From P2, I will reduce 2. From P3, I will reduce 3. And from P4, I will reduce 4. I will keep on reducing. Non-depreciable asset. If subsidy is given towards a non-depreciable asset, that entire thing is PGVP income. Because income as per section 28 also includes subsidy. So, if I receive something on land, my dear friends, that entire subsidy will be taxed under PGBP as a benefit. Any other subsidy also PGBP. Very, very simple. So, if land 8 crore, building 2 crore and I will get 10 crore, overall I will get 25% subsidy for land and building. I should only take 25% of 8 crore is not at all covered. Correct? 25% of 8 crore, that is 2 crore is not deducted, but it is PGBP income. 25% of 2 crore will be deducted from the actual cost, is what they say. And what does the ICDS say about it? Depreciable asset, SSE repays the subsidy, then repayment amount will be added to the block of asset. Now you subtract it, later when I repay that subsidy, let's say subsidy has been given only for 2 years, like a loan they have given, where you have to repay the subsidy. And since I have repaid the subsidy, definitely it can be added to the block with a depreciable asset in the year of refund, in the year of refund. And if non-depreciable asset you have added, you have refunded, for example, for land I received subsidy 2 crore. Tomorrow, I have repaid that subsidy to crore. That in the year, I will allow expense. Why will I allow expense? Because subsidy income has already been taken. Is this in the Bayer Act? Actually, no, it is in ICDS. Right? ICDS is very much part of the Act anyway. Guys, I again repeat, let's not go section by section. Let's go concept by concept. Okay? Come on. Fist bump. All of you, all of you, all of you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Very good. Shall we go ahead, my dear buddies? Right. So, what about waiver of loan? Waiver of loan also, there is a, a high court decision in the SAI industry case law. If government gives a loan and you buy an asset with respect to the loan, tomorrow government has, what do you say, waived off that loan. They'll say no problem, leave it. So, it is reduced by government waiver, correct? Government has given a loan and from that loan you bought an asset worth 10 crore. Government waives 9 crore. Oh, sorry, government waives, let's say 1 crore they will waive. So, will you take it as 9 crore is the question? Answer is yes. It is reduced by that part met by any other person. Who is that any other person? Government. So, definitely it should be reduced from the actual cost, my dear buddies. So, as far as 
what do you say partnership firm if it is converted to company then explanation 3 to 43 one will come sole proprietorship converted to company then again explanation 3 to 43 one will come whatever was the previous owner the same will be now with the hands of the company and even under section 47 it is exempt on the other hand if private company or unlisted company is converting itself to llp then as per section 47 it is not a transfer but as per 2c to 43.6 there is a different provision that is explanation 2c to 43.6 then what you should take you will see later when we discuss the llp portion As far as actual cost is concerned with respect to amalgamation, demerger, conversion, etc. As far as amalgamation, demerger, even for conversion, whatever it is, we have explanation 7 to 43.1, explanation 7a to 43.1, same thing as already discussed. The WDV of the amalgamating company will be the WDV of the amalgamated company. And the actual cost for the amalgamated company will be whatever the WDP of the amalgamating company. Actual cost of asset for the resulting company will be the WDP of the demerged company. Same stuff. And then the depreciation on, no depreciation is there on goodwill and hence no apportionment. But with respect to other assets, it will be in the ratio of the number of assets used by them. So in the compiler and all, in my compiler, I have given all the illustrations, etc. Yes. And as far as predecessor and successor income, how will I charge up to the date of succession predecessor and after the date of succession, successor will do the needful. One part was pending that is depreciation on goodwill. That's a different concept. I told you that that has to be removed from the, the goodwill portion must be removed. The depreciation should be removed. Basically, if goodwill is an intangible asset. I should take as if goodwill was the only asset in the entire block, remove all the other components and for that goodwill remove depreciation and that has to be completely removed from Finance Act 21 onwards. From 1421 everything has to be removed because the block excludes goodwill. As per 211B block exclu excludes goodwill and 3212 there is no depreciation on goodwill and as per 436 in the calculation Clearly, they have mentioned depreciation on goodwill. Depreciation on goodwill. And once I sell off the goodwill, if it is more than the WDV, then of course, same. That other part will be my short-term capital gain. All that, that is what we have seen. One thing, we have to keep in mind that Will capital gain come or not is the question. So, for instance, there is intangible block 20 crore. I have sold it for 18 crore. Unfortunately, only one asset was there in the block and that was goodwill and that is sold for or rather transferred out for 18 crore. What is the amount left here? 2 crore. But guys, what is the asset left? 0. What is the treatment in that case where there is there are no assets in the block but there is some value? Can depreciation be claimed on this? Answer is no. Yesterday only we have told for depreciation to be claimed on anything, there has to be block, which means at least one asset must be there and some value. Both conditions must be there. In this case, asset is not there, value is there, nothing can be done. So this, my dear friends, can be asked. So this is what a dead loss for which there is absolutely no treatment. Dead loss for which there is absolutely no treatment. So, we will take an example just for you to make, understand. WDV of the block has on 1-4-2020, case 1, 1 crore 10 lakh. Goodwill purchased on 1-1-2018, 80 lakh. So, guys, this was the original cause of the goodwill. Today, I need to remove this, this minus depreciation I have to remove as if that was the only asset in the block. Similarly, 
here 31 lakh was the wdb of the block and then goodwill purchased as on 11 2018 was 80 lakh how do you compute it here computation of depreciation on goodwill as if it was the only asset in the block part c of the chart this year only acquisition 80 lakh minus depreciation 1819 10 lakh 1920, 17 lakh 50,000, 2021, 13 lakh 15,000, overall 39 lakh 37,500. But I now have to remove what? Goodwill portion. I have to, this is the, when did I buy? This is the goodwill portion only. See, goodwill purchased on 11 2018. What is the WDV of the goodwill as of today? As of which day? 1422. So I have done the depreciation, acquisition 80 lakh. When is depreciation 18, 19, 12 and a half percent? Why 12 and a half percent? Because it was bought on 1, 1, 2018. Hence 50 percent, less than 180 days. So 80 lakh minus 10 lakh, then in 17 lakh, 25 percent, 52 lakh, 50,000, 25 percent. What I get is 30, 39 lakh, 37,500. So from the WDV of the entire block, 1.1 CR, I am going to reduce what? 39, 37, 500, whatever is remaining is 70, 62, 500. From that, I will remove what? 25%, 25%. And this will be, this is what I am going to record. 39,72,488. On the other hand, if same thing in the other case, WDV as on the block is 31 lakh. Goodwill purchased is 80 lakh. 80 lakh ka figure will come up to 39 lakh 37 500. You see, this is what I was trying to tell. Block of asset is 31 lakh. And what is the value? 39, 37, 500. So in that block, other assets all put together is 31 lakh, of which goodwill only is 39, 37, 500. It is always restricted to the goodwill value so what is the wdv nil 31 lakh minus 39 lakh 37 500 nil the differential amount my dear friends will be the short term capital gain 39 lakh 37 500 minus 31 lakh will be 8 lakh 37 500 will be my stcg so let us assume i am the purchaser of that goodwill how much did i buy 39 lakh 37500 i am the purchaser you have sold for you, the seller, what will you show your WDV as? Zero. And for you, what is the STCG? 8,37,500. Now for me, I am the purchaser of that goodwill. What will be my cost of acquisition? Whatever your selling price will be my cost of acquisition. So my cost of acquisition will be 39,37,500. And what would be my period of holding? My period of holding would be what? From 1-1-2018 itself. My period of holding will be from 1-1-2018. This is when, if at all you are selling the goodwill. If at all you are selling the goodwill, it will be from 1-1-2018. More we will discuss in, uh, you know, what do you say, capital gain, don't worry about it. Next guys, next concept will be 43A, 43A, 43A is your foreign exchange fluctuations. Again in the actual cost we saw one thing, add foreign ex exchange fluctuations minus foreign exchange fluctuation. Add foreign exchange fluctuation minus foreign exchange fluctuation, that is what I am doing, add and minus foreign exchange fluctuations. So 43A was something which was changed a lot by Sri Arun Jaitli ji. This is the adjustment with respect to the forex whereby if you buy an asset for uh, $1 80 rupees later it becomes 84 rupees at the time of payment. The loan you borrowed or the asset you borrowed, asset you bought on a credit basis whatever the, either you buy or take a loan or you take it on credit either way right. You see applicability as per the uh, you know if you read the wordings of the Bayer Act, asset acquired outside India by foreign currency loan, 43A will come. Asset acquired outside India by taking a Indian currency loan, later INR loan is converted to foreign currency loan, 43A will come. What are the types? I told you two things. One, 
you either take a loan and buy an asset or you buy an asset only on credit basis from a foreigner. So, when is what? Cost of asset, supplier's credit is called, that is buying the asset on supplier's credit. Second one is repayment of foreign currency loan plus interest thereon, that is asset brought in for business or profession. But there was one more thing where asset is acquired in India by taking a foreign currency loan. All these things are what? Asset acquired outside India, asset acquired outside India. But what about asset acquired in India but by taking a foreign currency loan? This is what Arun Jaitley inserted. That is also covered under 43AA. So ultimately everything is covered. Asset acquired outside India from a foreign currency loan. Asset acquired outside India by an Indian currency loan, later converted to foreign currency. Asset acquired in India by a taking a foreign currency loan. Type, as I told you, supplier's credit and repayment of foreign currency loan plus interest thereon. Treatment only at the time of payment. Guys, as per the Indies and as per AS11, it used to be what? It, should, it used to be on the balance sheet date. But now nothing doing as far as tax is concerned. As and when the payment is happening, that time you should do the adjustments. Very simple. And what would be the adjustments? <clears throat> For a depreciable asset, actual cost, you will play around in the actual cost only. But at actual cost means what? Actual cost plus asset if it is increasing the liability and reduce it if it is decreasing the liability. So, every time at the time of payment, you need to keep on doing it. And what do you mean by actual cost? Is it the actual cost that's originally bought? No. It is actual cost minus depreciation. So, basically, if after actual cost was 10 lakh and depreciation is 2 lakh on 8 lakh. For example, now 8 lakh because of the foreign currency fluctuation, if it has become 8.5 lakh, I should now add 50,000 to that. So, when should I see? As and when the payment comes. At the time of the payment, you should check the actual cost minus depreciation. That was held in Arvind Mill's Supreme Court judgment. Guys, I cannot explain the logic of each and everything because it's a marathon session. This entire 43 itself in my regular batch, I have taken almost 3 plus hours. So, in regular batch, you will in, in uh, fast track premium around 1, 1 and a half hours. So, in those cl you know classes, we can go in depth, slow and everything. But here, I am just doing the gist of the thing. These charts and all I have prepared only for this marathon. And if it's a special asset like scientific research expenditure, guys, I have purchased it for 80 lakh. I have repaid it also for 82 lakh. So now I have already taken deduction of 80 lakh. Now next year it has become 82 lakh. So 2 lakh rupees. Can I take a reduction in my PNL account? Yes. Why? Because scientific research expenditure, even if it's a capital expenditure, full amount is debited to PNL account. Sir, what about non depreciable asset? Non depreciable asset like gold, etc. Cost of acquisition, cost of the gold, if it is 1 lakh, it is uh, 1 lakh dollar at 90 rupees. Loan is repaid in the year 2022, 1 lakh at 100 rupees. That extra 10 rupees here, it will be just, I will make the cost of the gold 1 crore, as simple as that. So, I will increase the cost of the non-depreciable asset. Apart from that, if I have taken a forward rate cover, my dear friends, for example, I have bought the loan at 80 rupees per dollar. But I have taken a forward rate cover to uh, hedge myself against future, uh, what do you say, you know, variations in the stock market, uh, you know, so variations in the currency, currency fluctuations, forex fluctuations, right. Uh, so, it cover has become 85 rupees, 85 rupees cover I have taken. Now, the thing is, if it has come down to 82 rupees, now I have already recorded as 85, so 85 minus 82, I will have to adjust, if it has gone to 90 rupees, the 90 minus 85, all these things will come into my PGBP as profit or loss. But in my actual cost, what I should take? I should always record it at 85 rupees agreed cover rate. So if it is actual cost, in actual cost, I should always record at agreed cover rate. The balance variations, it will not touch my actual cost. The variations will be PGBP, PNL account. Then to get that forward rate every year to keep on fixing the rate, I'll have to pay a renewal premium and that is called rollover charges as per Elecon engineering case that is added to the WDV. So any rollover premium that I'm paying will be added to the WDV. If there is an interest on a foreign currency loan, let's say I've taken a 1 lakh dollar at 10% loan I've taken, asset is purchased on 1122 at 70 rupees, 
put to use on 1722 at 72 rupees interest as on 31st march 23 interest is not paid interest has not been paid as on 31st march 23 80 rupees now so the, because the asset is put to use when on 1722 up to the date of put to use my dear friends 43 capital a payment basis i should do which means 1 lakh into 10% is $10000 but since i have put to use only on 1722 and interest portion is not paid on 31st march 23 so in this case since it is 10% and when is it put to use 1722 right what i should do so 1 lakh into 10% is 10000 but i have to see only 6 months so that's why $5000 $5000 into at what rate till the date it is put to use i am going to capitalize right 5000 into 72 so remaining after it is put to use icds accrual basis i have to recognize the pnl account same 1 lakh for 6 months 1 lakh into 10% into 6 by 12 So five thousand dollars into eighty rupees is what I need to see. As far as forty three double A is concerned, as I was mentioning, forty three double A is what if I have taken any foreign currency, I mean bought the asset in India only from a foreign currency loan. Apart from that, other things, monetary and non-monetary items are also there. Monetary items are cash, receivables, payables, etc. Non-monetary items are fixed assets, inventory, investment, and all of the things. So if it is cash, receivable, payable, etc., how will you recognize? You will recognize at the rate as on the date of the transaction itself. And how will you convert at the balance sheet rate? You will convert it at the rate as the closing date. However, whatever rate it was on 31st March, I will take that difference will be my P&L account. On the other hand, if there was inventory, non-monetary items, fixed assets, inventory, investment, if it is there. then how will you record it date of the transaction and how will i uh, record it on conversion and the balance sheet rate so guys since it is inventory it is cost or nrv whichever is lesser as on the date of the balance sheet other non monetary items other non monetary items i will how will i take it uh, rate at the date of transaction i will take conversion there is absolutely no conversion for other non monetary items the difference will be ignored if recognized in the accounts it will be disallowed by the assessing officer this also is an important point for other non monetary items as per icds my dear friends it's all as per icds i am doing so along with the classes along with these marathon sessions also i am covering icds so conversion there is absolutely no conversion for other non monetary items fixed assets inventory investment etc now fixed asset portion that is asset portion already discussed inventory is this other investments etc how will i inventory is this side other investments how will i take there is no concept of conversion and only at the initial date i will and the date of the transaction i will close it this is what they are trying to tell next let us go into 35d amortization of certain preliminary expenses 35d so indian companies are all important areas i am doing guys so this till generally if there is any uh, preliminary expenses of any company from the date of certificate of incorporation whatever expenses happen after that day that obviously will be treated in the hands of the company but the question is what happens here what happens to expenses and what happens to income income generated till the date of certificate of incorporation will not be chargeable in the hands of the company because company is not born only as per indian contract act agreement with somebody who is not in existence is void ab initio so you cannot enter into contract only with them so all the income till the date of the certificate of incorporation will be taxable in the hands of a association of person will be taxable in the hands of a asso association of person 
income will be taxable in the hands of a AOP, right? Who's AOP promoter? Expenses, what I'll do? Expenses, my dear friends, will not be allowed. Generally, I told you in the first method of accounting and the first uh, calculation of income under section 29 only, pre-incorporation expenses will not be allowed as per Income Tax Act except as provided in the law. And that provided in the law is, my dear friends, 35D. In 35D, there are qualifying expenses and there is qualifying amount of expenditure or a fraction of expenditure. What is qualifying for reduction under this section? All expenses before commencement of new business is taken into account. All expenses after commencement of new business also is taken into account. Before commencement of new business, after commencement. Sir, but you just told after commencement everything is P&L. No, you see here. If there is any setting up of a new unit or extension of an existing undertaking, I am setting up new divisions of business. I am ITC, I have many tobacco division, then food division, I have FMCG division. If I am setting up one more division, one more unit, one more new business, new line of business, yes, that will amount to setting up of new business. It will be treated as preliminary expenses for that. Sir, what's the difference between preliminary expense and pre-incorporation expense? Earlier in company law, there used to be two things. One is certificate of incorporation. One more is certificate of commencement of business, which used to come after COI. So, anything that happened till that CCOB, certificate of commencement of business, that used to be what? Preliminary expenses. What is pre-incorporation expenses? Till the incorporation. Now, both have merged. Preliminary expenses means certificate of incorporation and commencement, both. Just before that, whatever happens, it is called preliminary expenses. What are the type of expenditures included, my dear friends? You have legal charges, cost of preparation of feasibility report, project report. All those things are there. Survey engineering report, registration fee paid for incorporation under the Companies Act. So, all your incorporation fee will be taken into account. Fee paid to chartered accountant also will be taken into account. Will it be? Yes, because you see, preparation of MOA, AOA, everything will come here. There are other things. Such other expenditure will have preparation of MOA, AOA and all those things. So yes, all those expenses will be taken into account. But if, let's say, chartered accountant or company secretary, when he's preparing your MOA, makes a mistake with respect to the stamp duty, and later, because of that, you have to file some penal charges with the department, will that be taken into account? No. All the essential elements which are required for incorporation, like these things, that has to be taken into account. What is the ceiling prescribed for, and this is available for all SSEs, mind you. For company SSE, 5% of the cost of project or 5% of capital employed, whichever is higher, or the preliminary expenses, whichever is less you should take. Part number one is what? 5% of the cost of the project or 5% of the capital employed, whichever is higher. Second entire part is preliminary expenses. So, this is one or two, whichever is less. And as far as others are concerned, you have preliminary expenses or 5% of the project, whichever is less. Preliminary expenses or 5% of the project, whichever is less. And deduction is allowed in five equal installments from the year of commencement of business. From the year of commencement of business. Got it? So, this you need to remember. Sir, what is cost of the project? What is capital employed? Capital employed means the aggregate of share capital, debenture, long-term borrowing. Mind you, security premium account is not covered, will never be covered. Security premium account is not share capital. It is just quasi-capital. Cost of the project means actual cost of fixed assets which are shown in the books of asset SEC on the last day of the relevant previous year. Land, building, leasehold, plant, machinery, furniture, fitting and all this will be my cost of the project. That is cost of the project. Capital employed is share capital, debentures, long term borrowing. Share capital, debenture, long term borrowing, you can say your long term funds can be taken into consideration. And no deduction is available for amalgamating or demerged company because that is no longer existing, especially the amalgamating company. Demerged company will still be there, but it is entitled for the new company. Yes, they can take. 
the amalgamated company or the resulting company can definitely take up the balance portion which is remaining. Audit of the accounts is mandatory in this particular clause. You have to do the audit for sure. And as I told you already, in Berger Paints Limited, for the purpose of capital employed, security premium account shall not be considered. Same case with respect to amalgamation or demerger. Then 35 DDA is amortization of VRS expenses. My dear friends, as far as VRS is concerned, you have 10 10 C. Where, where as per the Bayer Act they have given five, up to 5 lakh there is exemption or there is a relief you can claim under section 89.1. So, employee can claim either 1010C or can claim 89.1. Company when they are uh, what do you say giving their spending money on VRS they can take a deduction of same over the next 5 years in form uh, in section number 35 DDA. Section number 35 DDA. So, in section 35 D, there is a very interesting thing called here expenses incurred in respect to public issue of shares and debentures. Now, what do you mean by this share issue expenditure? Before commencement of business, 35 D, one fifth of the same is allowed if you issue shares. After commencement of business, again, if it is for new undertaking or extension of business, 35D, 150 is allowed. If I have taken a, what do you say, working capital, or working capital I have taken, then my dear friends, 35D will not come. Correct? Anything with respect to working capital, it will not come. So, share issue expenses are this, and I am taking or talking about any loan, interest paid on working capital, and all that is not there. Then, extension of authorized capital, ROC fee paid, not allowed. It is only allowed for what? Initially, for putting, you know, paying the stamp duty for creation of MOA, AOA and creation of authorized capital. For extension of authorized capital, not allowed as per Punjab State Industrial Development Corporation Supreme Court decision. If the issue of shares, see guys, in CA final level, they will not ask direct question, explain 35D. With all those examples, nobody will ask. You also know. Questions will come like this. So, a marathon will be a marathon only if these things are discussed. Otherwise, simply one random fellow will be shouting and you will be listening. And in the exam, you will go vomit and then that ultimately gone. What adjustments, etc., these type of adjustments may come. The issue of shares to comply with RBI or SCRA or FEMA regulation. So, basically, uh, for example, the uh, during the olden days, there used to be many companies where during the uh, Jan Sang, they said that you have to, Moraji Desai, so they said that you have to comply with RBI regulations. In order to comply with RBI regulations, you need to increase your public shareholding from 55% to 65%. So, when I do like that, I mandatorily increase my shareholding and I have to issue shares to the public. Question before you is, is that also preliminary expenses? No, not allowed. Brook Bond India, Supreme Court judgment, Kodak India Limited, Supreme Court judgment. So, if I am issuing shares only to comply with RBI, SCRA, FMA regulations, not allowed. Expenses on issue of bonus shares, same again. It is not increasing my capital base at all. It is just conversion of reserves into capital. Hence, it is revenue expenditure. It is allowed as a deduction because it is not increasing the capital base. Right? So, if the capital base is increasing, it is capital, capital in nature. Issue expenses in IPO. So, I have done an issue that is uh, Mascon Tech Services, Madras High Court. They went for an IPO, spent a lot of money, IPO got cancelled. The purpose was to increase the capital base. Hence, it was not a revenue expenditure, it was a capital expenditure. Hence, there is no deduction. So, if anything relates to the capital expenditure, no deduction will be given. Next, debentures and bonds. Debentures, expense on issue of debentures. 
because that is in the nature of a loan my dear friends debenture revenue expenditure india cements case allowed expenses on issue of conversion of debentures into shares debentures into shares this is again it's in the nature of loan only at the time of the issue it may be converted to capital late, later but at the time of issuing it is in the nature of what loan only debentures hence it is a revenue expenditure itc hotels karnataka high court case all these are some important cases to be kept in mind so this my dear friends is the other areas and now we'll have to do all this 35 day dd all that we have done so let us 36 will finish in a while Let's do the other important area, section 40, capital A, in that 40A2 and 40A3, and then come back to the other areas, shall we? All right, my dear friends, so coming to 40, capital A, 40, capital A, especially 40A2, speaks about excessive or unreasonable expenditure. So, if the company, <coughs> SSE, enters into a contract with now, that SSE can be an individual also, HUF, BOI, AOP, whatever we'll see. If that, uh, you know, person, SSE, enters into a contract with the related party, then if the expenditure that he has incurred is excessive, what is excessive depends on what the AO feels. If it is excessive, that is beyond arm's length price, so to speak, then what will happen? 40A2 will get attracted. So, if an expenditure incurred, by an SSE towards goods supplied, services rendered or facilities provided. Three things are covered. Goods supplied, services rendered, facilities provided by specified persons. Assessing officer can disallow such expenditure to the extent he considers it excessive or unreasonable. Okay. That is what it is. Who all are covered here, my dear friends? SSE can be individual. SSE can be company, firm, AOP or HF. SSE can be, I mean, all SSEs also. So, for individual, relative is covered. Who is relative? So, basically, guys, if you see Companies Act relative definition under 2 clause 77 of Companies Act, that is person and spouse, then you have brother and sister, correct? And then one uh, generation up, one generation down. So, father, mother, son and son's wife, daughter and daughter's husband. For everything, stepfather, stepmother, stepson, uh, stepson, step, uh, what do you say, stepbrother, stepsister covered. Stepdaughter is not covered. It is in company law. Stepdaughter was not covered there. Okay. Step spouse and all don't write. Right. There's no step spouse seen. So it is only spouse and only one spouse. Spouses. Spouse includes spouses, sir. Uh, what do you say? Uh, singular includes plural and all. Don't tell. Okay. So yes, 2 clause 77. This is what it says. Then on the other hand, in income tax act, my dear friends, the relative definition is very simple. Relative here would be spouse of the individual brother sister of the individual and not just one generation up one generation down very very exhaustive lineal ascendant or lineal descendant so go up further go down whenever wherever you want it is son grandchildren great grandchildren great great grandchildren father grandfather great grandfather great great grandfather everything lineal ascendant or descendant everybody is covered so if any individual enters into a contract with any of the relatives of the SSE and the expenditure is unreasonable for example, the SSE hires his spouse to be the accountant of the company. Generally, that spouse is just studied BCom, but uh, the pay is some 5 lakh rupees per month. Definitely unreasonable. Who will get 5 lakh rupees? Chartered accountants only won't get 5 lakh rupees initially. So, they are paying 5 lakh rupees per month to the spouse who is just a BCom graduate. So, the assessing officer can figure this out and say you are just doing it to reduce the tax. Hence, can disallow the excessive expenditure. He will say, 
for this particular qualification etc maybe 60000 is a salary maximum so 440000 i'm going to disallow this is what the ao has to tell for the company from aop hf director or relative of such director is covered partner or relative of such partner in case it's a firm and in case of the aop hf member or relative of such member will be covered as far as other SSEs are concerned, there is an entire list, no need to study that, but nevertheless, I will just give you a quick example here. So, basically, SSE is a sole proprietor of a dry cleaning business. Let us take SSE as an individual, dry cleaning business he has, yes. So, who all are uh, the related parties or relatives as covered under 40A2, my dear friends, relative of the SSE, let us say Mr. A. Any of these people, if the SSE is entering into a contract with them, with higher amount, he is getting, you know, paying them something higher, that extra amount will be 100% disallowed. Next one, any individual, any individual can be his best friend also, any individual or relative of that fellow, that fellow. So, if individual is Mr. B, relative of Mr. B is Mr. C. Now, who is this individual? Random, my best friend cannot have, sir, what do you say, cannot be a related party. My best friend will be my related party if he has something called SI. SI means what? Substantial interest. Substantial interest. What is substantial interest? It is 20% of the voting power, my dear friends, not less than, greater than or equal to 20%. So, my best friend has invested in or he has control over 20% of the voting power of this dry cleaning business. So, if I am paying something to my best friend in excess of what is allowed as per the AO, excess portion will be disallowed. Let us say the friend wants to cheat, what will he do? He will not, I mean, cheat the income tax of, uh, officer, income tax department. He will not enter into a contract. He will make his relative enter into a contract. So, individual has substantial interest, but he will send his relative to enter into a contract. They are also covered, right? Relative of B, such in, uh, individual is also covered. Apart from that, any company, any firm, any AOP, any BOI, if it has greater than or equal to 20% of the voting power of this sole proprietorship, then they also will be related parties. Apart from that, any director, member, partner of such company, which company? A company which has substantial interest. So, basically a company owns 23% in this uh, dry cleaning business and the relative, I mean the director of the company, the uh, is also employed in the sole proprietorship business or getting some consultancy fee in the sole proprietorship business and if it is considered excessive then that also will be disallowed. Apart from that guys, relative of Mr. E also. So basically if the company is D, director, member, partner of D, that is that company, which company, that company which has substantial interest, then relative of E is also covered, deadly. Apart from that, guys, so many other things are there. You see, any company, firm, AOP, BOI, HUF, they may or may not have substantial interest, that's okay. But let's say their members, Abhishek, Krithik, Alia, Karina, two of them have substantial interest, two of them don't have substantial interest. Doesn't matter if they enter into, like Abhishek and Hrithik, enter into a contract with the sole proprietorship and the sole proprietorship is paying them some money which is excessive that will be disallowed deadly and apart from that not only that my dear friends even relatives of Abhishek, Kriti, Kalia and Karina if they enter into a direct transaction with them with the sole proprietorship business that also is covered so here Rakesh Roshan then Saif Ali Khan, Ranbir Kapoor and the entire Khandan if they enter into a contract with this company they are covered this list is really not important for you to understand but you should know what all will come so in case they ask anything like that you should remember okay these things were discussed no need to mug this up no need to study it in depth but just know this example is very important stick to this example okay yes apart from that holding companies are relative of subsidiary company and vice versa and two subsidiary companies of holding company are also related so tata motors hold substantial interest in t1 and t2 from the point of view of Tata Motors, T1 and T2 both are specified persons under 40A2 related parties. T1 and T2 are amongst themselves also specified person because they have a common parent who has substantial interest. This is what it means. So, this is 40A2, my dear friends. So, this is generally applicable to uh, actual expenditure. But when a trade discount is given by a holding company to a subsidiary company, Right, trade discount is not recorded in the book. So, sale price if it's 100, trade discount is 20, I will record only 80. Right, that is a sale or any expenditure is uh, granted and any trade discount is given, etc. 
then provisions of 40A2 will not apply because trade discount is a discount that is given from the sales. So 100 minus 20, that 20 cannot be considered as an expenditure. This is United Exports versus Commissioner of Income Tax, Delhi I Court decision. Payment of rent by a company in the capacity of a lessee to a trust in which the director of the company or also trustee will not uh, attract 40A2. Guys, see here in this list, we have never seen anything with respect to trust. We only saw company firm AOP BOI. So in this case, a company was paying or any any SSE was paying some amount to a trust in which the directors of this company are also trustees. Is it 40A2? No, trust is not covered. These are some of the important points. In company law, we have related party, uh, relative definition in 2 clause 77, related party definition in 2 clause 76, and we have, uh, you know, related party again in section 188. So, there, there are separately given there. So, here it is different, that is different. So, this is what we need to keep in mind. That is regarding 40A. So, if SSE company uh, gives to a director whose strength fail 70,000 rupees, but to the CA of that SSE company, they are paying 40,000. So, it is not fair. That is what it is. So, 50K in this example, basically, for 30K will be disallowed. Because he may feel that both should get the same amount, whatever it is. Or let's say the SSE, uh, to the director, this fellow here, he may fix this as only 20,000 rupees. Assessing officer will fix, no, no, for the director 1000 fail guy, 70,000 is not needed, 20k only is enough. 50k will be disallowed under 40A2. There is an element of double taxation because AO will dissolve 50k and then director, it'll, director will pay tax on 70k. But AO will disallow 20k, uh, uh, sorry, 50k, 20k will allow. 50k now double taxation. 50k is tax in the hands of the company also. 50k is tax in the hands of the director also. Double taxation will come. Now, SSE pays cash of 45,000 uh, to some random person as an advance maybe. It is not an expense under 40A2. But, but 40A3, the next section it is going to be disallowed. Sister concern, all that we have seen. As I told you, related party transaction is a wide, wide definition in 40A2, whereas in 188 and all, it's slightly different. And even in India S24, related party has a wide definition which covers both ALP and beyond ALP. In 188, it only covers beyond ALP, that's all. Alright, now coming back to 40A3. So guys, if I have bought an asset by paying more than 10,000 rupees cash in a day to a person, that will be deducted from my actual cost in section 41 we had seen. This is for an asset. However, if there is an expenditure towards some purchase or something, and if I pay cash more than 10,000 rupees per day to a single person, then that will be added back, that is disallowed under 40A3. Where the SSE makes a payment exceeding 10,000 to a person in a single day, Otherwise, then by account pay, check or account pay, bank draft or use of electronic clearing system, no deduction shall be allowed in respect of such expenditure, right, to a person, to a person, that's what it is. So, if you see, 15,000 rupees, if I pay cash, 40A3 disallowance will be there, very simple, to one person. So, if I pay uh, 9,000, 9,000, 9,000, same person, same day, same person, same day, but different expenditure different expenditure mind you i am not saying same expenditure 27000 rupees is the uh, you know uh, total amount paid but 9000 9000 9000 i am paying same person same day but guys different expenditure because the wordings are very clear expenditure more than 10000 do not get confused correct right? don't come back and tell me sir in some other book is written there no book it's written there only it's correct only what i am what i am trying to explain to you is different what they have written in the book is correct only. There they would have given one expenditure of 27,000, paid 9,000, 9,000, 9,000, same person, same day. Will 43 come or not? Yes. In my example, if they ask in the question, different expenditure. One is expenditure towards uh, payment of, you know, some expense. Let's say bu buying raw materials. Second expense is payment to, to uh, the same person who also uh, has one more business. He has some bakery. One he has, he per, I purchase raw materials from you, from the same person in his another business bakery is there, I am purchasing uh, items from the bakery worth 9000 for my, uh, you know, office function. 
Then similarly, the same guy, I'm purchasing something else, 9,000. Three different expenditures. Can I pay it same person, same day? Yes. Same expenditure split into three bills, 40A3 will definitely come, disallowance. Three different expenditures, but give it in, in, given in 9,000, 9,000, SSE will give the same bill. I mean, uh, sorry, the person will give the same bill, 27,000 to the SSE. SSE will say, okay, sir, I need three bills now because three different expenditures are there. Yes. 9,000, 9,000, 9,000, different expenditure, same person, same day, 40A3 will not come, this is important. The 40A3 uh, section very clearly says, in respect of an expenditure for which payment is made more than 10,000, expenditure should be more than 10,000. So here in my example, expenditure is just 9,000, 9,000, 9,000. Only if the expenditure is more than 10,000, then payment to the same person, same day, more than 10,000, then it's a problem. Right? So please be alert. Please don't come back with those doubts saying that in that book it's given like this, this book it's given like that. That book is correct only because there they would have given what? Expenditure is more than 10,000 rupees and expenditure is only one, not different. Then that's all. So if you see, as I told you, bill 1, bill 2, bill 3, different, different expenditure, 43 will not apply. Then 2 lakh rupees, you see here, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, no 48. Suddenly on 14th, different day, I go to the same person, 1 lakh 70,000. Definitely 48 will be disallowed. Guys, but the beauty is, you need to understand one thing. 48 disallowance. For me, I am paying, no. For me, 1 lakh 70 will be added, that's okay. For me, 1 lakh 70 will be added, that's okay. What about the receiver? This entire transaction is 2 lakh 10,000. Correct? He is actually, let's say I am uh, purchasing, I am selling an asset or selling something at 2 lakh 10,000 rupees. And you are giving me cash 10,000, 10,000, that's okay. Then suddenly you will give me cash 1 lakh 70. For you, 1 lakh 70 is disallowed, that's okay. But for me, that also they can ask in MCQ. You see, 269 ST and 271 DA will come. 269 ST will says anything which is more than 2 lakh if you are collecting per transaction in cash, then 271 DA penalty will come. What is the penalty? To, up to the amount of the expenditure. A penalty can be 2.1 lakh actually. Deadly. Right? That's what I am trying to tell. So guys, here the modes that are given are same like before other than cash, which means it can other than, not cash, other than account pay check, account pay bank draft. So what all is allowed? Account pay bank draft is allowed, account pay check is allowed, then Beam, UPI payment, all those things, Paytm, all these are allowed. What is R NEFT, RTGS, IMPS, everything is allowed. What is not allowed? Cash, cross check payment not allowed, all those things. Right? Yes. Now, but there are certain exemptions and there is one rule, correct? In that rule, which clearly says, rule 6DD, there are certain exceptions to this particular thing. What are they? Apart from that, there are other things also. If I am applying, hiring or leasing goods, carriage, vehicles, limit shall be 35,000 rupees and not 10,000 rupees. For them, that's it. It's okay. Let's make it 25,000 and it's not 10,000 because in goods, carriages, etc., they will not have facility, banking facility. They will not. Nowadays, anyway, with Paytm, everything becomes as simple, but this change came a few years ago. Where they told, sir, I am going to these uh, remote villages where there is no facility, no internet connection also. That time, when I have to make payment, I cannot, you know, ten, more than 10,000 is very less. Make it more than, if it is more than 35,000, disallow. At least up to 35,000, you should allow. There were petitions made to the finance ministry, which they eventually agreed. So for payments made for what? Flying, hiring, leasing, goods, carriages, limit shall be 35,000 rupees. Right? Very simple. So apart from that, if I make the entry also in a different way, I make an entry also in a different way, where I will allow the expenditure in accrual basis. I will make an entry expense to expense payable. Normal expense payable, some 15,000. Next year, I will make expense payable to cash. So, though there is no expenditure here this year, 
but I have paid cash more than 10k. So this happened in 22, 23, and this happened in 23, 24. Disallowance will happen when is a question. So if you see, this is what this section says. Such a payment shall be deemed to be the business income in the previous year in which such payment is made. This is 40A, 3A. So in this year, my dear friends, this year, though it is expensive payable to cash, this 15K will be charged to the income. Why? In 22-23, I have uh, allowed this as a debit to the PNL account full. This year, 23-24, I will have to credit to the PNL account 15,000 rupees. Got it? It may be noted that where payment made is less than 10,000 in respect of an invoice which is more than 10,000, disallowance shall not be attracted, no problem. Payment per day can be less than 10,000, no problem. 43.1 also discourages payments made otherwise than by specified mode where the sum makes each 10,000 to acquire a capital asset we have already seen. But these exemptions, no, rule 60D will apply only to 40A3 expenditure and not to 43.1. So if you buy an asset by breaching these regulations under rule 6DD, still there will be a, you have to reduce it from the actual cost because rule 6DD is only applicable to section 40A3. So no disallowance shall be made under 40A3 where payment is made to RBI, Reserve Bank of India, State Bank of India, Cooperative Bank, all these things. So SBI will be sleeping, sleeping Bank of India it's called, suddenly when they will wake up, if I, if you know, payment is made to them, no problem, they will tell, come, come after lunch break, they will tell, but again after you go after lunch break, then yes, this is what it is. Then any agricultural society, LIC, all these things, where payment is made to the government, no problem, you can pay any amount, then you have LC, uh, then book adjustment, bill of exchange, all these things, you can go ahead with that. All this, you know, in our regular batch will go more in depth, this you just go through. Uh, but one interesting thing is what, if payment is made to the cultivator, grower or producer of agricultural or forest produce, produce of animal husbandry, fish or fish products, horticulture or apiculture, in these cases guys, definitely you can make payment pr provided he is a primary producer, provided he is a primary producer. Primary producer means what? He is producing the entire goods primarily. This background was uh, changed. Sorry, let me change back the background to the, what it was. Fine, this is fine. It was green only, suddenly it got changed. Right. Jacket also changed. Background also changed. Person is the same though, don't worry. Right? Yeah. So, products, horticulture, apiculture, all these things, yes. So, guys, this is, mind you, if an agricultural uh, uh, producer, that is farmer, sells it to Reliance Fresh and you pay 15,000 cash to Reliance Fresh, is it allowed or disallowed? Disallowed. Because payment should be made directly to whom? Cultivator, grower or producer. So, if you have a deal directly with the, let's say your ITC hotels, you directly go to the primary producer and say, sir, whatever is in your uh, village, whatever fields, directly it should come to me. I will pay you cash. Can you pay more than 10,000? Yes. Yes. Fish or fish products. Guys, I can ask you one question in fish or fish products. What used to happen was payment was made to the head fisherman. Head fisherman will collect fish from all the fishermen. He will make it into a heap here and he will sit in the market to sell. So he will know what 10 kg came from one person, 15 kg from one person, 5 kg from one person, like that he will put heaps and sit there. Then he will start selling one by one. Now payment made to head fisherman is not made to cultivator grower producer because he his his share in that is only very less. He has collected from others. So if I am ITC hotels, I am in uh, Kerala, ITC hotel Kerala. There is one Taj Hotel, Taj Bikal, there is an area, there you know, there is Bikal Fort, so there, this is one hotel, this thing, uh, property, Taj property. Now Taj Hotels will go to that head fisherman and uh, say, all this fish I want for my guest, you give me. How much? Uh, 2 lakhs, take 2 lakhs, cash. AO used to disallow it. So, 
people went to the finance ministry and said sir head fisherman is like cultivator grower only sir he just collecting from everybody and selling please give a uh, you know circular so a circular was released saying fish shop fish products cultivator grower producer will include head fisherman also so payment made to head fisherman not disallowed fish shop fish products ao was disallowing payment made to uh, fisherman for selling prawns crabs other forms of marine life so they disallowed so crab went and said what did i do bro i am already dead at least let them pay cash and pay me prawn started crying crab started crying they said okay take it so even for prawns and all what fish or fish products what do you think it is possible so fish or fish products includes everything guys all the other forms of marine life as well octopus whatever you want to take uh, products of horticulture oct octopus is not there i'm just kidding right so you have your crab prawn other things there are various forms of fish squid all these things the squid game uh, the product of horticulture and apiculture horticulture means fruits and vegetables apiculture means bee rearing bee honey honey bee so where you take the produce what is the produce here you will not eat the bee you will eat the honey right that one where the payment is made with the, without the aid of our the cottage industry all these things you go and guys this again is one more point where payment is made by way of gratuity retrenchment compensation other terminal benefit i can make payment to any employee for gratuity retrenchment compensation etc or to him or his legal heirs if the sum payable does not exceed 50000 rupees the sum payable does not exceed 50000 rupees so up to 50000 i can make more than 50000 if i make in cash this allowed so if you are uh, into merchant navy you are in the high seas already and you are uh, not in a place where your normal place of duty is you have been deputed to one more ship that time there is no bank account on that ship there is nothing there that time i have to pay you 1 lakh rupees and you have just joined that ship as a you know consultant because you are an employee in some other company whatever the deal is now i have to pay you 1 lakh rupees minus 30000 tds have to deduct on behalf of the other company which is uh, which has hired you now where a payment of salary is made to an employee after tds and such employee is posted for a continuous period of 15 days or more in a place other than his normal place of duty somewhere else you are working or on a ship i just combined both and told you in ship also you can go somewhere else or normal work also you can go somewhere else anyway in a ship if you are there where you know they don't have access to bank account etc they'll pay you cash or deducting tds more than 10000 rupees no problem does not maintain any account in any bank at such place or ship so basically ships also have account uh, you know what do you say uh, bank accounts banks they have so when i had gone to uh, the europe i had gone for a cruise there you know i was wanted to swipe something it was not working i said you can withdraw cash I'm like where he showed me behind there were some three four banks already atm machine and all was there in the ship so of course so if it, this fellow doesn't have a bank account on that ship then what to do cash can be paid no problem so other things are all fine guys no problem 40a3 shall not apply in respect of expenditure for which no deduction is claimed like any capital expenditure so capex will be coming under already discussed for capital expenditure you have section 43 oh, sorry guys that time i told 41 my bad 431 i meant actual cost 431 41 is deemed profit for the asset more than 10 lakh 10000 431 it will be reduced from 431 right 431 actual cost and also if i have already claimed like for example section 35 scientific research expenditure capital expenditure i have already uh, incurred for my research and i have taken 100% deduction under which section 35 if that be the case can i again claim what do you say uh, you know I, there in that case i have already claimed full depreciation not depreciation but i have already taken a 100% deduction correct 
then 40A3 will apply only if payment is made otherwise than specified modes. So, if I have bought a scientific research expenditure more than 10,000 with cash, then this particular section will come. Now, can I, instead of paying you directly, I will deposit 1 lakh rupees in the bank account. I will deposit cash in the bank account of the other person. Expenditure rather than paying you directly, what I will do, I will deposit cash into your account. Is it treated as payment made to bank account or payment made in cash? This also went to court. That fellow said, sir, I made a payment to bank account, State Bank of India or Reserve Bank of India. I made the payment to them. No, you didn't make payment to them. You made a payment in, into the account of another person. Your payment is mod. If they have any charges, etc., I have to pay something, then you can pay. Repayment of your loan you have, you are paying that money. It's not even an expenditure. But here you see, if anybody's expenditure is like 1 lakh, and rather than paying him uh, uh, through bank account, you are actually depositing cash into the bank. Will it come under 6DD? No. Deposit of cash directly into the bank account of the supplier does not fall within the exception listed under 6DD and will be liable to disallowance under 40A3. Right? That is what the entire section tells about. 40A3. So, they will give one more example. Infosys is paying money to the bus who are playing employees, who are not playing goods, employees. And they have made payment in cash 34,999 rupees, just to confuse you. 10,000 percent it is disallowed. Why guys? It is only playing of goods, not people. All these are important. So, for a farmer, can I pay more than 10K? Yes. But less than 2 lakh I should pay. No 48 disallowance. And guys, for the farmer, this 269 ST and 271 DA also will not come. This is an exception. And they need not uh, give their PAN also under 114B. These are all the things. Even if I do this scam, advance to cash and purchase to advance. Obviously, ultimate entry will be purchased to cash only. It is with respect to an expenditure. That is why 40A3 will be covering there also. Got it, my dear friends? Yes or no? Come on, fist bump all of you. Good. Moving on, my dear friends. As far as the funds are concerned, so let us uh, come back to certain uh, reductions under 36. I have made a chart which will uh, help you understand really well. So, funds are of two types. One is approved or recognized funds. Other one is unapproved funds. So, approved funds, you have 3614, 3615A, 3614A and 3615. No need to remember the section numbers. Just remember 36. So, first is what? Employer's contribution. Correct? And that is the recognized provident fund and approved superannuation fund. Generally, when you are contributing, Employer will contribute, employee also will contribute. So, let me just uh, show you. Let me open CA inter material and show you that portion so that you will understand. Right. So, what, how does it work? So, you will pay all these things gratuity, pension, leave, and cash payment, etc. Hmm. Provident fund, there are two types. One is public provident fund where anybody can invest, and of course, you have the EPF, employer provident fund. As far as the employer's provident fund is concerned, there you go. Employer will contribute, employee also will contribute. Employee's contribution is taxable, but eligible for reduction for the employee under ATC. This is for the employee I am talking about. As far as employer is concerned, he will up to 12% of salary is exempt and any excess, it is taxable in the hands of the employee. This entire thing that you studied in CA Inter was from the employee's point of view. But employer's contribution from the employer's point of view. So, it's an expense, right? If basically I have to pay you salary of 1 lakh and 10,000 rupees extra I have to contribute to provident fund. And that 10,000 rupees is extra. That extra portion is allowed under 3614. That is what we are discussing. That's it. Very simple. Okay. So, if you see
One second. Employers contribution, recognized provident fund, approved super fund, all these things are there. Yes. Employers contribution, 10 lakh to bank. Then salary, 1 crore, 2 bank, 90 lakh, 2 employees contribution. Then employees contribution to bank. This is the entry that I will do in case I have to use the employees contribution. Employers contribution directly, I will do employers contribution, 10 lakh to bank. This employer's contribution, is it allowed? Yes, it's allowed under 3614. But from the employee also, I will deduct, no. Salary, 1 lakh, 1 crore. Bank, 90 lakh. Employee's contribution, 10 lakh. Then employee's contribution to bank, 10 lakh. What about this employee's contribution of 10 lakh? Basically, this is embedded in the salary, 1 crore. 90 lakh will be salary, 10 lakh will be employee's contribution. My dear friends, 3615A says that employee's contribution will be taken as income. Employee's contribution will be taken as income. Why? Because eventually it will be given to the bank. Right? So basically they are trying to tell that employer's contribution 10 lakh fully allowed. As far as employee's contribution also equal amount they will deduct. Right? So anyway when I am debiting full salary 1 CR. I will show the employee's contribution as an income. So basically guys, 90 lakhs is salary, 10 lakh is employee's contribution expense, 10 lakh is employee's contribution income. That's what they are trying to tell. That is income as per 224.10. And again obviously in 3615 that is also allowed. So it's knocked off. Income 10 lakh, expense 10 lakh, knocked off. Then that mind you that 10 lakh is included in 1 crore. So it's just... To make you understand that's all, this is irrelevant. Employer's contribution can be ignored. What is more important is employer's contribution. Similarly, employer's contribution to pension fund under ATCCD. 36148. Under that, if it is less than or equal to 10% of salary, and salary means what? Basic plus DA, which is part of the terms. So 36148, pension fund, any employer's contribution to pension fund will be allowed or disallowed, will be definitely allowed as long as it is up to 10% of salary, basic plus DA part of the terms. 3615 says contribution to approved GF, GF means not girlfriend, the only GF CA fellows will know is gratuity fund, right? So 3615, the GF, then what is the entry, gratuity account to gratuity payable account, gratuity payable account to bank. So this based on actuarial valuation, whatever the amount is, it is definitely allowed, my dear friends. This is with respect to approved. What about unapproved? Unapproved. Right? 37.1 generally said yes. Even contribution to unapproved funds is allowed because it is wholly used for business, not for personal purposes. And it is for, what do you say? Uh, it is not an expenditure covered under 3236. Government was not happy with this because Supreme Court also said it is allowed. So to curb that from happening, 40A9 was brought about. Under section 40, capital A9, they say that it is not allowed. It is disallowed. Any contribution by an employer to an unapproved fund will be disallowed. So basically, why? Because unapproved fund used to use that money and uh, invest it in some useless things like you know equity shares etc high risk investments so to curb that from happening now they have told nothing doing so unapproved firms disallowed under 40a9 approved funds allowed so gist of the story 40 capital a7 and 40 capital 9, A9, both are there. 40 capital A9 in this gratuity fund is not covered because gratuity fund is merely a book entry. So in 40 A9, what all will be disallowed? Provident fund, pension fund, other things will be disallowed. Gratuity fund is not disallowed under 40 A9. Gratuity fund is allowed uh, disallowed under 40 A7. So contribution to unapproved gratuity fund will be disallowed under 40 A7. When is gratuity fund allowed? Either it has to be approved 
or it should not be a mere book entry means if it is payable during the year and it actually are paid during the year where employers are retiring during the year employees are retiring during the year if employees are retiring during the year if i make an entry and pay it on time then it is allowed so when is it disallowed only when what do you say 40a7 get comes into the picture it is disallowed when it is transferred to unapproved fund if it's approved fund no problem and gratuity you can claim on accrual basis also on payment basis also because it should be linked to 43b is it on accrual or is it on payment we'll see 43b and understand so 37 one that's all about this entire uh, area that we were discussing all that yes coming to 37 one my dear friends all expenses under 32 36 if it is not covered it will come under 37 capital expenditure will not be there so it should not be in the nature of personal expenditure it should be wholly used for the purpose of business undoubtedly what about expenditure to carry on illegal business so if i am having a uh, by day i am operating pharmacy i am giving dolo and other paracetamol by night i am operating joint family you know what i mean joint family correct where they only do snorting and other things i am giving all these weed hashish marijuana cocaine all that i am selling the expenses to give it to the uh, street vendor the expenses of you know uh, hiring a vehicle and distributing it to my customers all these things will be disallowed expenditure also is disallowed under 371 anything that you have used to uh, what do you say uh, do anything illegal will be disallowed under 371 specifically there is a disallowance under section 371 so 32 to 36 so we'll see that particular thing 37 general deductions 37 page b 43 in our material any expenditure not being in the nature of 32 36 yes should not be capital yes should not be personal yes wholly and exclusively for the purpose of business or profession yes shall be allowed under section 37 it's a general deduction section for telephone printing and stationery electricity audit fee all that will come under 37 now there are certain explanations to section 37 explanation number 1 to 37 expenditure incurred for any purpose which is an offence or prohibited by law in india or outside india expenditure incurred for any purpose which is an offence or prohibited by law in india outside india as i told you any expenditure which is illegal not allowed providing any benefit or perquisite to any person also like generally indian medical association has come out with guidance uh, guideline saying that asking the doctors not to charge commission for issuing medicines basically it's a huge scam actually it's uh, all most of the doctors do it so one pharma company will come and tell sir my medicines only you give to the patients if you give 10% cut so even though that medicine may or may not be effective that's secondary but since he's getting commission there's a vested interest hence he will issue that medicine only this is in violation of any law or regulation so the pharma companies used to pay commission like this dolo there was a allegation against dolo during covid 2 uh, we used to take dolo like some uh, chewing gum if you remember like on chocolate we were eating every day dolo so dolo apparently paid 1000 crore worth of commission to all these doctors etc for prescribing dolo now that 1000 crore they used to debit to their pnl account saying business expense what they used to say whatever terminology is they used to give is it allowed or not allowed what do you think it says yes anything in violation of any rule or regulation etc governing the conduct of such person will be in violation of the law apart from that even if i use any compounding of any offense compounding means what whenever there is a law which says fine or imprisonment or both 
This is called compounding. In order to avoid imprisonment, I can pay fine. So, even if I this compounding fee, I have to pay. That fee, if I paid also, people are allowing earlier. Now they say nothing doing. So, it is definitely not allowed. Because it's an explanation one. Similarly, explanation two, as far as CSR is concerned, any expenditure incurred on activities relating to CSR, as per 135 Companies Act, is not allowed as a deduction under 37. But expenditure under 32, 36 will be allowed because it's only overrides 37. And donation made under section 80G will be covered basically even if you use CSR. Why isn't CSR allowed? Guys, because CSR as per Companies Act, every company beyond a threshold, listed company, then any company with net worth more than 500 crore, all those things are there, turnover 1000 crore, they have to mandatorily donate or rather spend 2% of their net profit as CSR. If I allow that to be debited to my tax p &L account, what will happen? I will get a tax benefit of 30% of 2%. So it will be like 2% I have spent, 30% on 2% I got deduction. Which means technically I spent only 70% of 2%. 1.4% I have spent. 60% 0.6% I have got deduction. That is not allowed, so it's disallowed. So under 32, 36, if anything comes within CSR, it is allowed. 37, not allowed. However, this section does not override 80G. Under 80G, you can still take a deduction. So technically you can still take a deduction. But Two things you cannot take deduction. One is clean Ganga fund and the other one is Swachh Bharat Kosh. For that you cannot take any deduction. That is what they say. So if you see. What will overlap I will tell you. One is the PM National Relief Fund, PM Cares Fund and the Swachh Bharat Kosh and clean Ganga fund. All three can be used in CSR. All three are not allowed under 37.1. But they are not allowed under 32.36 also. But PM National Relief Fund and PM Cares Fund are allowed under ATG. Swachh Bharat Kosh and Clean Ganga Fund, you, can you claim in ATG or not? If you have taken it in CSR, you cannot claim. If you have not taken in CSR, then you can claim. Most important. Many people, what they study, clean Ganga fund and Swachh Bharat Kosh, not allowed. Close. No. Example, I'll give you. See, 100 crore is my 2%. Uh, Means what? I have to actually spend 100 crore. My profit is, uh, you know, so much, of which 2% is represented by how much? 100 crore. 90 crore, I will use other CSR activity that you leave. 5 crore, I will use for Swachh Bharat uh, Kosh. And 5 crore for clean Ganga fund. Is it part of CSR? Yes. Since it is part of CSR, it is part of that 100 crore. 90 crore I use for other things that you leave. 5 crore for Swachh Bharat Kosh. 5 crore for clean Ganga fund. These two I have used already. Is it be there for CSR? Yes. Is it there for ATG? No, it will not come for ATG. Similarly, apart from this 100 crore, I have spent 1.5 crore for the Swachh Bharat Kosh. And the 2.5 crore for the clean Ganga fund. Extra. I have not taken it as part of CSR. Why? Because CSR I have to spend only 100 crore. 100 crore I have already spent. So CSR I have to spend already. I have already spent. So 1.5 CR towards Vachparath Kosh. 2.5 crore towards clean Ganga fund. CSR not applicable. ATG will it come or not? Yes. Mind you guys. If Vachparath Kosh and the clean Ganga fund is used for CSR. Then it will not come under ATG. If Swachh Bharat Kosh and Clean Ganga Fund is outside the purview of CSR, in this example, I have paid more over and above CSR, then only I will take it into account. Do not get confused. Hope you got the point, my dear friends. So, as I told you, business expenditure is not allowed if it is illegal. But what about business loss? So there was a case T.A. Qureshi, as I told you, early mo morning, throughout the day, pharmacy. Evening, breathe easy. What breathe? It's not. Right? And uh, income tax authorities came and seized the goods. Confiscated, not even seized. Seized means just take away the position. Confiscation means taking the ownership. 
they have confiscated goods worth 1 crore. At 1 crore, this TA Qureshi took it as a business loss and he claimed it against his other income. Paracetamol income, he claimed it. Government said, hey, how is it possible? It is cheating. Then he said, no, read the law. Law says expenditure is not allowed, but I can allow loss no under 72. That went to the court and court said, yes, you are right. So, very important to know. Business loss is different from expense incurred towards business. Where an income from an illegal business was asset to tax. Loss arising from such business was deductible. Allowability of loss continues to hold good even after introduction of explanation 1 to 37. Explanation is only confined to disallowance of expenses. Not for other things is what they say. And any advertisement in publications of a political party, there will absolutely be no deduction will be allowable to such advertisements, owner, brochure, etc. But guys, it's one scam. In 37 to be, it is disallowed. But all donations are allowed as deductions under 80 GGB or 80 GGC. Allowed under 80 GGB or 80 GGC. So, under 37, 1, any income tax paid, interest paid, penalty, fee, etc. is already will be disallowed under 40A2, will be disallowed under 40A2. Just a sec. We have seen this 40A1A2 the other day. Under 37, 1, again revise it shortly, don't worry. We will revise it. 40A1A2, we will still again do it. No problem. It is not recorded here. I will record it and give it to you. Don't worry. E. This one note is damn annoying, guys. I'm still old school. I still use laptop. Though I have kidney, I have sold and bought an iPad. Somehow I like using this. I'm very comfortable with this. Anyway. 37.1. Income, interest, penalty, fee. So, income tax paid. 40A2. Disallowed. We'll see that. Even DTA benefit is disallowed under 90, 91 and 98. Right? So, any income tax paid will be disallowed. Other laws, if there is any tax paid or interest paid or fee paid under other laws, if it is compensatory in nature, it is allowed. Penal in nature, if it is willful default, it will be disallowed. So, what do you mean by that compensatory in nature, willful in nature? I will discuss that. I will discuss that in one other case. GST and other taxes allowed under 37.1. So, GST etc. expense if you do, it is definitely allowed. Demuraj is another name for charges. It is allowed under 37.1. Breach of a contract. If there is any breach of the contract, if it is for delayed performance, whatever amount that you have paid will be allowed. If it is failure to perform the contract, then it is a breach that whatever amount you pay is allowed. Penalty in the nature of compensation. I told you, compensatory payment. Malva, Vanaspati and Chemical Supreme Court judgment. What happened here was, Maharashtra, uh, in Maharashtra, the, what do you say, the, for a particular contract, they were charging, Maharashtra government was charging 4%. But for this company, Malva, Vanaspati, they charge 2%. Rate, rate of tax, some local tax. So, for example, this Malva Vanaspati, instead of paying 4 lakh, they only had to pay 2 lakh. But, and that goods, etc., has to be only not exported outside, but only used in Maharashtra. What happened if there was found breach there, any breach was found, then the Maharashtra government said 125% penalty you have to pay. 
his malwa fellows took me took use of this uh, benefit they produced the goods and started selling outside maharashtra government came to know they imposed 125% 2 lakh anyway they'll pay 125% is what 2 lakh more plus 50000 extra 2 lakh 50000 overall they paid 4 and 1/2 lakhs this 4 and 1/2 lakhs they debited to their pnl account chain everything is allowed no question is what is allowed what is not allowed 2 lakh initially fully allowed then in that 125% extra it will become 2 lakh 50000 in that 2 lakh was compensatory in nature and that was allowed because this 2 lakh to 4 lakh is just a compensation so i would have to normal other people i would have charged 4 lakh to you i charge 2 lakh so to reach from 2 lakh to 4 lakh compensation but over and above 4 lakh it's punishment in nature punitive for that extra 50000 that is penal in nature that i will not allow that is called disallowed so anything which is punitive in nature disallowed compensatory in nature allowed hope you got it if there is any interest in default in paying tds disallowed 234 abc disallowed interest on loan taken to pay income tax disallowed other cases penal interest paid allowed If you have taken a loan to pay income tax, this allowed. Other cases allowed. Then T TDS filing fee, scientific research filing fee. You have to file the form ten, uh, you know, form ten series. Two thirty four E F G. You will file, you know, fees for interest, this thing, TDS, etc. It is neither interest nor penalty, and I C I allows it. Important point. I C I allows this in the exam. You also allow. If you want to be allowed into ICI books of books as member, right? That is what it is. So foreign company data twenty lakh to bank twenty lakh. They forgot to deduct TDS. Foreign company data two lakh to TDS payable two lakh. I did. Then TDS payable two lakh to bank two lakh. I did. then i made bad debts bad debts 2 lakh to foreign company account 2 lakh just think about it under 371 is this expenditure allowed no because this expenditure was incurred due to failure to pay tds they forgot and they created on expenditure 2 lakh it is only to failure to pay tds hence disallowed other two sections we'll see later we haven't done the bad debt section that is 617 and 40a1 other cases website expenses of a travel company is it capital nature or revenue in nature so the court held it to be revenue in nature even though the main item for the travel company is the website prior paid expenses generally will be disallowed under 371 if it is regarding embezzled then it is allowed it because it's a loss under 371 if prior paid items are crystallized during the previous year then it is allowed which uh, though it's not technically a prior paid item for example arrears of salary Arrears of salary for all these years I paid now it is crystallized during the previous year hence allowed. Retrenchment compensation if the entire business has closed down and any retrenchment compensation paid by the company to the employees is capital in nature. On the other hand, in Ravindranath Nair case law, four out of ten businesses were shut down, six businesses are still running, so retrenchment compensation paid to them was allowed under thirty seven one. Employee is a top employee. I am uh, giving him golf. package so company is sponsoring his golf membership company paid for golf membership it is for the benefit of the employee hence covered under 371 if i have a glow sign board glow sign board i have and uh, everywhere i have put my glow sign board for my company and that glow sign board will keep on redu reducing in uh, value sometimes it will keep on flickering and i have to keep replacing is it capital expenditure or revenue expenditure the uh, court ruled it to be a revenue expenditure so whatever name you call you call compounding fee regularization fee whatever it is nomenclature does not matter in the eyes of the income tax act it is a fine so under 37 man we have seen very clearly now it will be disallowed disallowed everywhere it will be disallowed provision for diminution in investment assets impairment of assets under india s 36 provision for deferred taxes disallowed under 37 one all these are based on decided case laws dividend or ddt expenses towards that disallowed from 14 2020 
provision for subsidiary companies loss put in the holding company disallowed salary and perquisites given to directors are allowed subject to 40a2 which we did 40a2 is excessive payment all these things this is what we have seen so now we will have to study something with respect to the bad debt and of course bad debt recovery we have to study bad debt and bad debt recovery let's do that my dear friends all right my dear friends coming back to 3617 we were discussing bad debts so let's discuss so guys for bad debts to be uh, allowed as a deduction there has to be two conditions condition number one bad debt should have been written off in the books of accounts as irrecoverable right so basically it should there should have been an entry already where they say i cannot recover the bad debts plus it should have been taken into the accounts of uh, the you know into the accounts as a debt so this is either 1 plus 2 or 1 plus 2 two things one is what first condition is common for both right bad debt should be written off in the books of accounts as irrecoverable second condition is what it should have been taken into the accounts before or again 1 plus this 2 what is 1 bad debt should be written off as irrecoverable in the books of accounts and debt should represent money lent in the ordinary course of business so in the ordinary course of business if i lend you money that will be called as a bad debt but technically this 1 plus 2 where it is taken into the books of accounts should be what is considered in 36 1 because if you see my dear friends if the debt is represented by money lent in the ordinary course of business for instance if I say advance to supplier to bank and then bad debt to advance, have I taken it into the books of accounts? Have I taken it into the PL before? No, it's as an advance. And this money I have lent in the ordinary course of business as an advance. So will 3617 come here? No, 371 will come. When will 361 come? Only when it is debited to PL account. Right? So you have made an entry debtors to sales and then you are making an entry bad debts to debtors that time only 3617 you can definitely claim so everything you can claim in these cases so bad debt will be taken into account like that so as far as construction contract also is the same thing uh, and when the bad debts when you are recovering the bad debts so basically what will happen 411 deem profit says whenever you have allowed an expenditure and when you are recovering the same, then it is taxable. For example, I had a bad debts of 1 lakh which I have written off in the books of accounts. Tomorrow that person comes and gives me that 1 lakh. Will I take it as an income under 411? Generally, yes. But I have one more specific section called 414. In 414, clearly they have mentioned that whatever bad debts you have take, claimed, if you get back, that has to be offered to tax. So, 41.4 will override 41.1. Bad debt recovery will come under 41.4 and not 41.1. Apart from that, your uh, predecessor and successor, amalgamating company, transfers all the assets to amalgamated company. Father, predecessor, so, what do you say, is now succeeded by his son or daughter. Demerged company and a predecessor will be now successor will be resulting company. Firm is a predecessor and now company will be the successor and partnership firm is a predecessor and now partners will be the successors of the same. In that be the case. Basically the question is, I told you it should have been written off in the books of accounts and it should be taken in the books of accounts. So predecessor may take it into the books of accounts but the successor may write it off. Predecessor may take it in the books of accounts and write off also but then recovery happens when the new person when the successor takes it so my father had bad debts of 2 lakh he wrote it off also then i succeeded the business then that debtor came and gave me money should i take it into account should I should, is it taxed these are the questions that they can ask in the exam this we will discuss but before that what are the other terms of recovery Provision for bad debts made in the books of account shall not be allowed as a deduction except for those engaged in banking businesses as we have already discussed. Bad debts related to loan are not allowed. So if it's a banking business, for them it's normal business, right? So for them 36-7A will come. But if you are giving normal advances that I showed you the journal entry, then for that 36-17 will not come. Bad debts related to loan, I told you, are not allowed unless the SSE has a money lending business. Money lending business allowed under 36-17A and 7. Yes, then here, 
if the amount recovered if the amount of debt is 25000 bad debt which has been written off is 12000 the debt due is 13000 in that final settlement i get 10000 rupees again further 3000 rupees will be my bad debt on the other hand if the amount recovered is let's say 15000 rupees so basically the debt due was 13000 i have recovered 15000 13000 i have recovered 2000 extra i have recovered the 2000 rupees extra will be my 414 which will be offered to tax is what the section says you see 414 provides that for taxability of bad debts recovered with written off earlier bad debts so recovered shall be income under the pgbp in the previous year in which it was recovered the example a claim total bad debt of 6 lakh a o allowed only 4 lakh 2 lakh was disallowed in the given previous year and the remaining 2 lakh was disallowed in the subsequent previous year 3.5 lakh was recovered what was the allowed 4 lakh right rupees 1.5 lakh You see, allowed only four lakh, disallowed how much? Two lakh. Now I have recovered three point five lakh. Guys, in that three point five lakh that I have recovered, what was allowed before? Two lakh was not at all allowed. What was the extra portion that was allowed? Three point five lakh minus two lakh, one point five lakh extra was allowed. So that one point five lakh will be offered to tax. whatever was debited earlier if it is credited this year that only is taxed if full 6 lakh was allowed and i am recovering 3.5 lakh today then full 3.5 lakh will be taxable but only 4 lakh was allowed 2 lakh was not allowed so 2 lakh was not debited in the pnl account but today i am creating 3.5 lakh in that 2 lakh was never debited so it will not be taxed what is taxed only the extra portion 1.5 lakh will be taxed that is what it is So you see here, A sold materials to be on credit worth twelve lakh rupees during the financial year and offered the same as part of taxable income in seventeen eighteen. During assessment year eighteen nineteen, A writes off the same as bad debt, full twelve lakh as bad debt. Six lakh is recovered. Twelve lakh was debited. Six lakh is coming in. So what now? Full six lakh is taken as a what do you say? Business income because I have not what do you say? Recovered fully, and I have allowed everything uh, initially. Twelve lakh was allowed like that. Advances, etc., made to raw materials, etc., as a result of which advance is not recoverable. Bad debts cannot be claimed because bad debts were not taken into account only in the first place, as already discussed. So, predecessor is Mr. A, successor is Mr. A. There is no succession here. Debt was incurred by A, written off by A, recovered by A also. Then forty one four says even if old business is there, discontinued by also under forty one four that amount recovery will be taxable. Predecessor was A, a firm. Successor was B, partner. Debt incurred was A. Debt written off was A. Debt recovered was B. Who recovered the debt? B. who incurred the debt a who wrote off the debt a who recovered the debt b so guys in pk kaimal case law the supreme court said that since ssc is not the same ssc must be the same in 414 since ssc is not the same 414 will not apply amount received by b is a capital receipt not taxable deadly amount received by b is capital receipt not taxable next predecessor is a firm successor is a company predecessor is a firm successor is a company debt incurred by whom firm a written off by whom b limited debt incurred by a written off by b limited recovered right recovery here if it is recovered guys if you see taxable under 411 b in succession 411b it is definitely taxable and 3617 will apply even if the ssc will change it will still apply veerabhadra rao supreme court because guys here 
इट वॉज टेकन इन टू दी अकाउंट एंड रिटर्न ऑफ बाय बी एंड रिकवर्ड बाय बी इन द सेकेंड केस इनकर्ड एंड रिटर्न ऑफ बाय समी एल्स रिकवर्ड बाय समी एल्स पी के कैमाल से एस एस सी हू इज रेटिंग इट ऑफ एंड रिकवरिंग मस्ट बी द सेम हेन्स फोर्टी वन फोर विल नॉट अप्लाई But in cases of succession, if it is incurred by somebody, written off by somebody else, and written off and recovered is by the same person as this example, written off by B Limited, recovered by B Limited, then thirty six one seven will apply. These are the small small pointers that you need to think about, guys. Important points. then we have uh, family planning expenditure under 3619 all the quick important things will do then the miscellaneous part will do later if expenditure is capital in nature 1/5 of that plan family planning expenditure is allowed if it is revenue then it fully allowed it should be incurred by the company not firm llp hf and only with respect to employees guys not customers that is all you need to remember in terms of family planning expenditure and just like unabsorbed depreciation unabsorbed family planning expenditure will be allowed to be carried forward indefinitely like depreciation we are allowed to be carried forward indefinitely like depreciation so now we will come to an interesting area my dear friends tds defaults tds defaults 40 small a 1 40 small a 1a 40 small a 2 is about income tax income tax paid will not be allowed 40 small a 1 and 40 small a 2 tds default what part of the expenses allowed what part of the expenses disallowed now tds defaults let us see this is all about it that's all there is to it here in this other things we will see later as i told you let's come to the 40 small a portion disallowance in terms of tds 40a1 speaks about non residents 40a1a speaks about resident very simple resident yeah so what all is covered in 40a1 my dear friends interest is covered royalty is covered fee for technical services is covered and any amount chargeable is covered that amount must be chargeable for example if i am an indian ssc i take some services from an us agent with respect to some order i take services from us agent could i pay some amount to the agent yes will i deduct tds on that no because agent does not have a permanent establishment in india agent is getting services outside india only and passing them on to me and i am paying the agent money for him is it deemed to occur arise in india no so when his income is not at all deductible can you say that tds provisions of 40a1 will apply no that's why the act uses the word any amount chargeable so just because i make payment to an outsider doesn't mean this will be chargeable only those which are chargeable will be offered to i mean will be uh, liable under 40a1 so 40a1 what all is covered interest royalty fee for technical services any amount chargeable right interest royalty fee for technical services any amount chargeable any amount chargeable right so who all is covered persons outside india are covered and foreign company is covered what were uh, our heroes doing very smart fellows they were paying to non resident indians when they were in india fully so nris are living abroad only but this section said if you are outside india and we don't deduct tds that expense only will be disallowed so when that nri comes to india i used to pay him and then say this section will not apply thankfully they changed the law they said outside india then non resident indian payment to non resident indian and third one payment to made to a foreign company payment made to a foreign company what is the component which is taken into account tds deductible component basically the amount on which tds should be deducted and this does not include salary under 40a3 guys if salary is to be paid to a non resident and if it is not deducted on time even if there is a one day delay full amount will be disallowed under 40a3 so 40a3 section will not come here because 40a3 is a specific section with respect to salary salary disallowances immediate next day 40a1 is different 
One of the conditions that are to be taken into account. Conditions are what? One is something which is deductible but not deducted. TDS should be deductible but has not been deducted. Or TDS deductible, deducted but not paid on or before the due date. Got it? TDS deductible, not deducted. Second, or deductible, deducted but not paid on or before the due date under section 139.1. If it is not paid on or before due date under section 139.1, then what will happen, guys? It will not be allowed that year. When will it be allowed? Allowed in the subsequent year in which the default is rectified. That is where the tax is paid by the SSE. So, how much is disallowed? 100% is disallowed. 100% is disallowed. So, if you have not deducted, it is deductible but not deducted, then disallowed 100 percent second deductible deducted also but it is not paid before the due date under 139.1 then it is allowed in the subsequent year in which the issue is rectified how much is disallowed full 100 percent is disallowed but will it be allowed in the next year yes yes 40a1 then what is 40a1a 40a1a is what any sum payable any sum payable. Payable includes paid also in this because of a Supreme Court decision. And 40A1A is only for resident, not for non-resident. And what is the component and condition same as 40A1, no change. Deductible but not deducted, deductible, deducted but not paid. What is the amount of disallowance? Amount of disallowance is 30%. 30% of the expense will be disallowed, not 100%. right 30 percent so basically for example in 40a 1a let's say a limited makes a payment to the auditor pj and company 20 lakhs they forgot to deduct tds 2 lakh so it was tds deductible but not deducted what will happen a limited because they have not deducted now they will be called as ssc in default under section 201 and penalty will be under 221 up to the TDS amount. Up to the TDS amount, 2 lakh rupees will be the penalty. Then under section 220, there is 1% per month they have to pay interest or the penalty they have to pay 1% per month. This is the problem. How can I not be called as SSE in default? A limited was supposed to pay to the auditor 20 lakh minus 2 lakh, but they have forgotten to deduct TDS. So, what is the, when will the trigger come? Deductible but not deducted. So, here have, it is deductible, but have I deducted? No. So, am I SSE in default? Yes. Right? So, I will be called as, in this example, A limited will be called as SSE in default. Now, how do I avoid that? So, one more provision is there, my dear friends. You can avoid that if the following conditions are satisfied. First, A limited has to go to PJ auditor and say, bro, don't take your income as 18 lakhs. Please take your income as 20 lakhs. Who's the payee here? PJ limited is the PJ limit. PJ, that is uh, auditor firm PJ and company uh, is the pay. I have to go to PJ and say, bro, please take it as 20 lakhs. Okay, bro. Second, tax on that 20 you have to pay. No. In fact, it was supposed to be had to deduct, but you have to pay now. Have you paid tax on 20? Yes. Second, have you filed the return of income? Yes. Then I have to take a certificate from a chartered accountant saying that in form number 26A that all the provisions have been followed properly. Only if all these conditions are met, then my dear friends, deductor is not called SSE in default. 221 and 220 will not come, but Another section will come under 2011A, 1% 1 interest per month from the date of deduction where it is deductible till the date when PJ and company will file the return. So an interest will be there from date of deduction till the date when PJ and company will file the return. Okay. So if you see, that is the thing. So let's take an example to understand again in a better way. This case scenarios 
tax is deducted and paid on 22 to 2022 within the relevant previous year deduction is allowed in 21 22 only because is deducted and paid no problem tax is deducted on 22 to 22 but paid on 12 7 still deduction is allowed in 21 22 because it is paid before the due date paid before the due date miss smiley non resident tax deducted on 22 22 but paid on 11 11 2022 22. guys this is after the due date Hence, it will be not allowed in 21-22, but will be allowed in 22-23. Tax deducted on 14-22 and paid on 34-22. Deduction is allowed in 22-23 because it was deducted and paid only in 22-23. That 14-22 deducted, 34-22. Tax deducted on 14-22 but paid on 34-23 next year. So deduction is allowed when it is actually paid when 23-24. as tax was remitted only in the previous year 23 24 tax was not deducted or remitted at all deduction is not allowed unless conditions to avoid disallowance will be fulfilled this is regarding 40a and 40a 1a and 40a 2 as i told you income tax section a 40a 2 any income tax paid will not be allowed as a deduction and 40a 3 very interesting point any salary payable outside india or to a non resident in india shall be disallowed if tax has not been deducted or paid before the due date the due date for february to uh, april to february will be 7th of the subsequent month if you have not paid if you have not deducted and paid on 7th of the subsequent month permanent disallowance it's not that later you can uh, pay and allow not allowed from the mar- month of march you should pay On or before thirtieth April. So one interesting thing is, if TDS is deposited late, even by one day, salary paid outside India or to a non-resident in India shall not at all be allowed as a deduction. Even if TDS is not deducted but paid by SSC from his own pocket, also salary paid outside India shall not be allowed as a deduction at all. This is what the lawmaker says. Very very interesting point. So, for example, Dhanush is a resident, ten lakh rupees he has to pay due date by Rajini Limited. Ultimately, in all these cases, Rajini Limited has to pay TDS by one eight twenty one, right? That is what. Sorry, not one eight twenty one. They have paid it on one eight twenty one. So, due date was thirty one ten twenty two. Year ended thirty first March twenty two. Due date of the pay is thirty one seven twenty two. Filed by pay even thirty one eight twenty two. The pay has the pay here is Mr. Danush. Danush has filed his return. Though he was supposed to file on thirty one seven twenty two, he has filed his return belatedly on thirty first August twenty two. He has filed it within one thirty nine four. Right. This one thirty nine four of the pay. Is well within one thirty nine one of Rajini. Rajini is the SSC. So these type of questions will come, guys. Right. So when will I not be called SSC in default? I was supposed to deduct the TDS on one eight two thousand twenty one. I have not deducted. Okay. I was supposed to deduct on one eight twenty one. I have not deducted at all. I have given full ten lakhs to Danush. Danush has filed his return belatedly on thirty first August twenty two. Question is belated return under one thirty nine four. Will it still be valid and will it make Rajini not an SSC in default? The answer is yes, because very interestingly, my dear friends, in section two zero one, they have told. You will not be an SSC in default if the pay, who is the pay, Danush, has paid it within section one thirty nine. That is the dialogue. They have not told within section one thirty nine one. They have told within section one thirty nine. One thirty nine includes one thirty nine one also, one thirty nine four also. So very important point. Rajini could have, I mean, Rajini's due date is thirty one ten twenty two, and. Danush should pay not within his due date. Danush should pay within the due date, not under one thirty nine one, 
he should pay within 139 and 139 is belated filing belated filing you can do till december so here he has done on 31822 which is well within the 1391 timeline of rajini well within the 1391 timeline of rajini so this part is allowed no problem So Danush, no disallowance, 2011A, 1% per month I will be charging from 1821 to 31822 till the date when I have already given here, till the date when the payee files the return of income. When did the payee file return of income? 31st August 2022, like that. So this is regarding what? 40A1A, 40A1. Now we will have to go to recovery of expenditure, recovery. If any expenditure is recovered, bad debts we have already seen, but if any expenditure is recovered, will it be taxed or not? Coming to section 41, 41.1a and 41.1b. 41.1b speaks about succession which we have already seen here. We saw 36.1 and 41.1b here already, succession. Here we are talking about 41.1a. 41.1a says there has to be an allowance or a deduction. So guys, this is nothing but recovery of expenditure. If I have made an expenditure today and tomorrow I have recovered it, means people have paid me back. So when I have made an expenditure, I would have debited to PNL account. And when the money is coming back to me, then it will be PNL account credit. So any allowance or deduction, that is a loss or expenditure or a trading liability. Allowance or deduction. What is allowance or deduction? It's either a loss or expenditure under point A, trading liability under point B. Right? And I will receive anything in cash, right? Or any benefit. Either I'll receive any cash or any other form in kind also. And in kind again, it's covered separately, leave it. But here, let us discuss in cash. Cash, if I've received or any benefit if I've received, then it will be deemed to be the profits and chargeable to income tax. Any allowance or deduction? Allowance or deduction means what? There should be a loss, expenditure, trading liability. Loss, expenditure, trading liability. So loss and expenditure can be recovered. See, that is called recovery. So loss and expenditure, if I have debited to my PNL account, if it is recovered tomorrow, that will be taxable. Similarly, if there is any trading liability, it happens to cease or remit, cessation or remission of a trading liability. Remission means what? Accepting lesser fulfillment of the promise. If I have given you a loan of 10 lakhs and uh, charging you 10% per month uh, per annum interest and give you a repayment time of 3 years, what is remission? Same 10 lakhs I will keep. Instead of 10% per annum, I will give you a reduced rate of 7% per annum. Or I will keep the 10% per annum, but I will uh, timeline, if it is three, year, 3 years, I will make it 5 years. Or instead of 10 lakh, I will give you some discount and I will say make it 7 lakh rupees at 10% per annum for 3 years, like that. So, any cash, any benefit. And benefit is what? Cessation or remission of a benefit or recovery of a loss or expenditure. It will be deemed to be profits and it is chargeable to the income tax in that particular year when you receive the amount. So if you see 2018 expense account 2 lakh that is there in the accounts and if it is paid also but what is allowed as per income tax act is 1.1 lakhs assume. In 2021 I have recovered 2 lakh rupees. What will be taxable? Guys how much was debited? 1.1 lakh. How much I am receiving now? 2 lakh. But how much was allowed to be debited before? 1.1. How much am I receiving? 2 lakh. So what is taxable? Only 1.1 lakh because what was debited? Any loss or expenditure has been recovered. What is loss or expenditure? 1.1. How much is recovered? 1.1. Extra 90 lakh is not taxable because I have already not considered it in the debit. There. Right? Yes. Similarly, Cessation or remission of a trading liability means what? Expense account debit 2 lakh to payable account 2 lakh in 2019. In 2022, I will reverse the entry. Payable account 2 lakh to PNL account 2 lakh. This is called cessation of liability. The liability has ceased. 
On the other hand, remission. Remission means what? 2019 expense account 2 lakh to uh, payable account 2 lakh. Allowed is 1.3 lakh. Now what I will do? 1 lakh I will reverse because that fellow, I mean, the I that fellow, I will go to that guy and say, say look boss, 2 lakh. Instead of that, 1.3 lakh, you give a discount. 70,000 only I will pay. If he agrees to that, I will reverse 1 lakh rupees, assume. Out of 2 lakh, what was allowed only was 1.3. In that, I am reversing how much? 1 lakh. So, if I am reversing 1 lakh, that 1 lakh will be taken to be remission. Right? So, first entry is what? Expense to payable 2 lakh, 2 lakh. How much is allowed? 1.3 is allowed. 70 is disallowed, that you leave. How much I am recovering? 1 I am recovering. What was debited to payable account? 1.3. How much I am crediting? 1. So, what is taxable? 1. 1 lakh is taxable, that is called remission. So, cessation and remission, some hidden points. Cessation remission of a time barred debt, barred by the law of limitation, law, barred for, I mean, basically any debt will be barred by the law of limitation if you don't uh, ask for the repayment within three years. So, basically within three years you have to initiate the process of recovery. So, it will be called a time barred debt if it is fully written off, whether unilaterally or not, 41.1. Whether you have written it off, whether unilaterally, not unilaterally, whatever it is, anything written off will be taxable under 41.1. What if it is not taxable? If it is not taxable under 41.1, if it is not written off, if it is not written off under 41.1, uh, if it is not written off earlier in the account, sorry, 41.1, it is not considered as a income. So, for example, if I have a bad debt, I have written off the bad debt, it's a trading liability, let's say, bad debt written off. So today, if it is taken as bad debt, it will go to 41.4. But here I am talking about a time barred debt. And basically, after three years, I have to write off the time barred debt. It no longer exists as a valid contract. So after three years, if I didn't follow up with that person, that I will not get that money, I will write off. Unilaterally, I will write off. Tomorrow, that fellow will come and pay me the money. Yes, that is recovery, 41.1. If I have not at all written off, then 41.1 will not come. Where should I write it off, my dear friends? It should be written off in the accounts. Mind you, it should be written off in the accounts. Purchases to creditors, 2 lakh, 2 lakh. Then creditors to p &L account. So, I, I will write off. Write off means write back, so to speak. So, creditors, 2 lakh to p &L account, 2 lakh. Now, this 2 lakh, when I am reversing, no, that is called writing back or writing off only. It is called in the exam. But it's called write back. So purchase to creditors 2 lakh 2 lakh. Creditors to PNL account 2 lakh 2 lakh. So PNL account is called what? Writing off or writing back in the account. So will this 2 lakh be chargeable to tax? Answer is yes. Sir, I have not uh, written back to PNL account. I have written back to reserves and surplus account. Guys, the lawmaker uses the word it should be written off in the accounts. So, even if it is written back in the reserves and surplus account, important point MCQ, even if it is written back in the reserves and surplus account, it will be taken to be time part. And it is chargeable to tax under 41.1. Waiver of loan. If I have taken a personal loan and waived off, basically somebody has waived off the my personal loan. It is like an income for me. Under 41.1, it will not come because it is not a cessation of a trading liability. It is a personal loan. But under 56.2.10 IFOS, gift taxation, it will be applicable. Similarly, business loan, if it is there, if it is, you know, uh, if I have received any business loan and if I have received a waiver of that loan, that will be a benefit. So, it will be considered as an income trading reset taxable as a benefit under section 28 because 22.24.18 uh, speaks about this thing, any benefit that you have accrued. Similarly, 28.5 also speaks about any benefit accrued. Any benefit received will be taxable under PGBP as a trading benefit. TV Sundaram Mayangar Supreme Court decision. If I have waived off a working capital loan, Generally, there is no entry for working capital loan. What will be the entry? Salary to CC account, purchase to CC account like that. There is no separate entry for taking a loan as such. And tomorrow, if that loan is waived off, I have already debited salary. This is like a payable account which I have to pay to the bank, but now they are waiving this off. Yes, it will be taxable under 41.1. What about waiver of a term loan? 
I have taken a term loan and bought a capital asset. Tomorrow bank is telling no need to pay the term loan. So guys, if that be the case, it is not a trading liability. 411, it will not come. The Steel Authority of India says very clearly that you should subtract from the actual cost. These are very, very important adjustments that I am telling you. And mind you, this is a marathon session. In uh, my regular batch, this only I did for three hours explaining why of each of these things. But now we do not have the time. Just whatever I have written out, you just remember and go. Okay. Yes. Right. This is, you leave, that's fine. Then there are certain things that are only based on payment, guys. All the expenses are allowed, which are given in section 43B purely on payment basis. So certain expenses are allowed as a deduction only when the payment is actually made on or before the due date as per 139.1. So for companies, what is the due date? 31st October. If you are a TP case, 30th November. If you are an individual, 31st July. So all these areas are covered only, expenses are allowed only if it, payment has actually been made under 43 capital B. First one, any tax, duty, cess or fee under any law in force. Any tax, does it include income tax? No, income tax is anyway disallowed under 40A2, 40 small a, small 2. So this tax will not include income tax. It will be any other thing. So we will see that. Then, contribution to any provident fund or superannuation fund or gratuity fund for the welfare of the employees, if you have created, correct, any contribution to them, if it is not paid to the respective fund before the due date of filing the return of income, then it will not be allowed in that particular year. When will it be allowed? It will be allowed in the year in which you have actually made the payment. Then any bonus or commission to employees, any interest on any loan or borrowings from public finance institution, SFC, uh, SIIC, then deposit taking NBFC or systematically important non-deposit taking NBFC in all these cases. Any interest or loan on advance on scheduled bank or cooperative bank, leave encashment, any payment made to Indian Railways. Now, all these things just like that if you read nothing will understand. We should go in depth into each and every item and understand what do you mean by tax, uh, tax what is mean by cess, what is mean by duty and all those things. So clause number A, they have spoken about tax, duty, cess. Income tax is not covered because income tax is already disallowed under 40A2. So, 43B will not at all apply. So, what do you mean by tax here? You can take the example of sales tax. You can take the example of interest on sales tax also. Interest on tax also will be forming part of tax only. This was held in Mewar Motors. Also, GST will be taken into account, GST expense. The journal entry should always be, if for example, there is a 2 lakh rupees sale and GST of 18%, 2 lakh 36,000, what journal entry will you use? Is it bank account 2 lakh 36 to sale 2 lakh to GST payable 36,000? No, it should be bank account 2 lakh 36,000 to sale 2 lakh 36,000, GST expense 36,000 to GST payable 36,000. This GST payable will be allowed to be debited. This GST expense will be allowed to be debited if, if, if payment is made before the due date. GST expense or GST payable for 36,000, 36,000 will be allowed to be debited or rather will be allowed in the tax books only if the payment is made on or before the due date. That is 31st October. Municipal tax, house municipal tax, that is for resident, that not residential building here. Commercial building municipal tax will be taken into account. Duty will include excess duty. Cess will not include secondary and higher education cess because it is already covered where? It is already covered in the tax portion. Whenever I say income tax, it will include cess everything. So when income tax along with everything is anyway disallowed under 40A2, this will not include secondary and higher education says this may include something called as R&D says as per the R&D says act. Then any fee, any statutory fee, any uh, fee that you can think of, any other ROC filing fee, all that will come under this particular fee definition.
Then one more thing was there, if you remember in 43b, interest on borrowing. So as far as interest on borrowing is concerned, that is all clause D, E and F. Loan taken from PFI, State Financial Corporation, SIIC, Scheduled Bank, all the interest when I am repaying, it will be allowed only if it is uh, paid before the due date. Mon personal money lenders, etc. are not caught because anyway they will not allow you to uh, delay so much. They will come with their entire uh, battalion to your house to throw out, throw you out and throw all the stuff in your house. Then cooperative bank, excluding agriculture society, all these things will be taken into account. Deposit taking NBFC, systematically important NBFC, that is total assets more than or equal to 500 rupees, uh, uh, 500 crore in as per the latest audited balance sheet. All that will be taken into account. <laughs> what about interest if it is converted into a loan? Will it be taken as deemed to be repaid or will it be taken as not paid? What do you think? For example, I had a loan of 100 lakhs, interest was 10 lakhs, that 10, 10 lakhs was not paid to the bank only, but it was added to my loan, it became 110 lakhs. Now that extra 10 lakhs, is it deemed to have been paid if it is converted or not? There was a huge issue, many, what do you say, I quote, judgments told that payment will be the payment as on the date of conversion. To overthrow the judgment, explanation 3C, 3D and 3CA were added. They said conversion not deemed to be payment. So to escape this, SSEs used to get interest converted into debentures because it's only uh, had, had loan in the section 43B. That also was removed in Finance Act 22. They added the word debentures also. So guys, as per 3C, 3D and 3CA of section 43B, if you get the interest converted to loan, if you get the interest converted to debentures, it is not deemed to be paid before the due date. So basically disallowance will get attracted. But if I pay the interest portion, is it repayment of loan or is it repayment of interest? So then the government made it very clear, it will be repayment of interest. So if there is a 100 lakh loan on which 10 lakh is the interest 110, tomorrow if I repay let's say 8 of which 6 is towards interest and 2 is towards principal, this 6 though I am repaying the loan here, this 6 will be deemed to be repayment of interest and then in the year in which you pay it, it will be allowed. These are all very very important points. Then we'll do a master chart on employer's contribution to gratuity fund, GF, if and all other funds as well. Any contribution to recognized gratuity fund or approved gratuity fund is covered under 3615 read with 43B. It is allowed only on payment basis. If I make a payment of beyond 20 lakh rupees to an employee from recognized gratuity fund, if the TDS has been deducted, under 40A4, it will be allowed. And under 40A2, small I will allow it only if the TDS has been deducted and paid on time. Else, 30% will be disallowed. And under 43B, TDS is not an expense. Even if you don't pay it within the due date, it's okay. On the other hand, if the TDS has not been deducted at all. And 100% it is disallowed only. Definitely, it is disallowed directly. No 43B because under 40A4 only, it is disallowed. I hope you are understanding, 43B will not come because under 40A4 only it is completely disallowed. Provision made for gratuity under an unapproved fund as already discussed under 40A capital, 40 capital A7 only it is disallowed, hence 43B will never apply. All the gratuity related points I am bringing into this master chart. Provision for gratuity becoming payable in the previous year. 40A7B says no disallowance because it is becoming payable in the previous year. I told you 40A7 unapproved gratuity fund is disallowed. When is it allowed? When it actually becomes payable or if it is approved. Here it is allowed on accrual basis because 43B only speaks about whatever expense you have there which is contribution to any fund. 43B clearly speaks about contribution to Provident Fund, Superannuation Fund, Gratuity Fund or any other fund 
it is not a book entry if i just give it to if i just make a provision for gratuity payable to the employees that is gratuity expense or gratuity payable account not to a fund then 43b will not come because it's just a general entry and not contribution to a fund only if it is transferred to a fund then 43b disallowance this one see recognize gratuity fund only then 43b disallowance will come then setting up formation and contribution to unapproved gratuity fund so if i set up form and contribute to an unapproved gratuity fund as we have already discussed 40a9 there is disallowance 43b will not come at all then as far as provident fund and other welfare funds all this is linked to 43b these are all master chart which you will never find anywhere mind you created by me after hours of research uh, seeing various sections right it will really help you in the examination provident fund other welfare funds employer contribution recognized provident fund or approved fund 3614 plus 43b it will only come on payment basis payment to provident fund to employee less than 5 years guys if i make a payment to that uh, employee for less than 5 years for him it will be taxable if i have deducted tds same as a same as this a 40a4 it is allowed deducted otherwise 30% disallowance same thing if tds is not deducted then it's a problem 40a4 disallowed directly there only it is disallowed under 40a4 concept of 43b will not come concept of 43b will not come 43b will only come if it is a recognized provident fund paid after 5 years recognized pension scheme if i pay less than or equal to 10% of salary there is basic plus da 3614a red with 43b payment basis there is more than 10% anyway it is excess is disallowed anyway in a recognized pension scheme they have clearly told only up to 10% is allowed if it is more than 10% anyway it's disallowed and it's anyway disallowed 43b issue only will not come employees contribution on the other hand guys is always read as an income under 22410 an expense is allowed 3614a if credited to the fund on or before the due date so this is employees contribution as i told you from the employee they will remove no that portion will be treated as an income so from salary if i pay 10 lakh 1 lakh will be taken out and given as an employee contribution so that 1 lakh will be treated as an income because there is a corresponding 1 lakh also paid it should be credited to the fund on or before the due date what do you mean by the due date here is it the return of income due date or payment as per relevant laws it went to various cases and eventually they said it is payment as per the relevant laws and not the return of income date so if deposited one day late also let's say as per the relevant law it is supposed to be 7th of the next month even if i deposit one day late eighth if i deposit then permanent disallowance permanent disallowance grace days are definitely not allowed no grace days are allowed every anywhere absolutely not allowed so that completes the discussion on 43b now what is left is scientific research 35 then specified business 35 ad and other miscellaneous provisions presumptive taxation and all those things so that we will eventually do so my dear friends let's get back to now expenditure on scientific research so we were doing pgbp and other areas were pending so we will finish off pgbp uh, in this session so scientific research means what activities for the extension of knowledge in the fields of natural or applied sciences my dear friends earlier there were used to be different different uh, percentages of deductions so basically in order to uh, support Uh, indian companies and companies from what do you say you are investing more and more in scientific research there are many areas one part of it is in house research second part of it is uh, donation to a company which is doing scientific research third one is statistical research etc so the entire section is divided into three parts so basically the entire section can be divided into one is donation second one is what happens if the scientific research asset is already sold off somewhere what to do as far as donation is concerned that can be divided into three parts one is in house research so if a company wants to invest money for their own research so will that be uh, taken into account that is one second part of the story is 
uh, what if the company wants to donate to some other company which is into biotech or which is into manufacturing and the third one is other areas if i simply want to donate to other statistical research indian institute of sciences indian institute of technology in all these cases what will happen so let's do one by one first one is the deduction expenditure incurred by the SSC for own business it is coming in 3511 and 3514 no need to remember the section number whatsoever now in house research divided into two parts here again one is research prior to three years of commencement of business one more is research during business research prior to three years of commencement of business is what one is revenue expenditure one is capital expenditure so revenue expenditure you have purchase of raw material 100% deduction salary to employees 100% deduction and others no deduction mind you guys these are all revenue expenditure apart from purchase of raw material and apart from salary to employees nothing is allowed until the business is commenced so anything prior three years to the commencement of business revenue expenditure what all is allowed only you have a purchase of raw material then you have salary to employees 100% deduction others absolutely no deduction on the other hand capex capital expenditure mind you on land there is absolutely no deduction on land no deduction on land and other cases all others will be all other revenue expenditure will be allowed uh, anyway we will see that later but revenue expenditure here uh, i am talking about you know after the research commences okay after the research commences but here we are only talking about capital expenditure okay capital expenditure land no deduction other capital expenditure my dear friends 100% deduction you will get so very simple research prior to 3 years of commencement of business what all revenue expenditure you will get only two things purchase of raw material second one salary to employees full 100% deduction you will get sir will you get, get before the commencement only no it is only allowed from the year of commencement but the expenses you can take prior so if uh, purchase of raw material was 10 crore salary to employees was 5 crore other admin expenses was 2 crore this admin expenses are never allowed these two 15 crores is fully allowed 100 percent deduction but when is it allowed is it allowed previously two years ago only no it is allowed from the year when you commence the business okay on the other hand capital expenses you have bought land three years ago will it be allowed no you bought land one year ago is it allowed no will you uh, you have bought plant and machinery is it allowed yes all capital expenditure except land because land is a non-depreciable asset either way depreciation is not allowed anyway so here also in scientific research once the entire capital expenditure is allowed to be debited to PNL account there is no depreciation land on the other hand anyway it is not allowed depreciation is not allowed on land anyway hence on land also there would absolutely be no deduction capital expenditure land no deduction others 100 percent deduction research during the business my dear friends during the business revenue expenditure you have 100 percent deduction and capital expenditure on land there is no deduction again on others 100 percent deduction my dear friends important to know research during the business you will get deduction for raw material also you will get deduction for salary to employees also and you will get deduction for everything and everything that is related to the business all revenue expenditure will be allowed as usual but capex again land is not allowed so it's interesting to note that this is the same here only thing that changes research prior to three years before and also during business would be the revenue expenditure and research prior to three years of commencement of business when will you get the deduction allowed as the deduction when in the year of commencement in the year of commencement very very simple so if you see where an SSC commences business on 28 11 2020 then all the scientific research related revenue and capex incurred on or after 28 11 2020 as discussed above shall be allowed as deduction further any such expenditure from 28 11 17 to 27 11 2020 beginning three years immediately preceding shall also be allowed as deduction from the year in which the business commences that is in the financial year 2021 salary does not include perquisite capital expenditure includes expenses incurred on acquisition of plant and machinery construction of building acquisition of vehicle anything but it should be used for mind you scientific research if it's used for personal purposes no it should be used for scientific 
research. Now that is one thing. Then eventually the other companies, initially they were only into biotech and chemical production, but other companies also told we are also manufacturing many, many things and I am into specified business. For me also I need deduction. So what they did was they made a separate section 352AB where they said 100% deduction in relation to scientific research and expenditure which is revenue in nature and 100% deduction in relation to capital assets except here it's interesting to know under 352AB for specified business land and building both are not allowed. Plant and machinery will be allowed, land and building will not be allowed. So what are the conditions here? Here SSE should be a company. For other than companies they can go here. Here it is for all SSEs mind you. These are the minute differences. For all SSEs 3511. For company SSE specified business 352AB. So what should be the specified business? Deduction in case of company, in the case of biotech or earlier it used to be chemicals and petroleum etc. Now what have they done? Everybody is allowed in this. Manufacture of production of any article or thing other than 11th schedule. 11th schedule will have alcohol, then Ajay Devgan, Polo Zuba Kesri, tobacco, all those things. So Ajay Devgan and all. If you manufacture uh, Vimal Pan Masala, you, can you take 35 AB? No. Research in the way to spit on your face. All that is not allowed. Right? Yes. So, manufacture or production of any article or thing other than those specified in Ellen schedule. All PJs I am delivering. Amazing PJs. Here, smile. If you don't smile, also cringe and then forget about it. Okay? Yes. As I told you earlier, there were 150% all given guys. Now, nothing. It's just 100%. In case of contribution to outside, see one part was what? In-house research. In in-house research, what is allowed? Revenue expenditure before three years and after three years, everything is allowed. Before three years, only two things are allowed, plant and missionary, salary. Capital expenditure, whether it is before or after, land is anyway not allowed, others are allowed. But in 35-2AB, it is only for specified business and only for companies. And what is specified business? Biotech or any manufacturer. 100% is allowed, revenue, everything is allowed, capex. Only acquisition of land and building. Correct? Yes, that's about it. Now, I, I am not a scientific research company. I don't do any scientific research, but I contribute to outside agencies. Can I do that? Yes. Whether you contribute to any research, whether I contribute to scientific research, whether I contribute to social science or statistical research, or whether I contribute to any national lab, university, Indian Institute of Technology, whatever I want, all the cases... 100% deduction I will get. University, college, anything. And guys, I need to, for these things, for research association, etc., I will have to prepare a statement under 10BD and furnish a certificate also under 10BE. Now, in MCQ, they can ask you, if I don't furnish this statement, what will happen? Now, if I don't furnish this statement, my dear friends, two other things will come. Though it should be taught in penalty, I always believe in not section-wise analysis, just like our law, cluster wise analysis. So here we are doing the cluster of scientific research and everything related to scientific research. So that has to be discussed in entirety. So if you do not file the certificate or statement as discussed, 200 rupees per day to the extent of donation you have to pay. And if there's any failure to furnish proper statement, 10,000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees is your amount that you need to pay. So this is regarding the scientific research as such. Apart from that, uh, they can ask you a question where I have a composite arrangement where land and building both are taken into account. So basically I have, uh, what do you say, purchased both land and building. This is for example in uh, 35.1.1 only, land and building to the tune of 10 crore. What do I do? I should remove the land portion. How will I remove land portion? Purely by valuation. So I should get a valuation done and remove the portion of land there. Very simple. Today I have donated 3 crore to an organization which has been notified, uh, what do you say, recognized. By the end of the year, when I am about to claim the deduction, that recognition given to that institution has been withdrawn. Will I get deduction? So there has been an explanation to 3513 which says, SSE shall not be denied the deduction if the approval is granted, which has been withdrawn at a later stage. And obviously, once you get a 100% deduction under 35, there is no depreciation deduction that you will be getting for sure. 
unabsorbed capital expenditure under this section will be treated the same way the anything unabsorbed capex so basically the profit of the company research organization was around you know uh, 2 2 crore what excuse me but the unabsorbed capital expenditure is four, i mean basically capital expenditure is 4 crore profit is 2 crore capex is 4 crore what is the absorbed portion 2 crore can be absorbed remaining 2 crore cannot be absorbed that unabsorbed capex is the same treatment as unabsorbed depreciation it will be carried forward indefinitely indefinitely as far as amalgamation is concerned the new company amalgamated company can avail the deduction that's what it is now what about uh, astrazeneca astrazeneca uh, came up with the covid vaccine uh, bharat biotech came up with covaxin all these cases there would be some clinical drug trials before the uh, entire vaccination obviously there were a lot of drug trials so for drug and pharma companies expenditure on scientific research shall include clinical drug trials as well as well now they can ask you one additional thing in this is when you sell the asset what will happen when you sell the asset what will happen selling of a scientific research asset this is what is going to happen guys check it out if it is sold from the lab three things i can envision one i will sell from the lab directly second i will use it in the business and then sell it off third one it was used earlier in the business and now it is shifted to scientific research three things can happen one the scientific research i said from the lab only i will sell it second from the scientific research i will first use it in the business and then i will sell it off third one it was actually reverse case it was actually used in business now i am bringing it into scientific research everything is covered here if it is sold from the lab directly 413 will apply 413 that is deem profit what is the capital gains if the sale price is more than the cost of the scientific research asset then the additional balance will be the capital gain this is as per the artex manufacturing case law for instance if the scientific research asset was 10 crore full deduction is taken 10 crore it is sold for 14 crore now it is sold for 14 crore now hence that 14 crore minus 10 crore 4 crore will now be capital gain will now be capital gain on the other hand how much would be pgbp how much would be pgbp pgbp is very simple the selling price minus unamortized depreciation or unamortized cost selling price minus unamortized cost or deduction under section 35 whichever is less so my dear friends here there is nothing called unamortized here for scientific research though the formula says so there is nothing for scientific research here why because in pgbp full amount anyway is taken as deduction so is there any portion which is not left to be amortized no so in my example what did i tell you the scientific research asset was 10 crore how much did it sell it for 14 crore so 14 minus 10 4 crore is capital gain fair enough what will be pgbp see 10 crore is already debited 14 crore is credited in that 14 crore only 4 crore i am charging to tax as capital gain what about pgbp income pgbp income will be what selling price 14 crore or deduction under 3514 what is the deduction under 3514 deduction under 3514 is 10 crore correct already taken deduction is 10 crore so selling price 14 crore or deduction 10 crore whichever is less 14 or 10 whichever is less so which is less 14 sorry 10 which is less 10 so what is the pgbp income 10 for scientific research the unamortized portion will be nil obviously so very simple guys debited will be 10 crore forget about it next when it is 14 crore is credited at 14 crore is taxed into two heads 4 crore is taxed as capital gain remaining 10 crore is taxed as pgbp it is used in the business and then sold when it is brought into the business explanation 1 to 431 will come when it is brought into the business explanation 1 to 431 will come actual cost or deduction allowed 
basically when it's bringing into business what is actual cost of the asset should be taken minus deduction actually allowed come on guys scientific research expenditure 100 percent reduction is allowed so what will be the actual cost 10 crore minus reduction allowed 10 crore what is the cost value nil so though physically the asset is added to the block what is the value of the asset added zero should be taken as zero now it is used in the business, it is forming part of the block. Then when the block only is sold, asset is sold as forming uh, as part of the block or when the asset is sold separately, then the normal WDV block concept will come. 43, 6 and section 50, if selling price of the asset is more than WDV of the block, right? So basically that asset was added at nil. So tomorrow all assets were sold off and this was the only asset remaining. And the value of the block was, let's say, uh, 12, 12, uh, 12, 12 crore or something. All put together, all assets were there. Uh, all assets got sold, only this was the solitary asset remaining. This asset also they sold. The moment they sold this asset for, let's say, 13 crore, the difference, that is, selling price is 13 crore, WDV is 12 crore. Difference 1 crore will be section 50 STCG, short term capital gain. This we have seen in depreciation already. But if it was used earlier in the business, some asset was used in the business, after 4-5 or five years it is brought into scientific research, then uh, what the law was silent regarding that, but you have a case law Sundaram Fasteners. In Sundaram Fasteners they have told it will be WDV at the time of transfer as if, if it was, you know, what do you say, the WDV at the time of transfer into the business will be taken into account. Had an asset worth 5 crore, it was used for 3-4 years. And the WDV of that asset as of today is 3 crore. 5 crore asset, 2 crore depreciation, 3 crore is the WDV as on today. 3 crore is transferred to business to do the business today. What I mean from the business it is to transfer to scientific research, right? So I'll again give an example so that it's clear for you. Hold on. So what did I say? 5 crore was the asset which was bought, let's say, in 2018. As of 2023, the WDV is 3 crore, depreciation is 2 crore. Now, this was used in business. Now, this one you are bringing into scientific research. So, at what rate should I take a scientific research? Because in scientific research, I have to give a deduction under 35. Will I give a deduction of full 5 crore or will I give a deduction of 3 crore was the question. Sundaram Fasana said, sir, this 2 crore you have already taken depreciation, it's already debited to PNL account. Technically speaking, I cannot allow you to take 5 crore deduction again because 2 crore you have already taken. So, logical conclusion is what? I have to take the remaining 3 crore as a deduction. Which means, what is my scientific research expenditure? to be taken at the debit to the PNL account would be 3 CR. Original cost minus depreciation. That is what it says. WDV at the time of transfer is claimed as depreciation. 3514. So, the selling of an asset, right? Here, next what they will ask is, whether it is your telecommunication license under 35 ABA or whether it is a telecom operation of telecom license under 35 ABB, they will ask you what would be the, what is the nature of expenditure? It should be a capital expenditure incurred for taking a right under 35 ABA. Under 35 ABB also capital expenditure for acquiring the telecom license and services. So, in this case, fee which is paid before commencement of business. What is the amount that is, you know, deductible? Expenditure is allowed beginning with the previous year in which such business commences till the previous year in which such spectrum right expires. And fee is paid after the commencement of business. Then it is allowed beginning with the previous year in which the spectrum fee is actually paid till such previous year in which spectrum right expires. Same here also. Let's take an example. And what will happen to the, when I sell off that right? What will happen when I sell off the right? 
एम लिमिटेड परचेज अ टेली कम्युनिकेशन लाइसेंस फॉर टेन लैख रुपीज लाइफ वॉज टेन इयर्स आफ्टर कमेंसिंग इट्स बिजनेस पेमेंट फॉर द सेम वॉज मेड एज फॉलोज टू लैख रुपीज अप फ्रंट पेमेंट फाइव लैख रुपीज इन द फोर्थ इयर थ्री लैख रुपीज इन द नाइन्थ इयर सो वॉट आर दिलिंग इयर पे फी फॉर राइट इज पेड बिफोर कमेंसमेंट ऑफ बिजनेस एंड आफ्टर कमेंसमेंट ऑफ बिजनेस हाउ मच विल इट बी previous year in which the spectrum fee is actually paid till such year in which the license expires so upfront payment how many years remain 10 years so this will be amortized over 10 years 5 lakh was bought in the fourth year so this will be amortized over remaining 6 years 3 lakh that is be beginning from the year in which the spectrum fee is actually paid fourth year In the remaining time, three lakh was done in the ninth year. So how many years will you get? Ninth and tenth year. So in this case, two lakh will be amortized over ten years. Five lakh will be amortized from fourth year onwards, and three lakh will be amortized over ninth and tenth year. so sale of right or sale of license when entire right or license is transferred right when entire right or license is transferred when sale proceeds is less than the unamortized amount when the sale proceeds is less than the unamortized amount balance shall be allowed as a year in the deduction in the year of transfer right so let's say there was a license of 10 crore to be done over 5 years every year 2 crore 2 years are over what is the amortized amount 4 crore what is the unamortized amount still 6 crore now it is sold for 3 crore this entire license is sold for 3 crore now you see sale proceeds 3 crore is less than the unamortized amount 6 crore what to do balance shall be allowed as a reduction in the year of transfer i was supposed to debit 6 crore in that i have recovered 3 crore so what is the balance 3 crore this is debited in the year of transfer when sale proceeds is more than the unamortized amount what is the unamortized amount 6 what is the sale proceeds assume sale proceeds would be 8 least of the following shall be chargeable to income business year one sale price minus unamortized amount or deduction allowed till date under this section what is the sale price 8 what is the unamortized amount 6 what is the balance 2 Balance is two, or deduction allowed under this section six, whichever is less. Deduction allowed under this section till date. Sorry, four. Unamortized is six, right? Four is already allowed here. I told you in ten years, two years already allowed four crore. So what will I do here? Sale price minus unamortized amount. Sale price is six crore minus unamortized amount is. 4 crore what is the balance 2 crore basically they are trying to tell if i had not sold at all i would have fully debited 6 crore over the next 3 years but since i have recovered 4 crore now out of it remaining 2 crore i will debit either i will do this or whatever deduction is allowed till that 4 crore whichever is less will be allowed to be debited here obviously it will be 2 crore suppose this instead of 8 crore they sold it at 12 crore mind you 12 crore is more than the cost of the license only 10 crore so the balance 12 crore minus 10 crore capital gains will arise on transfer of right only when sale price is more than the cost of acquisition 12 minus 10 this is what we need to keep in mind similarly if part amount is uh, part license is uh, you know 
transferred same calculation you will do but the balance will be allowed not in that year balance will be allowed in the num remaining number of years in equal installment so in this example balance was 3 crore no same example here if part of the license was sold this 3 crore will be over remaining life of the asset so in my example 2 years only I had claimed the deduction I still had 3 years to go so 3 years I will get 3 crore divided by 3 1 1 crore every year I will get it's the only difference between part license sold and full license sold got it guys same calculation for 35 ABA and 35 ABB same any anyway, with example also is the same thing here So that is with respect to scientific research expenditure, 35 ABB, ABA and all those things. So let's move on my dear friends to reduction of capital expenditure on specified business. So guys, this is regarding specified business. There are only a few set of specified businesses with which you will get deduction. Mind you, the deduction here is purely on capital expenditure and not revenue expenditure. This is available to any SSE. And what is the amount allowed? Any amount that is debited to the PL account with respect to the capital expenditure. Mind you, availing of reduction under 35 AD is optional. It is not mandatory. So if you don't want to do that, no problem. Because if you opt for 35 AD, then you will not get depreciation under section 32. So if you would rather uh, claim depreciation etc and go with a uh, reduced tax rate under 115 BAC and BA, uh, B etc then in that case no need uh, you know BA and BAB then there is no need for you to go under 35 AD hence it is optional and deduction allowed would be 100% in respect of any capital expenditure incurred by an SSE during the previous year for specified business subject to the fulfillment of certain conditions expenditure which was incurred prior to commencement of specified business yes that also will be taken into account shall be allowed in the year of commencement of such business provided the amount would be capitalized in the books of account so in your books of accounts if you have capitalized that amount which means what <coughs> if it's a capital expenditure then in the tax books the entire amount will be allowed in the allowed in the year in which the business is commenced so this will take care of all the uh, capex just before the business and also after the business can be debited to the P&L account my dear friends. Now <clears throat> the important thing here is what will come under specified business. So, so we should remember things which are coming under specified business. First and foremost setting up and operating a cold chain facility. So remember cold chain facility then warehousing facility for agricultural produce. Agricultural produce can be anything guys it can be your uh, bark of the trees, it can be fruits, vegetables, it can be B also that is forest produce from B but though B raising is uh, you know written separately earlier before that law came agricultural produce included that as well everything the byproducts also would be included but generally it did not include sugarcane because sugarcane is just a byproduct of the sh uh, sh sugar sorry sugar is a byproduct of sugarcane so though uh, growing of sugarcane is allowed under agricultural produce manufacture of sugar was not in uh, you know there in agricultural produce because manufacture of sugar is a byproduct of the agricultural produce so there was a lot of confusion some people said it's included some people said it's excluded that's why separately to clear confusion they have also added setting up and operating a warehousing facility for storage of sugar then <clears throat> hospital with at least 100 beds if you are constructing building and operating yes Developing of a housing project under affordable housing scheme, yes, there also. Producing the fertilization, uh, fertilizers in India because of the organic farming, organic manure, fertilizers also have taken a huge, you know, step forward, a flip it has been given by the thing, India, by the lawmaker. Laying and operating a cross country, either it's a natural gas, crude oil, petroleum oil pipeline, all these things also will be part of the same thing. Building and operating anywhere in India, my dear friends, a hotel, two-star category or above. Then housing project for slum re redevelopment, inland container depot and yes, see, beekeeping and production of honey and bee wax. Earlier it was part of agricultural produce because of various cases which did not allow, separately they have given here. And in all your uh, calculators, mobiles, etc., they use this, uh, you know, semiconductor water fabrication chip. 
so manufacture of that chip also to buttress the make in india campaign yes and then the political insertion whereby earlier it was only for these companies but then adani ambani all these fellows also came and told bro even we want hence and also your income based <coughs> profit based deductions under atia ab all these things were getting exhausted so predominantly 35 ad generally you know if you see let me just put up my ca final regular batches uh, workbook this workbook is like a one stop shop all the charts are there in this so incentives is what i'll make you do in class in my regular batch so incentives investment linked incentives 35 add see in regular batch will sit and do all the bear act analysis here in marathon it is not possible guys okay so investment linked analysis investment linked uh, incentive is 35 add ad sorry whereas in profit linked incentive will be atia atid atie all these things so investment linked incentive uh, 35 ad capital expenditure fully allowed under section 35 ad land is not covered goodwill is not covered financial instrument is not covered and any capital expenditure more than 10000 rupees cash in a day to a person in a day that is not covered revenue expenditure everything will ave be covered under 3237 so 35 ad will not come my dear friends because everything is already covered under 3237 got it so as i told you uh conditions would be of course some of the conditions are what it should be a new business and it should not be set up due to splitting up or reconstruction of business so if for example uh, itc hives of to create itc agricultural products for example of course they have each or all where lot of uh, farming activities are being done so if that portion is hived off then you cannot say it is done due to setting up or reconstruction uh, and 35d will not be applicable for the same cannot be an asset which is transferred from non specified business to specified asset so basically guys you cannot create or you ca will not get a deduction for old assets you will only get deduction for new assets not for old assets only for new assets you will be getting so what are the businesses these are the businesses that i was talking about uh for the new asset which means you have to invest money and buy an own asset only then you will get the uh, deduction cold chain facility includes storage of transportation of agriculture and forest produce what about meat and meat products yes what about dairy products yes marine yes everything will come laying and operating a cross country pipeline will also be uh, should be owned by an indian company so foreign company is not allowed or it can be a consortium of indian companies as well now infrastructure facility as i told you the last point which was actually inserted because of political pressure or rather business capitalistic pressure on politics so to speak so there it is what road including toll road bridge to rail system highway project including housing water supply project water treatment system irrigation system sanitation sewerage waste management etc and port airport inland waterway and all these things the benefit of 35 ad shall be extended to infrastructure facility business it is owned by a company consortium of companies board corporation same it's state government owned or central government owned or jointly owned it will be given for sure now if i cannot if i set up a two star hotel but i cannot maintain it and i subsequently transfer it to somebody else without divesting the ownership i will hold the ownership but management portion i will give it to somebody else then also it will be deemed that i am carrying on the specified uh, business and hence it will be allowed for deduction and as i told you land is not covered goodwill is not covered financial instrument is not covered capital expenditure except this and guys we had seen any payment more than 10000 rupees to a person in a day if it is revenue expenditure disallowed under 43 if it is capital expenditure it is reduced from the actual cost under 431 if it is a capital expenditure of scientific business that also is not allowed under 35 ad so these three things we have to keep in mind right so as i told you coming back to our uh, chart yes it should be new business should not be set up due to splitting up pre construction etc of an old business cannot be an asset which is transferred from non specified business to specified business should be a new asset but there are two exceptions to the new asset concept exception number 1 35 ad 8d it says old asset will be deemed to be a new asset if first of all should not have been used in india previously second it should be imported from abroad third one depreciation under income tax act should never have been allowed before so guys 
even if it's an old asset but if it's imported from outside india then it will be taken as a new asset here logic i've discussed in regular batch here i don't have time i'm sorry next should not have been used in india previously guys one difference between this and additional depreciation section 3212a in additional depreciation you will get you will not get additional depreciation even if the machinery is imported from abroad even if it's a used machinery from abroad never used in india still you will not get deduction but in this particular section you will get deduction if it is used if it was previously used abroad but imported into india exception number 2 35 ad 8c even if old asset is transferred to specified business it is allowed even if i have an old business and from there i have transferred it here it is allowed however the value of the plant which has been transferred must be less than or equal to 20 percent of the plant and missionary block of specified business so basically uh, some other uh, place i am using the machinery 20 crore worth here there is already a asset worth 190 crore okay in specified business i have already bought 90 crore and some asset i am using somewhere else i am bringing into specified business so when it when i bring it into specified business 20 crore plus 90 crore will become 110 crore now 20 crore divided by 110 crore what is the scene 20 crore divided by 110 crore is definitely less than 20 percent hence what will happen even if the old asset is transferred to specified business no problem it will be deemed to be a new asset is what this section is telling okay so let's come back to our notes same thing usage of asset yes cool let's do it here only yeah moving on what is the treatment of 35 ad asset very very important normal case the 35 ad asset is retained for eight years logic i have discussed in depth in regular batch why eight years and also the fast track premium batch here no time sorry so retain just remember this is a revision you already know you already would have studied so it's just revision so normal case retained for eight years 35 ad 7a it is retained for eight years special case what will happen it is sold or transferred before eight years so as per 35 ad it says if it is held for eight years then no problem but if it is held for less than eight years then some other treatment one you sell it after eight years what happens second one you sell it before eight years what happens all this can be given in the exam question anything they can ask if it is retained for eight years my dear friends and then it is sold if it is sold as a slum sale since you have already taken the full uh, amount as a debit to the p and l account in a slum sale under section 50b while computing the net worth 35 ad will be taken as nil in other cases it is not transferred as slum sale it is transferred normally still explanation 13 to 43 1 you will still take it as nil because you have taken the full deduction in the pgp and l account and eight years are over eight years are over you have taken the full deduction in the PL account slum sale it will not be taken in net worth calculation normal sale if you do also if you add it to the block it will be taken as nil the real issue arises if you sell it off before eight years if you sell it off before eight years you are not following the condition not following the condition means what now you will have to pay tax on that now two conditions there if the asset is demolished scrapped transferred or destroyed general rule if the asset is transferred we saw in telecom license we saw in uh, scientific research equipment an asset is worth 10 crore sold for 12 crore 12 minus 10 2 crore will be capital gain remember in scientific research telecom license and all those things 35 a b uh, 35 sorry 35 a b a and all those sections a b b and all those sections but here different different treatment but it's demolished scrapped transferred and destroyed no capital gain even if selling price is more than the cost of 35 ad asset it's a big 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 departure from the usual practice logic i've discussed in the class so year 28 7 full amount will be pgbp my dear friends full amount will be pgbp full amount will be pgbp so uh asset worth 10 crore is used for uh, for uh, my 35 ad specified business 
I used it only for five years and sold off the entire asset for 12 CR. What is PGBP? Full 12 CR is PGBP. Other cases, asset is used. In the first case, what happens? Before eight years, it is demolished, scrapped, sold off, destroyed. Second is what? It is not demolished, it is not scrapped, it is not transferred, it is not destroyed. What is it? What do you do? You use it for non-specified business. So from cold chain facility, you will go for manufacture of paper that is not covered in that. For from cold storage facility, cold storage facility, you will transfer to your factory where you manufacture food. Any food you manufacture, you manufacture some juice, etc. You need uh, that cold storage facility to store your what do you say? fruits. So, you transfer it off there, non-specified business. Then, my dear friends, basically my own business. So, when I am removing it, 3587B says, I should take the actual cost minus depreciation from the beginning when it was brought. For example, if I bought and brought an asset for 100 crore, I did not use it for 8 years. I used it for 6 years and then converted it to non-specified business. So, I should take 100 crore minus depreciation for 6 years I should take. And whatever balance I get, that amount, since I am being used, that amount will be now PGBP. That amount will be PGBP, I have to pay tax as PGBP. So, basically I had fully debited 100 crore. Now, what I should do? 100 minus, let us say the depreciation is 70 crore. 100 minus 70, 30 crore will be my PGBP because 100 crore I have already debited but as of today the value is 70 crore. So, only 70 crore is allowed. Remaining 30 crore which was already debited before will be credited to the p account. That is the logic. On the other hand, when I am now bringing it into my non-specified business, I told you I am into some fruit punch and some fruit jam etc. manufacturing. When I am bringing that asset into this, what rate will I record? Yes, I will record at the same rate 30 crore because I have paid tax on 30 crore. I will bring it into my asset as 30 crore and chapter close. That is about it. Very, very important point. Very, very important point. If they ask you, when I am calculating this depreciation, when I am calculating this depreciation, let us assume I have 100 crore asset. First year I will deduct 10, just example I am doing, 90, next year I will deduct 10, just an example, sorry, next year I will deduct 9, 81, next year I will deduct 8.1, 10% assume, just an example. Now, this is, let us say, after this, some 74, 73 point something, now. Should I take this 73 as my PGBP? Yes. Will this be my actual cost also? Yes. So, guys, depreciation I should charge. Assuming it is new machinery. Now, interesting part. If it is if it is see producing fertilizers production of honey wax setting up fabrication manufacturing unit if they ask these three things my dear friends and they sell they tell you that for these three businesses beekeeping then that semi fabrication unit and also your fertilizer production if they tell you and after three years it is sold off if they tell you this will be the wrong answer because since it is manufacture mind you you and assuming it's a new asset you also should give 20 additional depreciation here. This can be a very important MCQ question. So, it should be 100 minus 10 minus 20, 70 minus 7, 
63 minus 6.3, 56, 57. That will be the answer and not 73. Why? Because the law says you should take the actual cost minus depreciation which you actually would have allowed if this was not to be a 35D asset. What would you have allowed if it was normal missionary? I will uh, uh, allow new dip, uh, old, uh, normal depreciation and additional depreciation. Think about it. Fist pump, come on. Yes, awesome. Got it, guys. Income tax, di direct tax, very easy, guys. You just have to structure it in a beautiful way. That's all there is. Like this, if you neatly structure, nothing will happen. Since it's a marathon, everything I cannot do, guys. Whatever, no, I can do to the best possible extent, we'll do. So, for example, PJ Hotels has a loss of 8 crore. Then, PJ Classes, non-specified business, has a profit of 5 crore. Can the loss of 8 crore be set off against profit of non-specified business, not possible as per 73 capital A? Next, PJ Hotels, profit of 5 crore. PJ Beekeeping, loss of 3 crore. Can a specified business loss be set off against specified business income? Yes. Third one, PJ Hotels, specified business profit of 4 crore. PJ classes, not specified business, loss of 2 crore. Can a profit of specified business be set off against the loss of non-specified business? It is not at all prohibited by section 73A, hence it is possible. What does 73A say? Specified business loss to be set off only against specified business profits. Nowhere it says specified business profits cannot be set off against non-specified business loss. Nowhere it says. So, hence it can be set off absolutely no problem. It can be set off. So, that's about it. All these are normal skill development, agriculture extension, these are all normal stuff guys, we will not waste time doing all that. Now let us come to maintenance of accounts. I just put it up one second. Yes, guys, I opened the slide which spoke about 44AA. Okay, guys, maintenance of accounts. Okay, first one, specified person and non-specified person. Who is a specified person? He should be in the list as per B59 in my page number. What is the list? Medical, legal, film artist, accountancy, engineering, technical consultancy, company secretary, architecture, interior decorate. This should be the specified person. What are specified books? Specified books will be cash book, ledger, journal, copies of bill, original bills for expenses exceeding 50 and all those things. Limit, gross receipts greater than 150,000 in all three previous financial years. Greater than 150,000, greater than 150,000 in all the three preceding financial years this will come. Then we have non-specified business, individual or HUF and others. Individual or HUF income, if it is more than 2,50,000 or gross receipts more than 25 lakh at least in one out of three preceding previous years, they should maintain the books of accounts. Again, guys, individual HUF income greater than 2,50,000 or not and or, or gross receipts or turnover more than 25 lakh rupees in at least one out of three preceding previous years. Others company, AOP, BOI, firm, etc., LLP, income greater than 1,20,000 or gross receipts or turnover greater than 10 lakh rupees. At least one out of three preceding previous years. At least one out of three preceding previous years. Only then they have to maintain the accounts. When 44AB will come, that is your tax audit. <coughs> tax audit. Business, turnover greater than 1 crore. Any business greater than 1 crore, they have to go for tax audit, but that 1 crore can be increased to 10 crore if two conditions are satisfied, which means the threshold limit from 1 crore will be increased to 
टेन क्रोर इफ टू कंडीशन आर सैटिस्फाइड फर्स्ट कंडीशन कैश रेसिट लेस देन और इक्वल टू फाइव पर्सेंट ऑफ द टोटल रेसिट एंड कैश पेमेंट लेस देन और इक्वल टू फाइव पर्सेंट ऑफ द टोटल पेमेंट so if cash receipts must be less than or equal to 5% of the total receipts and cash payment less than or equal to 5% of total payments and then as far as profession is concerned gross receipts if it's more than 50 lakh rupees no cash receipt or payment condition just gross receipt should be more than 50 lakh that be the case then this tax audit will come into the picture tax audit will come into the picture then there is an amendment in 23 that is not relevant for you that we can leave so guys as i was telling you payment to a single person in a day more than 10000 in cash capital expenditure 431 reduced from actual cost revenue expenditure 483 disallowed and then capital expenditure 35 ad also will not be allowed so that was the scene so that is regarding uh, simple provisions of tax audit and books of account so to speak now coming to the presumptive taxation presumptive taxation 44 ad So guys, a resident individual or resident HUF or resident firm, but not a LLP, LLP, but not a LLP. So for, there are three sections for presumptive taxation for generally for uh, residents, and one is also including non-resident. There, forty-four AD is for small business, forty-four ADA is for profession. And 44 AE is for plying of goods carriages. Okay. Apart from that, we also have uh, 44 B, 44 BB, and all those things, which we'll see shortly. So 44 AD, ADA. How does it work? So 44 eligible SSC, a resident individual or resident HUF or resident firm, but not a LLP. This is applicable to resident individual, resident HUF, resident firm. Generally, in the Act, wherever I use the verb firm. even llp is included but here specifically they have excluded llp and you should ha have a eligible business what is eligible uh, business basically eligible ssc you should be any business other than 44a any business other than 44a will be eligible business right <coughs> so here guys any business whose gross receipts or gross turnover from such business does not exceed 1 2 crore rupees so basically this is for small businesses where the turnover is less than or equal to 2 crore so a specified percentage of gross receipt shall be deemed to be the income from such business what is specified percentage very simple if it is received from account pay check whatever amount that you are receiving should be from account pay check account pay bank draft Electronic clearing system, NEFT, BIM, UPI, etc. Then six percent. Other cases, eight percent. So, if my turnover is let's say one point five crore, of which one point four crore I have received through bank, for that six percent minimum, remaining ten lakh rupees, eight percent minimum. You have to offer. You can offer more also if you want, but you cannot offer less. The SSC can claim a higher income than specified. If he is declaring a lower income, then he has to maintain books of accounts as per 44A and get them audited under 44AB. 44AD shall not apply to agency business and 44A, that is your doctor, CA, engineer, because for him 44ADA will apply. And any uh, commission business, if you are, it will not apply. And if you have availed any income-based deductions under 80H, 82, 80 RRB, it will not apply. And if you are engaged in the business of plying or leasing under 44A, then obviously it will not apply. So that is what it is. Section 3238 is already deemed to have been allowed, so you will not get further deduction again. WDB for the assets for the purpose of such business shall be calculated on the depreciation which has already been allowed. It's assumed like that. So. and one more interesting thing is if you are an ssc under 44 ad you don't have to pay advance tax on all the four installments only the last installment you have to pay the full uh, advance tax on the last installment date that is 15th march of every year otherwise you have to pay four times a year so there is one opt in and opt out scheme here under 44 ad which is not available in 44 ad and any other thing this opt opt in scheme is what once you opt inside 44 ad you cannot opt out for minimum 5 years if you do so if you break the law or if you break basically if you uh, you know claim less or whatever it is 
without showing the books of account, whatever the case may be, you will not be eligible to claim the benefit for at least five years. So very simple. Once you come in, stay for minimum five years. Within five years, if you don't stay, if you do something where you need to get out, stay out for five years. That's the rule. Very, very simple. Because you have to get your books audited and all those things. So, for example, Mr. Karan here. Assume that it is, you know, cash receipts. That's why 8% I'm taking. If he is earning gross receipts 1.9 crore and income declared is 15 lakh 20 thousand. What is the amount offered under 44 AD? 8%. If the gross receipts is 1.8 crore and income declared by the SEC is 14 lakh 40 thousand, then that is also coming up to 8%. Right? Then if it is 2 crore and he is offering 13 lakhs, then he is offering less here, 6.5%. It is less than 8%. So what I should do here, I should maintain the books of accounts. If I don't maintain the books of accounts, etc., then it will be a problem. That is what. And here if you see, current needs to maintain books of accounts, etc. Since he has not offered income as per the provisions of 44 AD, in the third year, he was not eligible to claim benefit of for five assessment years. That is from assessment year 21, 22 to 25, 26. He opted in first year. First year he was okay. Second year was a third year he broke the rule. Since he broke the rule, third year he is offered less income. He will not be there to be claiming the entire, what do you say? Uh, he cannot claim 8% or he cannot get into the presumptive taxation scheme for the next five years. That is assessment year 21, 22 to 25, 26. An SSC is allowed to take benefit of 44 AD only when the gross receipts or turnover in the given year is up to 2 crore. However, in any given year after declaring income under 44 AD, if the turnover goes beyond 2 crore, SSC cannot declare income under 44 AD. So now in this particular example, let us assume this year instead of 2 crore, that turnover only is some 5 crore. So now tell me, since it went beyond 2 crore, I cannot claim 44 AD. If I cannot claim 44 AD, will it be amounting to a breach? No, I did not commit any breach because I would have loved to do it under 34, I mean under the 44 AD, but my turnover went uh, haywire. So will that opt-in, opt-out scheme will come into play if I wanted to come under 44 AD, but I could not come under 44 AD because there was a breach in the turnover. So if you see. In this case, it is not considered as violation under this section and the SSE can claim benefit under 44 AD in the next year if the conditions in this section are satisfied. That is regarding 44 AD presumptive taxation. Next, moving on 44 ADA. Eligible SSE will be a resident individual or resident HUF or resident firm but not an LLP. Eligible SSE carrying on business relating to 44 AA that same uh, interior designer, doctor, etc., whose gross receipts do not exceed 50 lakh in the previous year can declare income of 50% of the gross receipts. So guys, here you can declare income how much? 50%. Where the SSE has claimed profits lower than that prescribed under 44 ADA, the SSE shall maintain the books of accounts as per 44 AA and get the same audited under 44 AB. Same thing, 32, 38 will already be allowed. Next comes income from hiring or leasing goods carriages, 44A. So in this case, any SSE. Mind you, here it is any SSE. So they'll ask you, a foreign company wanted to get into plying of hiring or leasing goods carriages, you cannot try it, not applicable. This is for all SSEs. Important MCQ question. Here if you see, it is resident individual, resident HF, resident firm, but not LLP. If they give you resident LLP wants to do 44 ADA, not possible. Resident LLP want to do, wants to do 44 AD, not possible. Resident LLP wants to do 44 AE, possible. Foreign company wants to do 44 AE, possible. Here it is, business of plying, hiring, leasing goods, owning not more than 10 goods carriages. Sir, I don't. I own 8 goods carriages, but I have taken 3 on hire purchase. Even if I have taken 3 on hire purchase, it will be called as deemed to be owning. So here in this 44 AE, it is not based on the income that you have earned actually. It is based on the gross vehicle or unladen weight of the vehicle to be honest. 
So, 1000 per ton of the gross vehicle weight or unladen weight for heavy goods vehicle, 7500 for other than heavy goods vehicle should be taken into account. Heavy goods vehicle means, you know, uh, if you see here, what do you mean by heavy goods vehicle? Means gross weight will be 12,000 kgs. 12,000 kgs. So, if you see, and basically it should be bought even if it's one time a year if it is bought it is fine so for example here if you see any time basically you should not cross 10 at any point of time during the year mr j has bought two vehicles which weigh 7000 kg on 5422 and two vehicles which weigh 17000 kg on 3722 in this case income under section 44a shall be calculated as follows two vehicles purchased on 5422 two vehicles into 7500 into 12 why because it was bought on 54 22 part of the month also will be considered fully so 12 months remaining two vehicles purchased on 37 though it is purchased on 37 it will be considered as a as full month correct so that's what it is it is month or a part of the month so july august september october november december january february march nine months so two vehicles into thousand into 17 tons into nine months total income will be this now this or whatever he, if he can maintain books, if it is less, then it is less. That's how we should see. Where the SC declares a lower income than the income prescribed under section, shall maintain books of accounts as per 44A and 44AB is what they say. Now guys, this is a very, very important chart. So immediately now, this particular chart will be given to you. Right, this particular chart will be given to you and I will be discussing around for, for 35 40 minutes uh, about this chart. This chart can come in MCQs. All the interconnecting sections charts for 44 AAB will immediately follow this particular video right now. Okay, so you watch that video. After that, we will do something else. Okay, watch that video now, right? Right after this continuation of the video. Okay. Hi, my dear friends, Minerva Jai Kumar here. Guys, today I bring to you a very, 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 very important chart. This, many people have told me, sir, in taxation, please help me with that uh, 44A maintenance of accounts, 44AB, which is tax audit and this presumptive taxation, especially 44AD, ADA and AE for business profession and also the flying of, uh, you know, goods carriages. Sir, it's very difficult, all hodgepodge. Guys, these questions will 100% come in MCQs, you know, apart from normal provisions also, normal questions, MCQs, pakka it will come, both in CA final and CA inter. So, I thought, let me study the bare act of all, I mean, of all these sections and make a combined chart so that it will help you. Uh, access to this chart is in my Telegram channel, I have posted it there. So, go down here in the description, you will get the link to my Telegram channel. One is the channel, one is the discussion group. So, you join both, it will be available there, okay. So, you can, you know, use it for your exam. One day before the exam, 100%, 1000% it will help you, okay. Before we go there, this is just a nice handwriting. Let me show you my Dabba handwriting first. Little bit, uh, that chart is not needed for you, but still, let's just uh, do some basic analysis. See my handwriting, I can also not see, sorry. Anyway, I'll just quickly go through. So, particulars. This is not relevant, guys. This is relevant. I'll come to this chart. Sorry. This chart, I'll come to it. Okay, one second, give me. Before that, some revision, little bit revision is needed. So, 44 AD, uh, residential status. So, 44 AD, what is it, guys? For business, resident, right? Uh, the presumptive taxation can be opted by only a resident. 44 ADA, that also resident only. That is for profession. 44 AE, that is your uh, goods carriage, you know. Their resident, non-resident, both can opt for the same. There have been amendments in Finance Act 21 also. That's very, very relevant for November 22 exam and, of course, the onwards, okay? Next, section details, of course, for 44 AD is other than profession. 44 ADA, it is profession and A is plying, hiring or leasing of goods carriage. Now, SSC uh, for 44 AD, it's not just an individual, all these people. Indiv you know this, that's the revision I'm doing. I just, uh, what I did know, I saw the Bayer Act, mapped certain things. Saw the Bayer Act, mapped certain things. Saw the section in the Bayer Act, mapped certain things. And then combined everything and made that, this chart. Correct, it took me a couple of hours, but it's worth it. I thought I'll share it with you. So here, uh, SSC, you are the SSC, individual, partnership firm, HUF, LLP is not covered, okay? And uh, should not have claimed deductions in your 10 AA and ATIA to ATRRB. These are the simple conditions. Whereas for this, 44 ADA, 
profession it will be what legal medical engineering architectural accountancy technical consultancy interior decorator film artist film artist will include everybody you know your uh, uh, your not just the actor even your technician director all these people then company secretary then your uh, information technology any other profession as the cbdt may tell from time to time here you know in this flying hiring and leasing of goods carriage you have uh, anybody who owns less than or equal to 10 goods carriage at any point of time during the financial year the previous year previous during the previous year right that's what it is now what is the deemed profit you know that in the first one the gross receipts you know if it is uh, le less than or equal to it should be 2 cr right and 6% of turnover uh, if it is done through you know banking channels that is bank or account pay check 8% in other cases just the gist i am telling then coming here gross receipts will be less than or equal to 50 lakh Deem profit will be 50% of gross receipts. And here you have this, let's not get into this, your, uh, you know, 1000 uh, per ton of your gross weight, all these things, that is irrelevant. What is relevant for us, my dear friends, is in all these cases, will, uh, you know, tax audit apply, will accounts apply, should I maintain the accounts, all those things. So for that, this master chart, which I have already, I'm telling you, it's there below. Please go check my description there. And also in the comment section, I'll pin a comment maybe. Uh, check it out. To come to my channel there, you will get this. I will put a JPEG of this particular chart. One by one, let's discuss, guys. Come on. So what is this chart about? Let me just zoom in. Interconnecting chart for what? Section number 44A. A. Then 44AB. 44A is what? Accounts. AB is what? You know, tax audit and presumptive taxation. And let me take three sections here. But other sections also I'll throw in here. AD, AD is for business, ADA, profession and AE, AE is for what my dear friends, I told you the plying and hiring of goods carriages. So let us now come here one by one. So let's talk about what do you say, the, where did my pen go, one second. Sorry guys, cool, yeah, I am keeping the pen inside and searching everywhere, okay, come here. So uh first one business so here let's talk about the you know uh tax audit you know tax audit let's talk about the tax audit now right now in tax audit also in finance act 21 there was an amendment so let's see generally guys generally tax audit is needed when when the total sales turnover or gross receipts in the previous year is more than one cr then 44AB is needed, that we know. But Finance Act 21 had an amendment where that 1 crore limit will be raised to 10 crore if dual conditions are followed. Now, basically, after demonetization, the idea of the government has been, you know, a cashless economy, right? So, to sort of, you know, help people also come to track, they have said, aggregate cash receipts should be less than or equal to 5% of the total receipts. Plus, Aggregate cash payments made during the previous year should be less than or equal to 5% of the total payment. So, if your cash receipts and cash payments are less than or equal to 5%, which means it should not exceed 5%, then that 1 CR limit is now raised to 10 crore. Which means what? If your gross receipts, total sales and turnover in the previous year is more than 10 crore only then only then section 44 ab will come provided these two conditions are satisfied cool very simple Ex uh, 44 ab so exception is 44 ad we'll see that later that is what this chart is all about guys this is for business this is for business we are discussing about 44 AB for business. Sir, what about profession? Profession here, it's there. Section 44 AB will come if the gross receipts in the previous year is more than 50 lakh rupees. So, guys, first part of the chart done. Very, very simple chart, no tension. Second part. Again, if we read the uh, section 44, you know, AB and A together, this is what we will get out of it. First, section 44 A. Section 44, A, 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 you know, for example, just remember. See, sometimes I make some stupid things to remember this, guys, okay? So, just remember, there is, you are walking on the road, suddenly one goods vehicle will come. You will say, hey, 
think about it visualize it's stupid visualization it will work you are walking in the, in, on the road in india our road wherever we go that is the road no so we are walking that fellow poor guy is coming he is coming properly only goods carriage goods carriage visualize it passed by me i said hey 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 it's for what flying goods carriage sir please please leave us it's okay da. remember da. okay then one dubai sheik is coming dubai sheik Dubai Sheikh like this is you no know, full on tall is dressed and coming. Hey Sheikh, what da? You are in Bangalore. What are you doing in India? I said Habibi, Habibi. I am looking for oil. Habibi, I am looking for mineral oil. Now that Dubai Sheikh is what non-resident. And what is he telling? Hey Habibi, I am looking for what mineral oil. Habibi, correct. This is for what, my dear friends, mineral oil. Sir, please leave me. I am now searching for everywhere where I'll go run away. Please, it's easy to remember, guys. Mark my words. It's so stupid, but you'll remember. So, what is this? Uh, you know, goods carriage. Hey, hey. Then, BB oil. That is what 44 BB. Easy to remember. Next, BBB. Just remember, big B, guys. Amitabh Bachchan. Amitabh Bachchan. Correct. Amitabh Bachchan is a big shot. He's sitting like this. Visualize, visualize. Amitabh Bachchan is sitting like this. And is just turning the key. He is putting the you know uh, key inside the lock and is turning the key. That's all you remember. I'm not joking. Amitabh Bachchan, big B, correct? It's a big shot. He's just turning the key. Just think about it. I'm not joking. Correct? Right. So Amitabh Bachchan is just turning the key. Did you understand? Yes. So 44 BBB is what? Big shot Bachchan. Correct, big B, big B, big shot. Correct, big B, big shot. Big B is called as big B only, right? Big B, big shot, turning the key, turning the key. So stupid it is, but it actually will remember. Correct, so 44 BBB is what, guys? Turnkey projects, turnkey projects. Sir, please, now you please come to the point, sir. Leave me with all these things. Okay, left, sorry, come back. So if SSE has claimed the income, how much, guys? Less than the deemed profits and greater than or equal to deemed profits that's fine if it is greater than or equal to the deemed profits of course the deemed profits is given there for a you know all that uh, tonnage thing and for bb and bbb it's around 10 percent is the deemed profit uh, now if you have claimed more than or equal to deemed profit no problem the accounting accounts also will not apply 44 ab also will not apply but you have gone and told no no i this is not 10 percent is lesser than this my income that I'm offering is less than 10%. I'm offering 5%. Then they say, okay, boss, I'll agree. You make it 5%, but show me the books. Show me the books. 44A, 44AB will come. Did you understand this, my dear friends? So second chart is done. Full combined chart. You will not get any doubt, correct? Just hang on there. Doubt, I mean, for the charts, you can go down. As I told you, you can go check there. I'll have given you the link, right? Yes, guys, come on, moving on, right. So, we have finished these two parts, very simple. Now, let's come. So, 44A is done. There is nothing much there. Now, coming to AD and ADA, deadly ones. With all the amendments that have come in the Finance Act 21, let's do it, okay. Now, these questions have not come so many times. That's why it's very, very important, both for final and inter in MCQ or in the regular thing as well. Now, come here, guys. See, I will explain this chart now first. Do you agree that as far section 44 AD is concerned, right? That is business other than the professionals, you know, profession covered in 44 A. In maintenance of accounts, you have seen. That's why this chart, the first chart I just uh, showed you to, you know, explain. So, in under 44 A, uh, maintenance of accounts, the what do you say? Professions covered are linked to 44 ADA. This profession only legal, medical, engineering, architecture, etc. Just to give you a gist, I, I made that chart. Now, 44 AD is for business other than the profession. And of course, 44 ADA. Adai, ADA, Ada. Adai is for what? It's for the profession. Profession will include the artist, everybody. Okay. So, prof. 
profession correct 44 ada now let's stick to profession we'll come to this later we'll come to ad later let's stick to profession okay come to profession in profession you may agree there can be a legal consulting firm there can be a company also there, there can be a CA firm and there can be an individual also. So, I will split it into two because why I am splitting into two is this is a combination of 44 AA, AB and ADA. Hear me out. Why I am splitting? Because individual and firm other than LLP, I will make into one part. LLP, company, other SSE, I will make into the other part. Okay, why? Because 44 ADA is applicable only to individual and firm other than LLP. So, this chart only I have actually added it here. See, individual partnership of NHF, of course, other than LLP. That is for what? Your, uh, you know, ADA. The same thing It's given there. This is for AD, that's for ADA. Similar thing. So, let's come here, check. I'm doing ADA now. Okay. So, ADA, my dear friends, is applicable for individual and firm. HF is not there. HF is for AD. Okay, it is individual and firm only other than LLP. Individual and firm only other than LLP. Whereas for LLP, for company and other SSE separate. Now, let's stick to this others first. Others will stick to it first. Now, if the gross receipts in the previous year is more than 50 lakh, gross receipts in the previous year is less than or equal to 50 lakh, I don't care. 44 ADA will never come. See here, 44 ADA will never come in any case. Why? Because 44 ADA is not at all applicable to whom? LLP, company, other SSE. It's not applicable only. It's not applicable only. Though company, firm, other SSE, individual can all be doing the uh, profession, legal, consulting, act, film acting, all those things. But, but, if... The, the entire section is not applicable only. 44 AD is not applicable to LLP, company, other SSE. So, that is immaterial. So, that's why if you see 44 ADA will never come for these cases. However, if, if the gross receipts, the gross receipts are more than 50 lakhs, the gross receipts are more than 50 lakh, then my dear friends, 44 A also will come, 44 AB also will come. 44A also will come, 44AB also will come because if it is more than 50 lakhs, it, it both will apply. But the interesting thing is, what if it doesn't exceed 50 lakh? What if it is less than or equal to 50 lakh? If it is less than or equal to 50 lakh, then in the question, I need to see whether they have given anything, if they have given anything, if they have given anything. What is that if they have given anything? If they have said that the amount, that is the income that they have, you know, uh, generated, right? Right? If uh, the, uh, what do you say, total receipts, total receipts that they have generated is what? See here, gross receipt should be, if it is less than or equal to 50 lakh, first I should see whether it is more than 1.5 lakh up to 50 lakh. One more is what? I know it's less than or equal to 50 lakh, but it's less than or equal to 1.5 lakh also in the previous uh, year. Here, you know, don't get confused, guys. It is not exactly previous year. It is one in the past three previous years. So, that I have just ignored for the time being. Just for your knowledge, I am telling, okay? So, if you do not want to remember this, you leave it. This part, I again tell you. If, I do, if you do not want to remember it, it's okay. But those of you who can take it, hear me out, okay? Overall chart, you know I understand. But this part, okay, that also you leave. This part... For those of you who do not understand, leave it. But for those of you who can take it, hear me out coolly. This is a full interconnection. Okay, hear me out coolly. This will also help you in practice. I am not joking. You hold this chart, you can figure out. It's like a ready reckoner that I have made. Okay, so hold on. LLP company other SSE gross receipts in previous uh, year more than 50 lakh. You know, 44 ADA will anyway not come. I told you why. 44 A and AB will come. If it is less than or equal to 50 lakh, if you just want to stick to this right hand column, you can stick to the right hand column and close it. What will happen? I'll tell you. So, if it is 44 A will come, 44 A will come because income is more than 1.5 lakh. Guys, as per 44 A, if our income is more than 1.5 lakh, if your uh, gross receipts is more than 1.5 lakh, then accounts have to be maintained. Accounts have to be maintained. Then 44 AB will not come and 44 ADA will not come. But 
if your income your total uh, gross assets is less than or equal to 1.5 like in one out of the three preceding financial years then 44a also will not come 44a also will not come ab and ad anyway will not come if you did not understand only this kutti part you delete this it's okay no problem only this you remember okay only that you remember no problem no problem it's okay okay one out of three preceding financial is only in this case not in this case this all this is always previous year correct i have interconnected everything don't worry if for the exam if you cannot remember this no problem leave it just stick to this part that's all there is to it done come to individual now individual if it is more than 50 lakhs gross receipts individual more than 50 lakhs gross receipts my dear friends 44 ada will never come you just see this chart here i told you for 44 ada gross receipts must be less than or equal to 50 lakh so here if the gross receipts is more than 50 lakh ada will never come but my dear friends which means you can never opt for presumptive taxation but that doesn't mean that you should not maintain accounts that should doesn't mean that you should not what do you say go for 44 ab so that will definitely come it will definitely come right now the beauty is when your income sorry when your gross assets is less than or equal to 50 lakhs when your gross receipts is less than or equal to 50 lakhs right then 50 percent will be what the deemed profit 50 percent will be your deemed profit 50 percent will be your team profit 50 percent will be your deemed profit now if you do not opt for 44 ada you don't go to that presumptive taxation at all do not opt for it then assuming your uh, receipts is at least more than one and a half lakhs that assumption i am making 44 a will come 44 ab will not come 44 ada will not come assuming 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 right assuming is what i am saying now if 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 your income which you have claimed what is the income that is allowed 50 percent if the income that you have claimed is more than or equal to the deemed profits, that is more than or equal to 50% of the gross assets, that is what you have claimed. Then, my dear friends, 44 ADA will come into the picture. And as per 44 ADA, what does it say? No need to maintain accounts and no need of tax audit if you follow the conditions. Now, one deadly thing as per the amendment, right? Deadly thing. What? If the income claimed is less than the deemed profits, my dear friends, whatever you have claimed is less than the deemed profits, means what? Less than 50% you have claimed under 44 ADA, you have gone ahead and claimed, then what does it say? If the total income that you are claiming in your return is more than the basic exemption limit, for example, for individual uh, resident normal less than 6 years will be what? 2.5 lakh. If it is more than two and a half lakh, what they are trying to, this example, basic exemption limit. Basically, the ma maximum amount which is not chargeable to tax. So, then 44A also will come, 44AB also will come. This is the amendment important. If the income claimed is less than the deemed profits and if the total income is more than the basic exemption limit, then Accounts also have to maintain and tax or it also have to maintain. Sir, where are these sections, sir? It is there in 44A and AB, those provisions are there. On the other hand, if the total income is less than or equal to the basic exemption limit, if the total income is less than or equal to the basic exemption limit, then 44A also will not come, AB also will not come. Did you understand, my dear friends? Right? So, we have done what all now? We have done normal 44AB, business and profession. This chart is available. Don't worry. Go down, right? Next, 44A, hey, we have seen. BB, hey, BB, mineral oil, Habibi, 
करेक्ट हबीबी देन बी 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 बिग शॉट बच्चन बिग बी बिग बच्चन बिग शॉट टर्निंग द की स्टूपिट बट इट्स फाइन इट यूल यूल रिमेंबर नेक्स्ट फोर्टी फोर एडी फोर्टी फोर एडी इज वॉट फोर्टी फोर एडी इज ऑफकोर्स योर यू नो दैट इज वॉट वी हैव टू डू नाउ देन यूर फोर्टी फोर एडीए इन फोर्टी फोर एडीए अदाए फिल्म एक्टर्स अदाए राइट सो प्रोफेशन इज इट रिमेंबर so this is called what individual firm we have seen and llp company and other ssc we have seen that's all now the last part guys one more deadly one 44 ad this chart you see and go chill out all right guys the last part now deadly part right i have combined all the three sections come on चलिए हम और आप खेलते कौन बनेगा करोड़पति दैट बी 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 इज ओवर नो कम बैक यूर ओके सो गाइस 44 फोर एडी फोर्टी फोर एडी रिमेंबर इन लॉ वे डिस्कसिंग एडिशनल डायरेक्टर एडी मीन्स एडिशनल डायरेक्टर एडिशनल डायरेक्टर विल ऑलवेज कम एन इज न्यू बिजनेस न्यू प्रोजेक्ट न्यू बिजनेस इफ इट्स कमिंग इन आई नीड वन एक्सपर्ट ऑन द बोर्ड ऑफ डायरेक्टर सो आई विल अपॉइंट एडिशनल डायरेक्टर सो रिमेंबर एडिशनल डायरेक्टर फॉर एक्स्ट्रा बिजनेस सो एडिशनल डायरेक्टर इज फॉर बिजनेस okay other than what profession obviously you've seen the profession profession is film actor adai ada means generally you are the way you you know act your entire uh, you know the way you present yourself it's called adai so you film actors profession you know the adai ada okay then you know these things already a and habibi and bbb all that you know easy to remember guys some stupid story you have to keep making otherwise how will you remember all these sections correct no yes come back so hear me out now i have shown you in my amazing handwriting chart here that uh, 44 ad was for what individual partnership firm hf other than llp ada was for individual and partnership firm only but here it is individual partnership firm hf other than llp so you know that which means you know that 44 ad will not apply to whom will not apply to llp company and other ss that much we know so let's take the easy one first For LLP company, other SSC, if the gross receipts or turnover, gross receipts or turnover, sir, why are you bringing ten crore, one crore, bro? We are merging what tax audit and forty four eighty. Now, for one thing, simple thing, you tell me. For LLP company, other SSC, whatever the case may be, will forty four eighty come or not? It will not come. It will not come. Sir, but what about accounts and uh, audit? It will come. How much, sir? One crore and ten crore. Same condition like this. No change. Same condition. This con these two conditions. I have merged it here. That's all. It's a com combined chart. No, that's why. So if in other cases, forty-four A will come, AB will uh, come, AD will not come. If it is more than one crore, if the uh, you know gross receipts or turnover is greater than ten crore. Correct. Then 44A and AB will come. If in other cases if it is more than one crore, A and AB will come. If it is less than one crore, A and AB will not come. If it is more than 10 crore, A and AB will come. However, aggregate cash receipts and payments, all that should be 5%, less than or equal to 5%. We have already discussed that. I will not waste your time. Right? Same limits. So this you leave. Now the interesting part, my dear friends. 44AD is applicable for individual firm HF. two things can happen one that person may opt for section 44 ad or he may not even opt for 44 ad let's say the individual will not even opt for 44 ad leave it he is chilling out then in that case he never opted in this case he never opted he has never opted in his life what 44 ad so for him normal provisions will continue right what is it the turnover or gross assets if it is less than or equal to 25 lakh sir why 25 lakh came boss for maintenance of accounts now unfortunately right total income is one uh, you know for for people who are doing business not profession or doing business in profession it was 1 and 1/2 lakhs no gross receipts here it is what 25 lakhs income is 1.2 lakhs and uh, this thing what do you say turnover is 25 lakhs so if it is less than or equal to 25 lakhs my dear friends 44a also will not come ab also will not come 
Sir, but what about this? 25 lakhs to 1 crore. Sir, why are you putting 1 crore, sir? Because 44 AB tax audit limit is 1 crore. So, if it is greater than 25 lakhs or less than or equal to 1 crore, 44 A will come. Because why? A limit is 25 lakhs. And 44 AB will not come. Lastly, sir, what if it is more than 1 crore, sir? 44 A will come and AB will come. Sir, what if my aggregate cash receipts and cash payment less than or equal to 5%, sir? Then, of course, 1 crore is increased to 10 crore limit. So, then in that case, both will not apply. Did you understand, my dear friends? Easy? Very easy. Yes or no? Yes or no? Very easy. Now, guys, as per the amendment, there is an opt-out scheme. Now, in 44 AD, what is the presumptive uh, this thing? Deemed profit 6% and 8%. 6% and 8% is the deemed profit. So, what is that 6%? What is that 8%? We have seen in my Dabba and rating here. 6% if you give it through what? Bank or account pay check. 8% in other cases. Cash and uh, bearer check and all those things. Now, if you opt for 44 AD, which means you are already doing 44 AD. Let's see, normally you are continuing, no tension, you are going through 44 AD, no problem. Now, normal provisions of 44 AD, turnover or gross receipts. Now, I am combining everything, please concentrate. If it is less than or equal to 25 lakhs, my dear friends, if it is less than or equal to 25 lakhs, whatever you are claiming, then what? Then 44A, that is what you say. This is now what I am talking about is the deemed profits. Deemed profits. Whether it is less than or equal to 25 lakhs, greater than 25 lakhs, less than 1 crore, all in these cases you are opting for the same, right? You are opting for the same. So what? What will not apply? 44A will not come, 44AB will not come. 44A will not come, 44AB will not come. Right? But, if, if what? You are opting, if, if you are, uh, you know, your deemed profit, whatever you are claiming, is more than 1 crore, less than or equal to 2 CR. Your turnover and gross receipts, correct? Is more than 1 crore, less than or equal to 2 CR. Then, 44A will not come. Important point, 44AB also will not come. Why? Because for 44AB, there is a slight, uh, there is an amendment. So, what is the amendment, guys? Again, hear me out, guys. Again, hear me out, please. You should have gone through 44AD. Means, your, your deemed profits must be 6% or 8% as the case may be. And your turnover happens to be, now this is very, very important, more than 1 crore, less than or equal to 2 crore. Should I maintain the accounts and audit was the question. Anything more than 1 crore, you have to maintain, right? But here I am actually opting for what? 44? 80. Check out. I will show you that Bayer Act. See, this came... In 2017 itself, this part, but check it out. This section, which section? Tax audit section. Will not apply to the person who declares profits and gains for the previous year in accordance with the provisions of subsection 1 of 44AD, 6%, 8%. And his total sales turnover or gross asset, as the case may be in business, does not exceed 2 crore in the previous year. Got it? does not exceed 2 crore in the previous year. Do not go to 44 ADA, that is different, this is different provisions. Right? There if you follow those provisions, uh, if you uh, do it greater than or equal to the presumptive rates, then no need of maintenance of books and uh, audit. But here it is different. Please do not get confused. I am reading the Bayer Act for you. Right? As I told you, it took 2-3 hours to analyze everything and make this chart. Just stick to the chart. I am explaining the chart. That's all. Okay. I repeat. 2017 amendment. What does it say? Greater than 1 CR, less than or equal to 2 CR if it is there. In the question, if they are given anything within these limits, 
MCQ they can ask guys this this part especially 44 AB will apply will not apply obviously it will not apply there is an amendment that in 2017 only if it is more than 2 crore you have to maintain accounts also you have to maintain you have to do the tax audit as well you have to do the tax audit as well combined reading of the section even though your deemed profits are normal 6% to 8% okay now one more deadly one. 44 AD 4. 44 AD 4. 44 AD 4. My dear friends, again 2017. It's again eligible SSE as we have seen. This is the opt-out scheme. What if he opts out of the same? What if he opts out of the same? Means he was going through 44 AD. Now he wants to opt out. 44 AD 4. What will happen if he opts out? So this particular thing. What will happen if he opts out? What would happen to anything if he opts out is what this particular section is talking about. opt out there. This is AD 4 and if you see in 44 AB this clause has been added where provisions of 44 AD 4 will apply that is what I am doing here. If he opts out for one year my dear friends he cannot opt in again. He cannot opt in which section? 44 AD for the next 5 years. For the next 5 years. Once he opted out, next 5 years not possible. Apart from that, again, if your turnover or sales is more than 1 crore, whether it is less than exemption limit, more than exemption, whatever, I don't care. If your turnover or sales is more than 1 crore, 44 AA, a, B, both are required. That 2 crore benefit you will not get because you have opted out. 2 crore benefit you will not get. But let's say you have opted out also. You have opted out also from that scheme. And your turnover, etc. sales is less than or equal to 1 crore. Guys, in normal situation, if your turnover is less than uh, 1 crore, no problem, right? Correct, if it's less than 1 crore, generally if it's less than 1 crore, no problem. No 44A, AB also, normal scenario. But here you have opted out. Since you have opted out, if your total income is less than basic exemption limit, one and I know your 2 and a half lakh rupees, then 44A, AB will not come. That's okay. Now, this is the important thing. This is the important thing because of the interconnection. If your total, again, here, see here. See here if your turnover or sales is less than or equal to 1 crore, and the total income is more than the basic exemption limit. 44A also will come. 44AB also will come. This is what the section says. One small kutti section they have put here. Tax audit will come if the provisions of subsection 4 of 44 AD are applicable and his income exceeds the maximum amount which is not chargeable to income tax in the previous year. Similar provisions are there in 44 AA also. So it will come guys. So my dear friends, I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I enjoyed making this chart. It took me some time but I think it was worth it. Download the thing, the entire chart. I just click on the link. It will take me to my uh, Telegram channel. You can download it from there. Both final and inter, it will help you. Go through this video so that you can, uh, you know, keep on revising. And uh, if you want me to do some more charts like interconnecting these things, I was just checking TDS, TCS also, some deadly areas are there. If you want me to do something, comment. So like this video, comment. And easy to remember the sections, right? Hey, what? Goods carriage. Then, hey, Habibi is what? Oil. I am come from Dubai for oil. Okay. Then, 
बिग बी बिग बचन बिग शॉट टर्निंग द की इजी then ada adai of the you know uh, profession that is the artist and of course additional director additional business additional director business so ad business linking some law here you know everything all right on that note please comment how did you like this uh, video or if you want me to do more videos on, on which topics please do it guys okay on that note all the best for your examinations see you love you all bye Yes, guys. So hope you enjoyed that analysis. Now moving on to presumptive taxation for non-residents and foreign companies. For non-residents and foreign companies, you have 44B, that is shipping business. Then you have 44BBA, that is for aircraft, and you have 44BB, that is uh, profit and gains for extraction and production of mineral oil, so to speak. And then we have engage in civil construction, 40BBB. Four sections we have. So let us just check quickly. Shipping business forty four B. So the eligible amount is very simple, guys. Section forty four B overrides twenty eight to forty three A. So you can claim what amount of profit? Seven point five percent is the profit. Will it? Will you use this profit amount to set off business loss? Yes, because this section overrides only twenty eight to forty three A. It does not override seventy-two. Can I set off unabsorbed depreciation? No, because this section overrides twenty-eight to forty-three A, but not thirty-two. Can I claim deduction under chapter under chapter six A? Yes, you can. Yes, you can definitely. Yes. So, what does this forty-four uh, B talk about? Non-resident engaged in shipping business, both the things: amount paid or payable, whether in India or outside India, to an SSE or to a person on behalf of an account, good shipped any port in India. so if the ship comes from usa to india this is covered on the other hand reverse case also covered that is it's going from chennai to usa that is also covered no problem rather than just freight which is actually what is amount charged here instead of that if i use any other nomenclature like demurrage handling charges everything will be covered for sure those which are accrued in india only is covered that is shipping from somewhere else coming to india or from here going to somewhere else but if i have a ship which is uh, transporting goods from usa to dubai and money is received somewhere else then this section will not come into the picture so if you see mr jim is a non resident and is engaged in shipping business he received 10 crores on goods which were loaded onto the ship from a port in india of which 4 crore was received in london he had also received 6 crore for goods loaded at miami of this 2 crore was received in india in this case since 10 crore was accrued in india it shall form part of amount specified irrespective of where it was received and 6 crore which was accrued outside india only 2 crore will form part of india because 2 crore was received in india only that will come so this will be the thing 10 plus 2 12 crore 7.5 percent it would be my 90 lakhs then as far as aircraft is concerned same instead of 7 and 1/2 percent here we have 5 percent operation of aircraft so here also same thing Uh, outside india and in india both things are covered so if you see in this example 2 crores in india on account of carriage of persons from chennai it's okay the operates an aircraft between the gulf and chennai so since it is 2 crores in india on account of carriage of passengers from chennai it is covered 1 crore in india receiving covered 3 crores in india receiving covered 1 crore in the gulf on account of carriage of passengers from chennai so in gulf you are receiving so hence it will not be covered received in a business activity but here guys on account of though it is received outside india you cannot say that it is not covered because it is carrying passengers from chennai so in all the cases tax insurance three cases received in india here it is not received in india but it is received for a business activity in india hence everything will be covered and taxation will be at 5% so certain turnkey projects civil construction turnkey projects and also for extraction of raw materials we'll see apart from that there's also one more section section 172 those are the companies which are shipping companies which come to india and they don't want to i mean they want to go out and we don't know whether they're going to come or not again so for them rather than making the assessment here 
next year and previous year this year previous year and assessment year both are the same for such companies so if you compare 44b and 172 44b is a charging section for that particular shipping business where the port in india or you are depositing outside india also goods etc whereas so 172 is more of a recovery section not a charging section this is for goods shipped at india which from usa goods come to india and they go off i don't know whether they'll pay tax or not that's why i will collect the tax then and there there'll be tax department in all the ports so to speak here there is 7.5 percent plus which is at the normal rates of taxation whereas here there's a flat rate of 40 percent plus 4 percent plus cess etc plus surcharge if there is a uh, turnover threshold this section overrides 28 to 43a that is 44b whereas 172 overrides the entire income tax act in 44b i can claim set off because this will override only 28 to 43a it will not override 72 but here 172 no set off is allowed chapter 6a deductions can be claimed under 44b in recovery no deductions can be claimed here assessment year is different previous year is different 172 both are the same is what i have discussed right yes so apart from that there are certain turnkey projects in those turnkey projects there is concept of deemed profit so let's see here so turnkey projects deemed profits uh, claimed by SSE 10 percent yes you can claim what are turnkey projects these are projects which are uh, given by the government to some uh, party they will do the project infrastructure project or they'll build an airport and directly give it to the government saying that look you can directly take it up now you can just turn the key and start the project on so regarding that if you see foreign company engaged in the business of civil construction mind you for NRI, this section will not come. It's only for foreign company, not for NRI. Or for non-resident individual also. Engaged in the business of civil construction or the business of erection or plant and machinery or testing or commissioning turnkey projects. 10% of the gross amount paid or payable, whether in India or outside India, shall be taken as your business income so basically 10 percent so if it is 10 percent can ao check the books of accounts and say profit is more than 10 percent no there's a case law dit versus dst noel gmbh so there ao has no locus standi or no right to claim this if it is more than 10 percent can i do it yes no problem it is allowed less than 10 percent 44 BBB2 will come whereby you can claim less than 10% uh, but you have to get your accounts audited, you have to maintain accounts, then it is possible. And for mineral oil etc, that also same thing guys, 10% is there. But one interesting thing to note, if it is for technical services or royalty that is for planning for extracting of the oil, for extraction of the oil, 44 BB will not come, 44 DA will come and 115 A will come, 293 capital A will come, that is international taxation. Please note the wordings in the exam, only if they give you hiring of manpower and plant and machinery for extracting mineral oil. Again, I repeat, hiring of manpower and plant and machinery for extracting of mineral oil, then 44 BB will come, 44 DA and 44 uh, 115A will not come. I have explained the logic in class very much in depth. It took minimum one hour to explain the uh, thing. Marathon fellows, just remember this and go. That's it. You do not have the time to sit and do that. Then moving on to some couple of miscellaneous topics. ZCB. ZCB is defined in 2 clause 48 to be infrastructure capital uh, fund capital fund, debt fund, ZCB zero coupon bond, basically I will sell a uh, coupon at 100 rupees and two years later I will take it at 120 rupees. So basically that 20 rupees is the discount, it should be allowed across the life of the bond, two years, 12 months, 15 months, whatever. So 248 public sector company, scheduled bank and central government also can notify the ZCB. Uh, if a ZCB is transferred, it will be deemed to be a transfer under 247 and ZCB on maturity, sale or redemption, capital gain will be taxable. Then under 2 clause 42A, it is long term if it is held for more than 12 months and under section 112, in capital gain, there is no indexation for it and tax would be 
194A, there will be no TDS and 3613A, that's what I am trying to tell. PGBP discount will be allowed on a parota, not parota, prorata basis, right? So if the discount here, let's say, is as I told you 20 and it is spread across 20 months, so every year 1, 1 lakh, 20 lakh into uh, whatever 20 means 1 lakh per month, like that you can take. So if you are, if this happened sometime in October, October to the next 20 months, October to March, October, November, December, January, February, March, 6 months. 6 months, you can take 6 lakhs as a reduction for that particular year. Remaining 12 months, next year, 12 plus 6, 18 already done, 20 months, 4 more months, next year. So like that, you can take the deduction, that is ZCP. Cool. Then one more question that they will ask my dear friends would be what will happen if you are a film producer? What is the taxation of film producer and what is the taxation of film distributor? For that, rather than doing here as a, I mean, as a marathon, I have already recorded an animation video. I am also into animation and other stuff which is my area of interest. So I have already created an animation video. So my avatar will come and teach you that. So the next thing that you are going to see is that avatar coming and speaking about that other thing. Right? Apart from that, then we will go, go into the other areas of taxation of AOP, BOI and uh, probably clubbing of income and this will complete the entire uh, marathon of part number 1. Part number 2 will have of course capital gains, assessment procedure, etc. As and when I record, I will be posting it. Okay? So next, enjoy that video and enjoy the other videos of AOP, BOI and clubbing and all that. Hi, as an ardent cinema lover, I always used to wonder how film producers and distributors are taxed and do they have any special deductions? Do you think there's any difference in taxation if a movie is released in December or if it's released in February? Hello my dear friends, my name is Punarvas Jaikumar and welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, Let's discuss the taxation of film producers and film distributors. Rule number 9 capital A of the income tax rules empowers this deduction as a revenue expenditure and not as a capital expenditure. So what is the amount of deduction that is allowed? The rules define cost of production as the expenditure incurred on the production of the film except two things preparation of the prints of the film and advertisement expenditure. For instance, the movie RRR was made with a budget of 350 crore excluding salaries to the actors and the director. But adding everything, it came up to almost around 600 crores. If the producer spent 100 crores on preparing the prints and let's say another 100 crores on advertisements, making the total around 800 crores, what is allowed, my dear friends, would be just 600 crores. Now, if SS Rajamouli was presented a Volvo car worth 80 lakhs from the producers, would it be allowed as an expenditure? Courts have held that remuneration paid in kind to the actors or such other members involved in the film shall also be included while computing the total cost of production. So yes, that would be allowed. So, if a producer sells all the rights of exhibition of the film in the previous year, the entire cost of production would be available as a deduction. An important point is, it doesn't matter when the movie was released. So, if the rights of the movie KGF2 was sold in the year 2020-2021, but the movie was released in 2022, deduction will be allowed in 2021 if the producer sells all the rights of exhibition of the film in 2021. The same provision applies even to a film distributor. Here, cost of production is substituted by cost of acquisition. So, the producers can claim 600 crores and the acquirer, for example, Netflix, can claim the cost of acquisition as a reduction. In RRR's case, as per the reports, it was around 250 crores. 
But what happens if the producer himself exhibits the film in some of the areas and sells the rights of exhibition of the film in some other areas? For instance, for the movie Bahubali, the producers took up the distribution themselves in southern India, whereas for the other parts of our country and overseas as well, distribution was given to Karan Johar's Dharma Productions. Here, the provisions are slightly different. If the film is released for exhibition on a commercial basis at least 90 days before the end of the relevant previous year, the entire cost of production of the film shall be allowed as deduction in computing the profits and gains of such previous year. However, if it is released within 90 days before the end of the previous year, then the quantum of deduction would be cost of production or amount realized by exhibiting the film and sale of rights of exhibition, whichever is lesser. Hence, in this case, the quantum of deduction will vary if the film is released on or before 1st January and of the films that have been released after 1st January. Who Seems difficult. Let's take a couple of examples, my dear friends, to understand. KGF 2 released on 14th April 2022. The relevant previous year for this would be 22-23. The film's budget was around 100 crores, but it crossed over 1200 crores worldwide. So now, if the producer had sold all the rights of the film in the previous year, that is 22-23, then the entire 100 crore is allowed as a deduction. Even if the producer had exhibited the film in some areas and sold the rights of the film in some other areas, the entire cost of production of 100 crore would be allowed as a deduction since the film was released at least 90 days before the end of the relevant previous year, that is before 31st March 2023. On the other hand, RRR was released on 24th March 2022. Relevant previous year would be 2122. If the producer had sold all the rights of the film in the previous year, that is 2122, then the entire 600 crores is allowed as a deduction. But if the producer had exhibited the film in some areas and sold the rights of the film in some other areas, then deduction would be as under. 1. Cost of production, in this case 600 crore. 2. Amount realized by the sale of tickets and sale of rights till 31st March 2022. In this case, as per the official statistics, it was around 477.5 crore in 8 days. Whichever is less, 600 or 477.5, whichever is less. Hence, 477.5 crores is allowed as a deduction. So, the producers of RRR would offer 477.5 crores, that is the collection, minus 477.5 crores, that is the deduction, that is nil, as their income from PGBP. What would happen, you may ask, to the difference of 600 minus 477.5, that is 112.5 crores? That, my dear friends, would be allowed in the year 22-23. Similarly, Pushpa movie was made on a budget of 170 crores and grossed over 360 crores worldwide. The entire 170 crore would be allowed as a deduction in the year 2122, since the movie was released on 17th December 2021, which is before 1st January 2022. I hope you understood this concept now. Let us discuss quickly three other very very interesting questions. Question number one. The movie Time Machine centered around time travel, starring Amir Khan and Helm by ace director Shekhar Kapoor, who incidentally is a chartered accountant, was filmed almost 100% but was abandoned towards the end. Now, assuming the cost of production for this movie was around, let's say, 100 crore, would this be allowed as a deduction under Rule 9A? There were a lot of controversy over the tax treatment of similar such abandoned movies. The CBDT released a circular settling this issue. They clarified that the cost of production of an abandoned movie is a revenue expenditure allowable under Section 37, Subsection 1. Very interesting. 
Question number two. Can I claim deduction under Rule 9A if my film was not at all released in cinema halls, but it was directly released on OTT platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hotstar, etc.? Please note that deduction is allowed only if it is certified by the censor board. Since censor board provisions don't apply to content on OTT, Rule 9 capital A is not applicable, my dear friends. Rule 9A does not hold any overriding effect on the other provisions of the Income Tax Act or the rules as such. And it should be noted that in case of any expense which cannot be claimed as deduction under Rule 9A shall be claimed under Section 37.1 of the Income Tax Act if the expenditure was wholly and exclusively incurred for business. Third question. In the year 2013, Lucia, an independent Kannada film made by an ex-IT professional, Mr. Pawan Kumar, created history. The movie, a psychological thriller, was made on a total budget of 71 lakhs. It was the first ever crowdfunded movie in India and Mr. Pawan raised around 51 lakhs from the general public in just 10 days. The movie was also sold to Udaya TV for about 95 lakhs in 2013. Now the question is, out of 71 lakhs, would 51 lakh be allowed as an expenditure because it came from other sources? Now since it was used for producing a film, my dear friends, Rule 9 capital A would apply. Rule 9A is not concerned with the source of funds. You could have taken a loan as well for your movie. It doesn't matter. Rule 9A is only about expenditure. But another interesting question. Would the 51 lakh be treated as donation and would it be taxed at the hands of the producers? Yes, my dear friends, under the head income from other sources, under section 56, subsection 2, clause 10, subclause A, 56 to 10 A, if the donation is more than rupees 50,000 rupees. Very, very interesting areas that we have discussed today. Hope you enjoyed the video, my dear friends. Please comment below what you feel about this video and do you need such videos in the future do let me know and also let me know what other topics in taxation or any other subject for that matter would interest you on which we can release more and more animated videos. Kindly like, share with all your friends and subscribe to my YouTube channel Punarvas Jaikumar Law Classes. On that note, take care my dear friends, see you. AOP and BOI, Association of Persons and what body of individuals? Association of Persons and what body of individuals? So this is the taxation that happens between associate, I mean, uh, for what AOP and BOI. Now, what is an AOP? What is a BOI? So, guys, generally, I'll just uh, give the overview here. If you want to see the definition of what do you say, association of persons, and if I go to section two, two clause thirty one in that clause five, I mean. Uh, sub clause 5. So basically, I am talking about AOP and BOI. I just give you the overview because we will have to understand what all things you are doing now. So, if you see the person definition 2 clause 31, right, and sub clause 5 gives the definition of AOP and BOI and tells you what would be association of persons and what would be body of individuals. Basically, person includes AOP, BOI. It doesn't give a definition. There is no separate definition of, you know, body of individuals of association of persons. It's just the meaning that is attached to it. But once an association is formed, the taxability, what is allowed, what is disallowed, etc., especially the disallowed expenses, is given to you in 40 BA given to you in 40 BA. So, this is for the AOP BOI. 
for the individuals concerned correct for the individuals concerned there for the individuals concerned uh, what is the uh, how is the share determined how are the, how is the members share determined members share determined how is it so one is section 67a so members share is determined in section as per section 67a and as far as the taxation is concerned one will be the normal rates second one will be a rate prescribed under section 167b under section 167b and lastly if at all there is a chance of double taxation if at all there is a chance of double taxation there will be a rebate allowed this is 86 red with 110 86 red with 110 this is the entire scheme of things it's an easy chapter nothing to worry hardly anything is there but it is very very important regularly asked in the exam taxation of aopboi taxation of partnership firm taxation of llp everything we'll do one by one chapter by chapter we'll be doing it so whatever we discuss in class that much is more than sufficient for your examination just study that and go of course i'll give you examples and of course we'll be solving the uh, some questions whatever it is at least as a concept capsule will definitely solve first one if you see the definition 2 clause 31 5 basically guys person income tax you know used to charge an individual before and then slowly what people started doing was they started creating an association so an association could be like a firm an association could be a company an association could could also be formed as a hindu undivided family so under different different uh, associations were formed association formed under the indian partnership act went under a firm uh, a firm here sometimes you know firm wherever i use the word company or especially wherever i use the firm in com in uh, income tax act firm includes llp right as except specifically where it is uh, said no for example in presumptive taxation we saw firm excluding llp they have told there so otherwise any association see whether incorporated or not whether you register that association don't register i don't care it that all associations formed whether incorporated or not incorporated legitimate or illegitimate because even illegal income is income the so five of us come together form an association and do some smuggling activities that also will be taxed remember one discussion we had had till now uh, pre incorporation income any income that you derived pre incorporation was it can it be taxed in the hands of the company no we have discussed this companies act allows you to what do you say have pre incorporation contracts provided they are ratified later and brought on record but what about the income under income tax act we saw if you remember guys pre incorporation income will be treated as will be uh, uh, taxable in the hands of the promoters as aop or boi in income tax act association of persons and body of individuals can be used interchangeably can be used interchangeably but essentially speaking association of persons will include not just individuals in a body of individuals there will be only individuals me and you and three other friends come together and start an association it is called a body of individuals that body of individuals can be registered as a partnership firm can be registered as a company all that can happen later but it is actually a body of individuals but aop can be my company let's say advait learning private limited and me and your company xyz private limited and you four of us have come together now this will be association of persons because person will include all these things i hope you know the came to know about the difference reliance and vision express came together to uh, form reliance vision express reliance and grand vision of uh, netherlands came together to have a joint venture maruti suzuki tata and starbucks they are all joint ventures under indian partnership act 
companies cannot enter into a partnership so that partnership between companies is called joint venture and that my dear friends can be an example of what association of persons because two persons are coming together little bit of judicial interpretation just for your knowledge body should receive a wide interpretation perhaps not wide enough to include a combination of individuals who merely receive income jointly without anything further as in their co heirs inheriting shares or securities so basically if my great grandfather left one property in my name and my sister's name and from that we are getting some income are we body of individuals no this was in deccan wine and general stores but certainly wide enough to include a combination of unity of interest and but who are not actuated by a common design and one or more whose members producer or help produce income for the benefit of all so there has to be an intention to create that body if for example if uh, what do you say my great grandfather had a property which me and my sister did not know of he had opened a joint account in our names when we were children only he was and now we have no clue about it assume and money is going to that regularly did we know about it no so that income will be taxed as what body of individuals no but if me and my sister jointly start something that will be called as a body of individuals if it is not registered as a partnership and all those things you see the term individual as used in the act does not mean a single living human being but also include a unit for the purpose of the act so singular includes plural plural includes uh, singular this is there in the general clauses act also general clauses act also clearly says wherever there is masculine there is feminine also wherever there is singular there is plural also and vice versa it is possible to attribute any one of the following three meanings to the expression body of individuals one is association of persons members of the body must have joined together for a purpose of producing income so association of persons body of individual can be used interchangeably provided all are individuals a conglomeration of individuals who happen to have come together but to carry on some activity the view to earn profit or gains obviously is a body of individuals a conglomeration of individuals whatsoever irrespective of the object which brought them together and irrespective of the activities which they carry on also may be called as body of individuals but for income tax purposes there has to be an intention to create I mean, to earn income so it would definitely best best suited in point number 2 if you can see as per the legislature there would be no difference between association and boi correct ejusdem generis cannot be applied to the word person and no specific genus of the word individual everything is an individual here so when i say body of individuals can i use it as uh, what do you say can i say uh, individuals means uh, individual person no because persons you cannot use the word person because in person everybody is covered anyway a body of individuals with respect to income tax act must be carrying on an activity with a view to in, you know get income so as i told you point number b would be the best suited answer i am good in dt you are good in law one more person is good in fema one more person is good in income uh, gst all come together we don't start a partnership firm we don't start an llp we'll just say we'll come together we'll hire an office we'll share an office we'll share the expenses our own stuff my business is mine your business is yours let's have a co working space with a common person who will look after the office receptionist that would be a classic example of body of individuals what is the structure we don't know it's not a firm it's not a llp got it little bit understood yes then what is aop the word associate according to oxford dictionary is to join in a common purpose or join in an action therefore aop must be one in which two or more persons join for a common two or more persons join persons will be individual hoi partnership firm company all those things join for a common purpose everybody is telling the same thing 
volition on the part of the members is an essential ingredient Vol volition means what voluntarily you should come voluntary the noun form of voluntary is called volition where even a minor can join an aop his lawful guardian gives his consent basically uh, my father had bought shares for me and my sister can in the name of the minor assume can the guardian hold shares yes can guardian sorry can minor himself hold shares in a company yes britannia industries was a sl bagri company law case law because guys sir but contract acted agreement with minor is void ab initio mohiri bb versus dharmadas ghosh we had studied sir in ca foundation yes sir you are right but there why because why agreement with minor is void ab initio because personal liability you cannot make the minor personally liable but if i am investing in fully paid up shares of a company and if i am accompanied by a lawful guardian and third if the articles do not expressly prohibit then there is no reason why i cannot hold shares in a company even though i am a minor because let's say even uh, if i do not pay anything there is nothing to pay because it is fully paid shares so in sl bagri versus uh, britannia industries case law it was held that holding fully paid shares where articles do not prohibit anything minor in the presence of a lawful guardian can definitely hold shares in the company by that logic my grandfather had bought 10 uh, 3000 shares of infosys in my and my sister's name and the dividends are coming to them to that joint account which we are not aware of would it be an association of person i already explained in body of individuals no because there was no volition we did not even know about it that's what this murugeshan and sons supreme court judgment actually said associate is to join in a common purpose association does not necessitate does necessitate the excess of volition see everywhere the same thing they are telling it is only when they associate themselves for income producing activity joining together for the purpose of income producing activity by that logic kindly come here page j1 so my dear friends in pgbp was b directive i have come to j don't worry all notes are there but we'll be doing it in any manner that we like ultimately everything will be covered since this was supposed to be a part of pgbp but then because of some feedback i thought i will make it separate sep separate so it will be easier for you to understand no problem study like this it's okay easy sir can i study anything sir i have all your lecture sir seeing your stupid face is boring sir but i have no choice i have to see your stupid face for all chapters but i like tds uh, chapter can i see your stupid face there okay you can stop this and go to tds chapter i'm just saying there are certain some things which interlink but in tds I mean, predominantly not much like if you're doing advanced tax for instance it is better if you have finished assessment procedures because at least you will know all those things so in the manner where the classes are given we can follow the same sequence so the classes are given to you in that sequence only first pgbp now obviously aop boi then form like that it will be given next i think uh, clubbing will be there sir clubbing i don't want to do now sir clubbing i want to do later your wish sir since you have given tds can i just directly start off with tds yes but either way i have to see my stupid face I might as well do in the sequence or if you was or no sir i don't want sir your stupid face i want to see how your stupid face is in tds chapter okay do tds clear yeah aop means two or more person joining for a common purpose already discussed same thing i put here guys whatever cases i showed you know from that i made a gist and put here common action is an object to produce income Mr. Karthik Malik and Company firm and RTZ Private Limited joined together to carry on construction activity. Yes. 
POI denotes persons like executors or trustees who receive the income jointly and visible in a manner and extent as the beneficiaries individually. But we should continue to carry on with it. In my example that I gave you, we did not even know that my grandfather had left that for us. Individual who carried on business a proprietor died leaving behind his three major children. Major children. The children continue to carry on business of the father without forming a partnership. And they will be considered as body of individuals. Any person, company LLP firm can be a member in AOP. However, only individuals can be a member in a POI. There is a common will and desire among the members to voluntarily join an AOP. But in a BOI, it can be slightly dicey. The common will and desire may not be there, but we are aware, we are aware that things are happening. If you are not aware, then it is not BOI, as I showed you in the couple of Supreme Court decisions. In AOP, there should be volition. In BOI, awareness must be there. Common will and desire may be lacking. It may be formed by operation of law. But there is awareness. An AOP can be considered by individuals or non-individuals also or a combination of both. Whereas BOI can only be done by BOI, body of individuals. With that basics in mind, are you with me? Up top? Good. Let me have some water guys. Sir, with water, anything else you won't mix sir? Hey, no doubt. been teaching for so long now importance of water is crazy need to keep some many times i don't remember only to drink water actually yes i keep getting blasted at home for that but true you need to drink a lot of water yes now where were we did you understand my dear friends every single chapter will be taught in depth no missing out no nonsense Structure in your mind. Tomorrow, if I ask you, sir, AOP BOI, structure should be imprinted. 2 clause 31, clause, uh, sub clause 5, 40 BA, section 67A, 86 red width 110, normal rates 167B, AOP BOI done. Next chapter. Yes. Got it? No mugging up. No nonsense. No mugging up at all. Let's see. So, guys, basically, there is no difference between partnership firm and partners. There is no difference, difference between AOP and the individuals uh, and the per persons covered. There is no difference between BOI and persons covered. But for the in the eyes of taxation, there is a difference. In the eyes of taxation, each one is different. So, how does the eyes of taxation vary from, you know, uh, section to section is the idea or from what you say one concept to the other concept forms the basic idea what we are trying to discuss let's see the disallowance under 40 ba under section 40 ba remember section 40 40 a1 40 a1a 40 a1 is what 100 percent non resident not pay tax not paid 1a is 30 percent disallowance 40A1B, equalization levy, remember? Like that. Forty B, I showed you in that question. In PGBP, one uh, 35 AD question was there, if I'm not wrong. In that 40B was there, right? I told you we'll do it during taxation of firms. Forty BA. In the case of association of person or body of an individual other than a company, which means I already told you guys, company also is an AOP BOI. Corporate society is also an AOP BOI actually, or a society under society decision act is also AOP BOI, or under any other law corresponding to that act. Any payment of interest, salary, bonus, commission, or remuneration by whatever name called is disallowed. What all is disallowed? 
what all is disallowed interest salary bonus commission and remuneration by whatever name called interest salary bonus commission remuneration all things are what guys disallowed in their hands made by such association or body to a member of such association or body so that will be disallowed there and it will be what taxable in the hands of whom taxable in the hands of the concerned individual very, very simple so i told you know all of us come together and say sir let's not do an association let's not do a partnership let's not do an llp i will bring my own stuff you will bring your own business each of us will bring our own business and we'll pool in and pay for the common expenses the rent that we pay to the aop now that's an association the rent that we pay to an aop is it allowed or disallowed allowed rent is allowed i give loan to the aop i am a member member gives loan to the aop aop pays interest any interest paid is allowed because they are trying to tell there is no difference between you and the aop why don't you understand do you know which is one of the largest aop bois of india you will be shocked to know one of the largest aop bois of india you will be shocked to know my dear friends was the bombay stock exchange ha huh? yes bombay stock exchange bsc started off as a body of individuals 100 years ago all the brokers came together and said let us start this particular venture of ours and let us let it be dalal street called dalal street so they started trading in the physical securities of companies in mumbai only bombay initially they started under a banyan tree and later they went to this place in mumbai all these companies they were tra you know trading securities like this like one paper let me take one paper here like this securities they were standing on these benches and trading each stock broker each stock broker was a trader and each that trader had his trading rights there were some uh, if i'm not wrong around 1000 2000 5000 i think maximum trading rights that's it no trading rights were allowed you had to purchase that the association value was a trading right actually so all of us came together there'll be a head of that uh, body of individuals at the end of the month one fellow is to come with a begging bowl sir rent sir sir rent sir i occupied one corner of the uh, stock exchange i used to pay my rent and close it income fully mine expenses who has to bo who has to bear personal other you know related to my business me common expense of rent only i'll pay to the boi outside world will be looking at this and if they have come to know that we have no structure it is shameful one man changed this who is he manmohan singh he came to them and said bro body of individuals really stock market is the economic barometer of the country it is the economic barometer of the country and you are you know begging like beggars here every every month for rent please have a structure when he was a finance minister he told and uh, this body of individuals was already there for many many years 
when you are a monopoly and nobody is there to attack you will you listen to the government no this body of individuals bsc told manmohan singh tu kon hai be chal nikal who the hell are you get out teri aukat kya hai correct what standing do you have to come and tell me do you know who i am who told bsc manmohan singh said bro shift to a company company is better structure take public funding bsc broker said tu kon hai be chal nikal manmohan singh said okay sure no problem to counter bombay stock exchange body of individuals the great manmohan singh under the security contract regulation act started a concept called national stock exchange which was a company he brought management from the oxford university and his all is he was a professor there oxford harvard he got all the best people to come and sit on the board here he opened up the money for the public he brought in online trading and he opened up the entire markets to whole of india and not just bombay within a matter of years or months bsc collapsed bsc people came beggars body of individuals came sir please sir class sir please sir manmohan singh could have told kya bola tune tu kon hai be chal nikal he didn't tell anything he said okay i hereby order you to convert your body of individuals to a company right now and brokers you are only the owners brokers you are only the managers brokers you are only the traders i want you to split everything ownership should be different uh management must be different traders must be different convert to company under scra brought about a concept called corporatization conversion of body of individuals to company and he said i'm going to cut your powers if you are a broker remain a broker don't enter into management i'll allow your representation but you will not manage you are not the owner i will allow you ownership only to the tune of 49% 59% public should own demutualization a body of individuals was converted to corporate co company corporatization and the powers were cut off demutualization sweeping change by manmohan singh and he said i am not going to close you down now you compete that is why we have two exchanges my dear friends nsc and bsc that is the best example of body of individuals did you understand arthayata parinjita maple solunga sir chapandi sir chapapa chappu understood bye bye it's okay you give it to the screen others should feel you are mad your mother will be like that fellow recorded class my son my daughter hifi is giving mad icai we already joined here are already mad correct your mother mom and dad will like what kind of a son do we have what kind of a daughter we have giving hi fi to faculty through laptop it's okay da give da come on yes got it come back now taxation taxation my old lover law little bit i have to impress my old lover also no have to think about my old lover also that's why i connect both but as a ca student you should know both right institute also brought about sweeping changes which gave me an opportunity to explore this wonderful old long lost love what love okay award income tax 
come back please understand from a holistic point of view my dear friends not like one bloody donkey donkey and horse they will put the blinders no oh, okay 23 40b a 7a 167b 86 231 40b a 86 110 67b no right think about it what is aop what could be the best example how it is done yes they will never forget come back hey teach that enough oh sorry sir. 40 ba interest salary bonus commission remuneration right hmm bricks i generally don't do mnemonics but i'm just did now b r i c s bricks leave it guys i hate this doing this mnemonics yeah because it's bullshit bonus remuneration interest salary commission bricks just try to remember i just did it now i was seeing what all from that time i'm seeing i first did isb indian school of business then i did uh, cr cr doesn't make sense then rc i'm very bad at this but anyway now bricks bricks is good sir brick spelling is k k is silent we are doing ca not bcom hey sir bricks is b r i c k s sir K is silent, bro. We are doing C, eh, no? Not it won't be so easy, also. Correct, no? If I use the word pass and say P is silent, you know what will happen? Donkey will become. Yes. Now. There's an AOP or BOI. And one member, onion. Onion is member. AOP BOI is there. Nandini is the AOP BOI name. My Tamil movie watching friends will understand this. So AOP BOI is a member, onion. Mr. Onion. Mr. Onion, what do you say? Pays interest of 10,000. Pays interest of 10,000 rupees to AOP BI on his drawings. On his drawings. Nandini AOP BOI pays how much? 14,000 rupees interest on loan or capital of onion. Disallowance under 40 BA. Is it 14K? Or can I set off 14 minus 10, 4K? Was the question for which we have explanation 1. Where interest is paid by an association or body to any member thereof who has also, 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 means same guy. Where interest is paid by association to onion, who has also paid interest to association, amount of interest to be disallowed under this clause shall be limited to the amount by which the payment of interest exceeds the payment of interest by the member. Set off is allowed. 4K as per explanation 1 to 40 BA. Set off allowed. Set off is allowed. Case number A. Case number B. Instead of fourteen thousand, let's make it sixteen thousand. 
he'll pay on his drawings. 40 BA disallowance will be nil. Income of 2000 rupees will be what? Taxable in the hands of AOP BOI. Taxable in the hands of AOP BOI. Got it? AOP BOI. Pays interest to onion who is a member twenty thousand one more fellow. Mr. Ambi, he pays interest, 12,000. What do you think? Possible or not? Possible or not? See? Who has also, who has also, who has also? It must be the same person. If this is the case, guys, no set off. AOP, BOI, disallowance under 40 BA. 20k income chargeable to tax 12k because both must be the same person both must be the same person those who have watched the movie don't tell sir both are the same person hey both are different in this example da please sir both no sir Nandini, AOP, BO. Hey. In the movie, different. Here, it's different people, okay? Don't get confused. Don't write. Onion and Remo, Ambi are the same. Remo also will come. All the three people are the same. Those who have not watched the movie, leave it. Those who have watched the movie, laugh and be quiet. Sir, I don't want to laugh. Your stupid jokes. Don't feel like laughing. Don't laugh. Okay, no problem. I can't anyway see you. I am known for my poor jokes. My parents named me also like that, PJ. They knew my son will become one mega PJ cracker. He will make people cringe, cringe, thinking that why did I take up CA? Why did I take up this fellow's class? Why do I have to see his stupid face? Yes. Right? Sir, both are the same people. No. Overthinking, don't do. Just example I did, that's all. Next. Let's say. This is one fellow, single, yes, so he is the karta, Mr. Mutte Boss. Remember Shivaji movie? Ah. 
मिस्टर मोटे बॉस इज द करता ऑफ एच एफ नेम्ड लकल का हाउ कनेक्शन एंड ऑल डोंट टास्क सर हाउ एच एफ एज अ नेम डोंट टास्क सच स्टूपिट क्वेश्चन देर वॉज एच एफ कॉल्ड लक 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 एंड हु इज द करता पीढ़ी मोटे बॉस इट बी टू मेक फन गाइस अदरवाइज इट्स बोरिंग Yes or no? Yes. Come on. Once again, let's uh, ensure your parents feel you are mad again. Yes. H F was there. Lakalaka was the H F name. And uh, who is the karta? Mote boss. And this H F was the member of. N A O P B O I named Rara, sir. Please, yes. So very simple. H F called Lakalaka was the member of what? I am only feeling like laughing. A O P B O I called Rara, and through whom? Through whom? Through Mr. Motte Boss. Of course, H F cannot become so. He was who was. Uh, This Motte boss, he was rep. He was in the representative capacity. So in AOP BOI Rara, who is sitting? Motte boss is sitting in individual capacity or representative capacity? Representative capacity. Simple, representative capacity. No. This AOP BOI. This AOP BOI pays interest of ten thousand to HF. Interest on capital. It also pays interest on loan fifteen thousand Motte boss also has given a loan. See, this is condition A, condition B, condition C. He has also given a loan. in the individual capacity this is the important thing he is given a loan in the individual capacity for which aop bio has given him interest point number d interest of 8000 rupees aop bio has given interest to मोटे बॉस कॉर्ड इट इन हूज कैपेसिटी इंडिविजुअल कैपेसिटी नॉट एज अ रिप्रेजेंटेटिव नाउ टेल मी ए एंड बी राइट डाउन यर ट्रांजेक्शन ए बी डी Interest ten thousand, fifteen thousand interest on loan, and eight thousand interest paid to Karta in the individual capacity, allowed or disallowed. Let us read explanation two to forty B A. Where an individual, Motte boss, is a member of an A O P Rara, for the benefit of. For the benefit of any other person, any other person is HF laka laka. Such member, such member, mote boss. Here in after refer to as member in a representative capacity, and person so represented. Person so represented is HF. Member in representative capacity is whom, mote boss, and. Interest paid by the association or body to such individual, 
or by such individual to the association or body otherwise than as member in a representative capacity otherwise than as member in representative capacity shall not be taken into account for the purpose of this clause I will add one more masala here this fellow also paid interest 3000 rupees paid interest 3000 rupees on loan given by aop boi in individual capacity on loan given by aop in individual capacity that also will add your e 3000 rupees so in the hands of aop boi what are they trying to tell interest paid by association 8000 or interest paid by such individual to the association 3000 otherwise than as member in representative capacity means what in individual capacity shall not be taken into account for the purpose of this clause so no disallowance under 40 ba interest paid by the association to such individual as member in a representative capacity and interest paid by the association to the person so represented paid by the association to the person so represented hf or by the person so represented whatever case may be shall be taken into account basically they are trying to tell whether aop paid it to hf or whether aop paid it to karta if it is paid in a representative capacity motte boss is called a person in representative capacity and lakha lakha hf is called as the person so represented so aop boi whether they paid it to karta whether they paid it to hf doesn't matter but if it is paid in a representative capacity for the business 10000 and 20 15000 is allowed under 40 ba this 3000 rupees received from this karta taxable in the hands of aop boi this interest paid on loan on this loan given by karta on an individual capacity this is allowed under 3613 if you remember interest we discussed subject to 482 sir what is 482 sir 482 second or third class few classes into the pgp we did excessive payments made to related parties excessive payments understand guys understood check the notes everything is given where a member who received interest from aop boi also pays interest to the aop boi during the year only the excess interest paid shall be disallowed example 1 did example 2 where a person is a member in his representative capacity in the aop or boi and if he received interest in his individual capacity such interest shall not be disallowed simple words have given but here this example you should remember okay easy no chiller next 
Dan guys next. Mr. Vikram is a member in his individual capacity in a Hindu undivided family. Sorry, in a AOP. Loki. Mr. Vikram is also the Karta of a Hindu undivided family. Of a Hindu undivided family called Dili. Now, Mr. I mean, AOP BOI pays interest on capital rupees 10,000. Pays, this is point number A. Point number B pays interest on loan given by Mr. Vikram in his individual capacity 8,000. HUF had given the loan also, loan of 2 lakh at 10% per annum interest. So the AOP BOI Loki is giving, paying interest at 20k to Vikram as the Karta, who is then passing it on to HF. Now tell me guys, now tell me guys, point number A, 10,000, point number B, 8,000. Point number C, 10, sorry, this should be D, should be E. Point number D, interest of 20,000, what to do? What do you think? it out. Explanation 3. Where an individual Vikram is a member of an AOP, Loki, otherwise than as a member in representative capacity means what if he is there in the individual capacity. Interest paid by the association to such individual shall not be taken into account for the purpose of this clause if the interest is received by him for the benefit of any other person. Means what guys? Whatever this interest, 10,000, is he receiving it? Yes. But is it for his purpose or any other purpose? His purpose only. This will be disallowed. This 8,000, is he receiving it? Yes. Is it for his purpose or any other purpose? His purpose only. So these two will be disallowed. 40 BA. What will not be disallowed is interest paid by AOP and BOI to Mr. Vikram. Which is actually for on benefit uh, for the what do you say purposes of 
or for the benefit of or on behalf of some other person that is hf so this 20000 will be allowed under 3613 subject to 482 subject to 482 done check out done my dear friends very easy HUF is a member in AOP POI, but of course through his karta. Mr. Karthik. AOP BOI pays salary 20,000 rupees to Mr. Karthik in his individual capacity, in his individual capacity. And without what do you say? This particular salary without having Karthik on board, it will be a problem. So, what do you think? Will explanation to apply? Check it out. Explanation two. Where an individual Karthik is a member or as of association for the benefit of any other person, yes, he is there what? Member in representative capacity. Interest is paid by the association to such individual. Otherwise than as member in representative capacity. Are they paying him otherwise than representative capacity? Yes, they are paying in individual capacity. Shall not be taken into account. So this salary of 20,000. Is it a load or disallowed? If you write a load, it will be 100% wrong, my dear friends. Please see here. Interest, 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 not salary. Oh, yes. Interest. Not salary, interest. Very clearly given. Rashik Lal and Company. Supreme Court, 20K disallowed as explanation to does not cover salary, covers only what guys, interest, interest, interest. Planning can pay to Kartik relative. Pay to Kartik's daughter, son, sibling. What will happen? Nothing will happen. Basically, hire them, no problem. 
subject to 48 excessive payments right excessive payments done buddies so we are doing every everything in depth as usual so we are done with what this this allowance is also done next the members share is what we need to discuss guys yeah so huf and all the people use it as a tool for uh, tax planning so called tax planning it's actually tax evasion So in the 1980s, no, what people used to do? Each person used to open some random AOPs. Some random AOPs. Okay. 99.99 percent .99 share was for that person. Mr. KD, KD fellow. So KD fellow used to open many AOPs. 99.99% share to him. 0.01% share to some random friend, relative and all those things. Each of these AOPs, they have normal tax rates. What tax rates? Individual tax rates. Because there is no difference between AOP, BOI and a person. So that basic exemption limit he also used to claim 2.5 lakh I mean assume now um, the recent uh, DL 2.5, 2.5, 2.5 tax evasion used to happen so slowly in the early 90s this was in the 80s and the late 80s slowly in the early 90s what did government do Government still continue taxing AOP at individual rates, but they made one rule that the share of a person in the AOP should be mentioned in his individual return also. What are all the AOPs you have and in each AOP how much share you have you had to mention. To do curb this also from happening earlier it was paper return guys the people used to tell they stopped writing the share only they were telling not decided to be discussed agreement not done yet don't know like that so government got pissed off government they said bro this is too much if you give me your share okay you give me your share, I will save you. You don't give the share. I will treat the share as indeterminate. And I will charge at the highest rate possible. Die. Go die. Highest rate possible. What is the highest rate possible, guys? Your 40% plus your cess and all this put together. It will come up to almost, if I am not wrong, 42.74%. I will charge at the highest rate possible that I can tax any person. And this will be called as MMR. What is that MMR? Maximum marginal rate. Maximum marginal rate. Deadly. Deadly provision. I will tax the AOP at the highest rate. And I will make the individual, I will exempt the individual from tax. No problem. That share I will exempt. No problem. That share in your hands I will exempt. One time only I will tax. In your hands, exempt. But AOP will have to pay at MMR. AOP will have to pay at MMR deadly rate. Correct? 30% tax. Surcharge. Surcharge, highest surcharge is 37% surcharge on this. Then the 4%. Health and education says 
सेवन फोर पर परसेंट डाई हाईएस्ट रेट एओपी कैन हैव फॉरेन कंपनी आल्सो एओपी कैन हैव फॉरेन एलएलपी आल्सो एओपी कैन बी एनीबडी राइट सो व्हाट वुड बी द रेट फॉर देम फोर्टी परसेंट टैक्स प्लस सेवन परसेंट सरचार्ज प्लस फोर परसेंट सो दैट विल बी अराउंड फोर्ट if foreigners are involved that is what they told here in mm-hmm. 67a manner and 167b they inserted 167b for indeterminate taxation indeterminate share See method of computing member share in the income of association of persons or body of individuals. Now to apportion and where it is unknown. Maximum marginal rate. Where the individual shares of the members of association, etc., are indeterminate or unknown, tax shall be charged on the total income at the maximum marginal rate. Where the total income of any member of such association or body is chargeable to tax at a rate which is higher than maximum marginal rate. For example, if one of the people in the association is a foreign company, or if it's a Or in what do you say LLP, whatever it is, tax shall be charged on the total income at such higher rate, deadly. At such higher rate. So this is the rule, important to remember. Where shares are determinate and known, this formula, one sixty seven B two. Where shares are indeterminate and unknown, one sixty seven B one. Important. This only they will ask in the exam as a numerical. Come here first. We'll do this easily. It's done. Where none of the members are taxable at a rate higher than the maximum marginal rate. None of the members are taxable at a rate higher than maximum marginal marginal rate. Which means what? You are either a individual or an Indian company. Entire income of AOP BO is taxable at MMR. Where any member is taxable at a tax higher rate means one foreign company is there in this. Entire income of the AOP is taxable at such higher rate. Initially you played around, you did not write the rate. The moment you came to know about this, suddenly you started. No, no, sir. Actually, you know, we forgot. Actually, actually. Government said, "Bro, enough. You are actually I know. One more clause they added. See, this is also in part of the law. Shares of the member of AOP or BI shall be deemed to be indeterminate or unknown if such shares are indeterminate or unknown on the date of formation or any time thereafter. When did you form this AOP, sir? Last year, sir. That time, what share did you show? An indeterminate, sir. Oh, no pay. I hear it. No, no, sir. Actually, no." No, actually, why didn't you write that there? Yes, government will not leave you. You cannot play around with the government. We are all small crooks. Who's a bigger crook? Okay, I didn't say anything. Hey, I didn't say anything. Correct. We are all small-time criminals. Rolex, Rolex is sitting on top, right? That's fine. See here, where none of the members have taxable income means what? All the members less than basic exemption limit. Excluding the share of income from AOP, 
AOP is taxable at the normal rates applicable to an individual. Taxable at what rate? You come here. Computation I told you no. 67A, 86 and 110. We'll read here only. It's enough. AOP or BOA is taxed at normal rates applicable to an individual. Share of the member is also taxed as per 67A. So, if AOP is also taxed, let me tell you, if AOP BOI is also taxed at individual rates, if AOP BOI is taxed, at individual rates then what about the member member is also taxed I'll just show you why I'm writing this member also will be taxed as per 67a If AOP, BOI are taxed at individual rates, member also is taxed at 67A. When will AOP, BOI taxed at individual rate? See here. When none of the members have taxable income excluding the share of income from AOP. Individually, they are less than basic exemption limit. Only if you add the income it will increase otherwise it is less than basic exemption limit then only normal rates where any member has taxable income excluding the share of AOP means what member individually will anyway pay tax the AOP is taxable at maximum marginal rate at 42.744% if AOP BO is taxed at MMR, here I am writing member share. If AOP BO is taxed at MMR, then you see maximum marginal rate or higher rate, share of the member is not taxable under 86. No tax. At 86. If AOP BOI is not taxed at all, or this is higher rate, you see, when any member is taxable at a rate higher than the maximum marginal rate, that is foreign company, and the income of AOP to the extent of the share of the member is taxable at such higher rate and balance it taxable at marginal rate. So for the foreign company, it is higher rate. That is at 43.6% and for others it is 42.744%. 42 That's fine. So if you see, same here. If AOP or BO is taxed at higher than MMR, again, for some it is higher than MMR, for others it is MMR. For individual share, no tax at 86 what if AOP BI is not taxed at all in that situation? If it is not taxed at all, then obviously, guys, share of member will be included in the total income and tax at the rates applicable to him. But this, there will be a tax, obviously. If you see here, AOP BI is paying tax. No tax, no double tax. AOP BI is paying tax, no tax, no double tax. AOP BI not paying any tax, member is paying tax, no double tax. 
AOP BOI is paying individual rates. A B C income two lakh two lakh two lakh. AOP income is nine lakh. Individually two lakh two lakh two lakh. Now this three lakh three lakh is added to their share. If they take the income without considering share of AOP BOI, they are less than the basic exemption limit. But AOP BOI is now taxed at individual rate. They are also taxed, and this three lakh three lakh three lakh is added here, and they are also taxed. Individuals went and said cheating. That is why, my dear friends, only for this particular case. There is a rebate, obviously, right? It is what is this? Rebate. Rebate will be granted for this. Rebate will be granted for the first case only. will be a tax rebate right there would be a tax rebate what is the first case none of the members have taxable income none of the members have taxable income so again go through here i'll revise again None of the members have taxable income means everybody is less than basic exemption limit, excluding the share of income from AOP. Of course, if the share you add, so basically uh, the AOP is also taxed, individual is also taxed, rebate will be granted. Where only member has taxable income, excluding the share of income. So member anyway has taxable income. So here in this case, I will tax the AOP at MMR at forty two point seven four four, and whatever share that the individual get will be exempt. No need to pay tax. Where any member is taxable at a higher rate, like there are three Indian members, one foreign member. For a foreign member, higher rate. For Indian member, why foreign member higher rate? For tax planning only, you would have done no. For tax planning only, you would have done AOP to escape taxation. They said nothing doing for you, either your individual or with AOP, you will have to pay that amount, higher rate. And for others, MMR. For uh, the member share in the hands of the members, not taxable. very very simple member share is an expert let's let's do a few examples here and then go to the when i whenever i say member share member share member share what exactly is member share with that with an example we'll do and then dissolution over questions will come from this area only i'm not joking easy it is let's see an aop as mr x mr y x y z limited company has come total income individually of this guy nil nil they have some 20000 income tell me will it come under point number 1 where none of the members have so taxable income no no why mr x will be less than basic exemption limit mr y will be less than basic exemption limit for a company there is no bl no basic exemption limit for company hence aop taxed at mmr member share exempt Got it? Member share is exempt. Second, AOP, Mr. X total income nil, Mr. Y total income nil, X Y Z limited has negative income of thirty thousand. Mr. 
does the aop have taxable income no hence aop taxed at individual rates member share taxed at members hands rebate hope you are understanding guys and just not blindly writing yes or no negative income there is no taxability the word uses taxable income means where how can i tax this cannot tax to be taxable income that's what it says no see here none of the members are sorry none of the members have taxable income excluding the share of income from aop there is an aop company a company b and a foreign company taxable income nil 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 this will not come under case one guys you cannot say none of the members have taxable income excluding share of income okay they may have so but see this where any member is taxable at a rate higher than mmr the moment of foreign fellow is included here moment a foreign person is included here aop tax debt for foreign company higher than mmr for company a company b mmr individual shares not taxed exempt clear some other examples hatke examples these are apart from the normal stuff that we do hope you understood my dear friends now see the computation how it works method of computing member share in the income of aop boi as follows total income of the aop boi so and so amount less interest salary bonus commission other remuneration bricks paid to any member should be subtracted from the total income of aop boi balance is apportionable among the members obviously i have to subtract that and only the balance because it's disallowed disallowed under 40 ba correct i'll subtract from there whatever is paid to any member right and then add it here to the share of income to the member guys nice, uh, don't get confused don't ask me sir disallowed means you have to add no bro that is for aop We are calculating the computation for what? For the members. See, if the profit is after everything is hundred, 
of which 20 is interest and salary assume in the aop this is the profit that i am sharing right among everybody but in the aop taxation what i will do i will add back this 20 and make it 120 this is the total income if they are given the total income of the aop i have to subtract this 20 no obviously only then i will get the 100 which i was supposed to apportion so don't get confused i use the word disallowed that doesn't mean you add back this actually is the disallowance portion here while computing the income of aop you add back here I am talking about member share. Obviously, from the total income of AOP, I should subtract to bring about the profits. This is the profit. For example, if profit of AOP was 100, 100 lakhs, 100 crores, whatever. Let's say there was disallowance of 43B, 30. Plus, there was salary disallowance, 20. Overall, 150. So, AOP will pay tax on this because your double taxation is happening. For the this fellow, what do you say, for the share, for this A, B, C, D, they are members. This is shared equally, assume 25, 25, 25, 25. Now, this is shared, no, this is shared. So, what I should do? What should I do? I should take the total 150 and subtract what? This 20. Subtract this 20. And then do the needful. 43B I need not touch. 43B I need not touch because 43 is the disallowance for whom? It is for disallowance for the, uh, what do you say, AOP BOI, not for the member. So, should not touch that. So, predominantly it was 100 of which I disallowed this 30. So, overall became 130. While computing this on this salary, you see, first I have added here and taxed. And this salary again I am adding. Profit you leave. Salary again I am adding. I am taxing it twice. That is why there will be a rebate. You see, when we solve questions, you will understand. But I just want to explain. Do not get confused here. Total income, less. Because I want to uh, get the balance apportioned among the members. This is the balance to be apportioned. It will be apportioned. So, share of income of the member will be so and so. Whatever share he gets, plus he will add the salary interest bonus also, which is received, obviously. It is taxed there also, it is being taxed here also, total share. Now, in case, if I have to give capital to you, to the AOP, and I have borrowed from somewhere else, I have borrowed from somewhere else, will that tax, will that, uh, what do you say, uh, interest paid also will be allowed? Many court decisions have told yes amount that you have borrowed to invest in the capital of the AOP, that interest paid on the amount borrowed individually will be allowed, so that I have to subtract. This is important adjustment. Generally, students ignore this. Interest paid on capital borrowed by him for the purpose of investment and after doing everything, this will be the net accessible share of income. In this, I will get rebate. How will I get rebate? I will get rebate based on the average rate of income tax. Very easy to remember. You see, there is nothing to remember. No mugging up. Conceptual. See, Mr. Nikhil share from AOP is 3 lakhs and his own income taxable is 2 lakh 50 thousand. So, 3 lakh and 2 lakh 50 thousand overall 5.5 lakh. In this case, as Mr. Nikhil share is known, the AOP is taxed at the normal rate applicable to an individual. And Mr. Nikhil's total income also includes share of 5,50,000. That entire thing is 5,50,000. Tax payable. Total income of Nikhil including this AOP share. 3 lakh plus 2 lakh 50 is how much? 5,50,000. So basically guys, tax payable on the total income on 5.5 lakhs comes up to 23,400. 23,000. 400 right so it's very simple for 5 lakh 50 thousand he is paying how much 23,400 right and for 3 lakhs how much is he paying? He is paying 23,400 into 3 lakh divided by 5,50,000. 
that comes up to 12,764. On the overall 5 lakh 50, he is paying 23,400. And only on 3 lakhs, he is paying 12,764. From that 23,400, I should remove that 12,764 because I was not at all liable to pay. It is only rebate. He is only liable to pay 10,636. What these fellows have done now, again as usual to complicate things. First, they have made the average tax. Average tax is total tax paid divided by total income. You will get 0.045%. Basically, they have done this only. This represented as a percentage. Then they have done 3 lakh into this percentage. 0.0425%. I will go by the common sense proportional method. For 5 lakh 50,000, you have paid a tax of 23,400. For 3 lakh, how much you should not have paid, but you have paid. I have paid 12,764, which should not have been paid. Remove that and close it. And some important notes. The head of income under which the share of members shall be taxable is the same. In the same head of income as taxable in the hands of AOP BOI. AOP BOI is house property means for you also house property. For AOP BOI, PGBP. For you also it is PGBP. Special rates of income tax, income in the hands of AOP BOI shall be taxable at special rates if the AOP BOI pays tax at slab rate. For example, LTCG under section 112A at 10% in excess of 1 lakh rupees, STCG under section 11A at 15%, etc. If they also pay the same, you also have to pay the same. If AOP BOI pays tax MMR, then special income also shall be taxed at MMR. Special income in the first class we had done little and capital gains will understand that, you leave it. What happens if the AOP BOI discontinues? Where any business or profession carried on by AOP has been discontinued or dissolved, assessing officer shall make an assessment of the total income of such AOP as if no such discontinuance has taken place. And the same, all the provisions of the act will apply as if nothing has happened. And whoever were there, the members and the AOP basically will be charged. Every person who was a member of the AOP at the time of such discontinuance or dissolution, including the legal representative of the deceased member, at the time of discontinuance, whoever was the member, including the legal heir, shall be jointly and severally liable. They should pay jointly also and individually also have, they have to pay. Sir, on the date that uh, member died, I don't care, legal representative I should hold. The liability of the legal representative shall obviously be restricted to the value of the estate inherited from the deceased member. So AOP, the penalty is let's say 100 crores, sorry, or let's say 1 crore. Four people are there, A, B, C, D. Each of them have to pay 25, 25 lakhs. D, Damar. D for Damar, gone. D's property is shifted to his son, F. The property value is 10 lakhs, but his father's liability is 25 lakhs. Should he pay 25 lakhs or 10 lakhs? Law says only 10 lakhs. That's what it means. Liability of the deceased member shall be restricted to the value of estate inherited from the deceased member. If discontinence or dissolution takes place after any proceedings, the proceedings can be continued from a stage at which the proceedings stood at the time of discontinence or dissolution. So, if there are any legal proceedings that are happening, then the legal proceedings can start from the place where the proceedings were at the time of discontinuance or dissolution. So, if there is any dissolution happening after any legal proceedings, means the court asks you to dissolve. The court asks you to dissolve. So, what should I take now? The state of affairs as on the date of the proceedings. You see, the proceedings can be continued from a stage at which the proceedings stood at the time of discontinuance or dissolution. So, at that time, what was the status? That status only can be taken forward. Irrelevant point, leave it. If the AO is satisfied that the AOP was guilty of any acts, penalty also can be imposed. <coughs> With a view to reduce their tax burden, persons have huge taxable income may shift a portion of their income to persons who do not have taxable income. Hence, the income derived by such other person 
may be clubbed with the transferers income and be taxed so as to protect the interest of the revenue and similarly we have the uh, benami law as well to cover the same so as far as transfer is concerned transfer as far as transfer is concerned this transfer is covered under what section number 63 defines what is a transfer we will see and the transfer can be two types one is what transfer of income without transfer of assets or could be what transfer of asset could be transfer of asset transfer of asset so transfer of asset also could be to spouse could be due, due to son's wife or it could be what other cases right other cases so if it is you know any assets which are transferred to a spouse spouse and of course guys transfer here let's see section 63 just to understand whatever section i want that only will not come everything else will come yes gives the transfer a right to shall be deemed to be revocable and then transfer includes any settlement trust covenant agreement or arrangement see settlement can be a marriage settlement now if the marriage settlement happens will this uh, clubbing come we'll see trust i will create a trust a group of people and i will transfer the assets there that will look after some beneficiaries beneficiaries can be children uh, spouse covenant covenant is a restriction or a benefit for example that's what no the gr grandfather will transfer the asset to me is it a benefit or a restriction benefit but what is the restriction restriction is i need to transfer 50000 rupees to somebody else covenant yes agreement or arrangement arrangement is something which has an oral agreement agreement here generally means written but arrangement is what it is an understanding need not be in writing that is called arrangement just for your knowledge these are all based on decided case laws so obviously rather than me going to each and every case law i'm trying to tell you in a in the limited time that we have 161 70 hours good enough for you to understand what all questions may come in the examination then of course revocable we will see that revocable concept revocable means what it contains any provision for retransfer of the asset back to you revocable or in any way gives the transfer right to reassume power directly or indirectly so i can take back the power that is called revocable transfer that is the tra different definition of transfer and revocable transfer it is given here so as far as spouse is concerned it is 6414 son's wife again one second for a spouse also adequate consideration inadequate consideration son's wife also adequate in adequate so for adequate consideration clubbing will not apply if i give it on for the particular amount whatever it is market value why will it apply it will not, not apply obviously inadequate consideration inadequate consideration if i am selling a house other than house for son's wife again if for inadequate consideration transferring a house other than house other than house one is house one more is what guys other than the house 
वन इज हाउस अदर देन हाउस सो गाइस इफ इट इज हाउस नो फॉर इन एडिक्वेट कंसिडरेशन देर इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट कॉल्ड डीम ओनर अंडर सेक्शन ट्वेंटी सेवन इट्स अदर देन हाउस वी हैव सेक्शन सिक्सटी फोर वन फोर But for son's wife, section twenty-seven will not come. Sixty-four one six. Why? An individual who transfer otherwise than for adequate consideration means what for inadequate consideration any house property to his or her spouse. If you see the what do you say? a uh, son's wife is not covered here under section 27 we'll come to that later so this is the overall structure you should understand the overall structure right other cases in other cases i need to see whether it is revocable transfer again defined in i mean the revocable transfer is covered in section 61 definition of revocable given in section 63 irrevocable section 62 exception to section 61 income transfer of income without transfer of assets this is given under section number 60 so this my dear buddies is the entire scheme of things with respect to transfer similarly now clubbing is also covered for minor children minor children is covered under 64 1a we'll see that in a while 64 1a is for minor children are you with me yes this is the entire scheme of things the full structure should be in your mind so when you say okay spouse if it's inadequate consideration for house it is section 27 deemed owner concept whereas other than house this will come all that logic we will see in a while now let's come to section 1 by 1 section 60 divide and rule policy section 60 come on chapter 5 income of other person including in assets of total assets total ssc assets, total income transfer of income where there is no transfer of assets all income arising to any person by virtue of a transfer we understood what is transfer whether revocable or irrevocable i don't care whether affected before or after commencement whether there is no transfer of assets but where only income is transferred will chargeable to the income tax as the income of the transferor and shall be included in his total income so you see here Mr. Ray is carrying on business. Declares that the profit derived from such business shall belong to his brother. He will declare. Mr. B without transferring the entire business. So Mr. Ray says the whatever profits now, whatever it goes, it goes to my son. For example, I have a property. I will say the rent should go to my uh, son. Actually, it happened. We were living in one of the uh, rented premises uh, when I was doing BCom. I remember. So that person, he was a ex-banker, retired guy. and he gave it to his son basically it said now the land i mean the owner i am only the owner but the rent is now to be given to son because son was not doing too well unfortunately son passed away also recently he was like he's not old but then of course he had some heart attack or something and he passed away nice guy sad so if you see yes so the landlord has transferred his money his uh, source to the son so that will be clubbed with the landlord with the landlord or landlord son only 
it will be clubbed with the landlord. So, we will be clubbed in the income of Mr. A. What about this? MS Subulakshmi, do you know? Correct. Singer. In lieu of amazing singer. Morning, morning in our South Indian homes. You know, your Suprabhatam will come. That is by the great MS Subulakshmi. Suprabhatam. Yes. In view of the remuneration for acting in a movie, the producer granted the right to exploit the movie for a limited period in a defined territory. It was held that this was a transfer of asset and not income. Thus, clubbing of under section 60 will not apply. So, instead of remuneration, they gave like a share of profit or exploitation. So, in this particular case, it was not clubbing at all is what this particular court held way back. Ah, clubbing of income in case of revocable transfer of asset, revocable transfer. When there is a revocable transfer of any asset by a person to another person, any income arising from such asset shall be included in the total income of the transferer and taxed accordingly. Revocable transfer means an asset where the right to take back the asset is there. Example, you see, Mr. X transfers an asset to his friend. Why uh, spouse not covered? For spouse, there is a specific section. For spouse, we have a specific section. So, the specific section will override the general section, right? Right. So, that is what section 60 says, 61 we are seeing. Mr. X transfers an asset to a friend, Mr. Y, with the condition that Mr. Y needs to return the asset after 10 years. In this case, transfer is called revocable. Though the income from the asset is received by Mr. Y, it is always taxed in the hands of Mr. X by virtue of section 61. But the exception is what guys? Reverse. Exception is this. When the transfer is not revocable, means what? I will give the asset to you in an irrevocable transfer, which it cannot be cancelled. What is irrevocable transfer? Just say, uh, let's check 61. All the income arising to any person by virtue of a revocable, sorry, 62. We will see 62. Provisions of section 61 shall not apply, means what? Exception to section 61 is section 62. 61 is revocable, 61, uh, 62 is irrevocable. Uh, to any income arising to any person by virtue of transfer, by way of trust, which is not revocable during the lifetime of the beneficiary, and in any case of any transfer, which is not revocable during the lifetime of the transferee. Before you leave that. Transferer derives no direct or indirect benefit from such income in either case. So, if onion creates a trust, correct? He has an irrevocable transfer means what? He will transfer the entire what do you say? House property or whatever it is. So, if you see one more, I will explain both with an example. All income arising to any person by virtue of any such transfer shall be chargeable as income tax of the transferor as and when the power to revoke the transfer arises and shall then be included in his total income and shall then be included in his total income. He will transfer his uh, house property to a trust and this will be irrevocable transfer. So, in this trust, they, the beneficiaries will be all girls whose names are Nandini. Don't ask the logic and all. It's just a stupid example just to make you understand. Everyone who is named Nandini, several from 20 girls will be there. He is looking after the education. Anyan has become very nice now. That is the trust. The house property etc. has been transferred irrevocably. Correct? So, obviously in this particular case, will the income be clubbed at the hands of Anyan? No. Because I very clearly says there, by way of trust, which is not revocable during the lifetime of the beneficiary. As and when those 20 girls still they are alive, nothing will be taxed in onion's hand. The transferer derives no direct or indirect benefit from such an income. 
benefit here should be looked at what financial benefit sir anyan is getting satisfaction of helping nandinis no right similarly anyan transfers his house property in the name of his friend irrevocable transfer friend's name is ambi transfers to his friend ambi irrevocable transfer and transfer is what during the lifetime of ambi during the lifetime of ambi let's say he transferred it on 112012 correct let's say ambi dies on 10th april 2022 and anyan takes back the house on 31st december 2022 some 7 8 months later he will take it back <coughs> now all the income that was deriving from 1st april 1st uh, january 2012 to the date of death 10th april 2022 will be taxed at the hands of ambi only obviously that is what section 62 says it's an exception to revocable transfer section 61 but after he dies the income will be taxed in anyan's hands only because he is taking it back question asked in the mcq see all mcq questions are merging question asked in the mcq is will it be taxed from 10th april 22 or 31st december 22 10th april 22 or 31st december 22 from which date income of from where will it be taxed If you say thirty first December twenty two, what will be? Where will the income go? Whether it's tax free or taxable from April to December, what will happen? So if you see, check it out. It shall be chargeable to income tax as the income of the transferer as and when the power to revoke the transfer arises. Power to revoke, power to withdraw, power to take back the transfer. It will arise from which day? Arise from the date of death, obviously. The day Ambi dies, that is the day you have the power to revoke the transfer. The day Ambi dies, that is the day you have the power to take back the transfer. The power to take back the transfer. That is why 10th April 2022. 10th April 2022. I hope you are getting the point. Got it? That's what it is. So same here. Transfer is not revocable. Yeah, the transfer must not derive any indirect benefit from such thing. Exception is there. Income arising to spouse, son's wife, minor, and HF to be clubbed under Section 64. Income of spouse is covered under 64-1. So check it out. in computing the total income so 641 will check this is done this is done we have understood this one also easy chapter but hidden points are there in mcq that's why i am doing it very much in depth in computing the total income this is 6412 of the individual there shall be included all income which arises directly or indirectly to the spouse of such individual by way of salary commission fees or any other form of remuneration whether in cash or kind from a concern in which such individual has substantial interest provided that nothing in this clause shall apply to any income arising to the spouse where the spouse possesses technical or professional qualifications and the income is solely attributable to the application of his or her technical professional knowledge or experience and what do you mean by substantial interest substantial interest means in case where the concern is a company shares carrying not less than 20% of the voting power and in case of any other case such person or one or more of his relatives are entitled in the aggregate at any time how much 20% of the profits of the concern 
20 percent of the profits of the concern and again one or more of his relatives and we have seen relatives means what guys linear ascendant and descendant so we'll take an example substantial interest so i am reading this one now point number a okay come to f2 point number a where the remuneration is solely attributable to the application of technical or professional qualification knowledge and experience of the spouse such remuneration cannot be clubbed so the person is giving one uh, you know uh, wife controls let's say 40% of an entity and the entity is giving money to the husband 1 lakh rupees per month husband is fourth standard fail what do you think depending on the technical professional qualification is 4 lakh rupees 5 lakh rupees per month for a fourth standard fail is it valid or invalid invalid so will it be clubbed in the wife's hands yes on the other hand if that person fourth standard fail happened to be vijay salagaonkar shyam Correct? Then deadly. Then obviously is brilliant. So yes, if you have the knowledge, qualification, etc., of course you can pay money to that person. Doesn't matter. So it depends on that. Now, if both husband and wife both have substantial interests in the organization and both are in a set of remuneration, before that, let's just see here. Substantial interest means this. Check example. Mr. Shahrukh Khan and relative. Relative means what? Spouse, Gauri Khan, brother, sister, lineal ascendant, descendant. Has substantial interest in a company means what? What is substantial interest? Come here. In a company, more than 20% equity shares is held by whom? Shahrukh Khan and the relatives. Then, for, if it's a firm or LLP, 20% of share in partnership. Employees. So, this is a case where Shahrukh Khan employs whom? First, employees. Mrs. Gauri Khan, wife of Mr. Shah Rukh Khan, an interior designer for a salary of 5 lakhs. Salary of 5 lakhs. She is anyway an interior designer and this is a company which is interior designing. Does she have adequate uh, qualification? Yes. So if you see the arrow mark, salary income of 5 lakhs is not clubbed in the hands of Mr. Shah Rukh Khan. On the other hand, if Mrs. Gauri Khan, assume, was not qualified, then this 5 lakhs would be clubbed in the hands of Mr. Shah Rukh Khan. Now the question will arise, Shah Rukh Khan or his wife also, substantial interest. So if both have substantial interest, what to do? That is point number two. If both husband and wife have substantial interest in a concern and both are in receipt of remuneration from the concern and both do not possess any skill, both are chapar fellows, then such income will be incurred in the hands of that individual whose total income, excluding the income to be clubbed, is greater. So, Shah Rukh Khan is earning, let's say, 10 lakhs and uh, this income is 2 lakhs and Gauri Khan is earning 5 lakhs and this, this income is 5 lakhs. Correct? Now, in this case, both are what? Or oh, this is, let's say, 6 lakhs from the interior designing company. Both do not possess any skill and both are in receipt of remuneration. Both have substantial interest. Then I should, if you think about it, here it is 12 or let's make it uh, 9 or 8. Here it is 10, here it is 11. So should I club it in the hands of uh, Gauri Khan? No, check it out. Both husband and wife are substantial interest and both are in this remuneration and both husband and wife do not possess any skill. Such income will be clubbed in the hands of that individual whose total income excluding the income to be clubbed is greater. So, Shah Rukh Khan's total income is 80 lakh, Gauri Khan is 5 lakh, ignore 2 and 6, this 6 lakh will be clubbed in whose hands? Shah Rukh Khan's hands. So, Shah Rukh Khan's income will be 8 plus 2 plus 5. Sorry, plus 6 is 6 only, no? 8 plus 2 plus 6. 8 plus 2 plus 6. And once it is clubbed in Shah Rukh Khan's hands, can it be shifted to Gauri Khan is the question. So, once income is clubbed in the hands of either spouse, it shall continue to be clubbed in the hands of the same individual in any succeeding year unless... The assessing officer is satisfied after giving to that spouse an opportunity to be heard that is necessary to do so. So, if you see, the uh, if the AO feels that no, I should now shift the clubbing burden, etc., he can do so. But, principles of natural justice have to be followed. Reasonable opportunity of being heard, P-O-N-J, has to be followed. Husband means what? We have seen already. Second, 
where an asset is transferred to the spouse by the individual otherwise than for adequate consideration or in connection with an agreement to live apart the income arising from such asset also will be 6414 6414 so guys this is what where asset is transferred to the spouse by an individual as a c otherwise than for adequate consideration otherwise than for adequate consideration so if you see for 6414 two things are not covered one agreement to live apart and second asset is transferred to the spouse by the individual ssc asset is transferred to the spouse by individual ssc all other cases so if you see you see that wording for the section subject to the provisions of 271 the spouse of such individual from assets transferred directly or indirectly to the spouse by such individual otherwise than for adequate consideration or in connection with an agreement to live apart so if you see here in the chart adequate consideration means clubbing will not come and one more thing spouse here agreement to live apart clubbing will not come so husband or other let's say wife gives husband a house as part of the agreement to live apart wife is earning really well husband is bcom husband house husband correct we will tell house wife house wife stupidly no he is house husband so he will get one house because he is house husband so what is that that clubbing and all will not come because it's an agreement to live apart divorce proceedings on the other hand if there is adequate consideration adequate consideration no problem the husband has paid money market value that to properly paid through banking channels no tension whatsoever then what's the issue so it's there is no beyond arms length price and all that it is within arms length price absolutely no problem but it's inadequate Now, if it is a house, sixty-four one four will not come. That's what they are trying to tell, because it says subject to section twenty-seven. Section twenty-seven is deemed owner. So, if for example, husband has property P Q R S, right? So R S he will show in his books P Q, correct? R and S he will claim as uh, what do you say? Self. self occupied wife wife will claim pq as self occupied husband is claiming rs as self occupied wife is claiming pq as self occupied problem so what happens for a husband's annual value will be nil wife also annual value will be nil so even under clubbing If I use sixty four one four and club the wife's income in husband's hands, husband's income in wife's hands, whatever it is, annual value will be nil because I am using it as residential property, self occupied. Hence, this was happening, guys. That is why they inserted one clause called what? Subject to section twenty seven. Because if you go to sub twenty uh, seven, what does it say? For the purposes of 2226, an individual who transfers otherwise than for adequate consideration any house property to his or her spouse, not being a transfer in connection with an agreement to live apart, as discussed. If it's an agreement to live apart, no problem. But if it is not agreement to live apart, or to a minor child not being a married daughter, shall be deemed to be the owner of the house property so transferred. So, guys, in this case, husband will be the owner of all P Q R S. so for rs it is self occupied property for pq it is deemed let out property and of the four they have to calculate whichever is higher he has to pay as per law deemed let out why deemed let out property because you are a deemed owner under section 27 because people were clubbing nil income in each other's hand section 27 was inserted and in 64 1 uh, 4 this amendment was made so 
That is why this is the logic. When house is transferred, section 27 will apply. 6414 will not apply. When other items are transferred, like gold, whatever, then 6414 will come into the picture. Got it? We change the battery. Yes. Now you know. Good. Okay. Notes to B above, which is B, this only guys. Come down. Everything in a structured format I have given, nothing to worry. Concept of deemed owner. Explained in section 27, I already did now. The marital relationship between husband and wife should exist both at the time of transfer of the asset and the time of accrual of income in order to attract clubbing provisions. So basically, if, what they are trying to tell is, if I give my house to my fiancé and later the rental income she is taking, will the clubbing provisions apply? No. Similarly, son's wife is also there, no? If the father-in-law or and or mother-in-law gives the asset to prospective daughter-in-law. Will clubbing provisions apply? No. Check. Miss Alia received a gift of 10 lakh from her boyfriend, Mr. Ranbir. After they both got married, Mr. Ranbir gifted Mrs. Alia another 5 lakh. In this case, the first 10 lakh will be taxed in the hands of Miss Alia only as there was no marital relationship. Before marriage, no marital relationship. After marriage, along with marital, change the wordings, martial relationship also. Karate. Right? Yes. Shh. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Then what? No marital relationship between Miss Alia and Miss Ranbir. However, 5 lakh will be taxed in the hands of Ms. Ranbir as Ms. Alia and Mr. Ranbir were married and this was transfer of asset without consideration to spouse. Sir, Alia will earn more than Ranbir. Don't connect it to the film actors. Just an example, guys. Income on the asset transferred is clubbed but not income on the accretion to the asset. Accretion means addition. So, I will gift gold to you. You will keep gold and then get some, you know, uh, well, let's say I will transfer some 10 lakhs to you. With that 10 lakhs, you will go by debentures. Correct? Income on the asset is clubbed. Or well, let's take a simple example. That other part I will come later. Uh, huh, I will transfer my house to you. You will get rental income. That rental income you will go and deposit in the bank. Bank will give you FD interest. Will that also be clubbed? No. Income on income is not clubbed. Mr. Mota, an individual transferred a flat to his wife, Mrs. Moti, okay, who derived rental income from the flat. Such rental income will be clubbed in Mr. Mota's hands. However, Mrs. Moti invested such rental income in fixed deposit and derived interest income from such fixed deposits. Such interest income cannot be clubbed in the hands of Mr. Mota. Hence, income on the asset is transferred is cloud, but not the income on the accretion. So, Mrs. Moti, if she is waiting in the bank, it is called motivating. PJ, PJ, PJ. Sorry, sorry. Correct, no? Yes or no? Moti, waiting in the bank, motivating. Where an asset transferred by spouse is converted to another form. Income derived from such converted asset also shall be clubbed. Now, this I can give you an example. I gave you money. Money I didn't put in the bank. I bought some debentures from that. And from debentures I started earning interest. Yes. Allowed. I mean, it will be clubbed. Mr. Vyas gives a sum of 50 lakh to Mrs. Vyas on the occasion of wedding anniversary. Mrs. Vyas invests a sum in a fixed deposit, which derives interest income of 25,000 per month. The income so derived shall be clubbed in the hands of despite the fact that it is not the 
it is income of what converted asset converted asset allowed income of income not allowed i have made a animation video just like you saw for movie producers etc that movie thing here also i have made i have not made for minor and all that's easy i have made it for these things it will help you i'll play it after that don't worry uh yeah if any individual transfers any asset to any person without or for inadequate consideration for the benefit of deferred benefit of spouse then income shall be taxable in the hands of the transferor what is this what is this so this is uh, 64 1 7 uh, and 8 for son and son's wife both here any person should be read as wife spouse son's wife to make that change addition here so what used to happen was husband used to create a trust and transfer money into the trust and trust was paying the money to whom to the wife or the son's wife let's say after investing that money for 15 years 15 years later it would go to the uh, this thing what do you say wife now it issue went to court because assessing officer clubbed his income he said i am not giving to the spouse or uh, what do you say somebody else i am giving it to a trust issue went to court court said yes you are right so they did not like it the government the lawmaker did not like it that's why he inserted this provision now any individual transfers any asset to any person that is spouse or sorry sorry not this guy sorry sorry my bad it's given here only no spouse here you write spouse or son's wife my bad spouse or son's wife. this for any person please write down trust slash aop slash boi my bad here you write down spouse or son's wife here any person within bracket trust slash aop boi son's wife same point is covered here son's wife same point is covered here if an individual transfers any asset to any person like for example trust aop boi without or for inadequate consideration either zero consideration or inadequate for the benefit of deferred benefit of son's wife such income from the asset whatever the trust is investing in whatever income comes shall be taxable in the hands of the transferor very much so shall be done so so direct transfer indirect transfer is also covered in all these things so if i transfer to my wife and wife will in turn transfer it to my do uh, the daughter in law covered or indirect transfers are also covered only legal separation between the spouse could avoid clubbing in case of transfer of property in a very voluntary agreement to live apart clubbing will apply so voluntary agreement they they are talking about legal separation so separation must be legal voluntarily if you say that no i don't want to it's a social obligation i don't want to live with you different it should like they fight couple fight and the husband runs away couple i mean the wife runs away then they live apart for a few for some time that is not covered here clubbing will still apply the exemption will not apply clubbing will apply but if it's a legal separation divorce then yes one of my friends went through a bad divorce i remember so they lived apart for around one year till the case was going on and then the uh, court granted the divorce so for that one year will clubbing apply yes after one year once the legal separation is done clubbing will not apply where the wife saves money out of the money provider for household expenses called pin money which is called pin money yeah the amount will not be treated as assets transferred by the husband and clubbing will not apply like i remember my mom is a homemaker i will never call anybody housewife homemaker homemaker's job is the most difficult job because it is 24 hours 7 days a week no break no sick leave no remuneration no appreciation nothing only depreciation right so my dad used to pay some money to my mom and my mom used to save up something i still remember very sweet of her to do it on his 60th uh, birthday when he retired from forest service after serving almost 
40 plus years. He joined the service at 18, so 42 years of service to the Indian Forest Department, Indian Forest Service, service, Karnataka Forest Department. My mom gifted my dad out of the pin money that he had, uh, he had given her a nice, what do you say, leather, uh, this thing, what do you say, couch, recliner. So in these uh, movie theaters, PVR and all that, gold class, if you go, that recliner will come, no automatic recliner. So that we got for him. That was purely from the savings that she had made. Now tell me, if the dad keeps on paying some money, is that also clubbing? No, that's what they're trying to tell. Natural love and affection may be good consideration, but not adequate consideration for the purpose of 64.1. So in Indian Contract Act, Section 25, they say, Agreement without consideration is void ab initio. Any agreement without consideration is void ab initio. But there is an exception in section 25 of Indian Contract Act. That is, written and registered agreement arising out of natural love and affection between the parties. So, one of the examples that was, uh, you know, uh, Rajaluki versus Bhutnath. One case clause there. CA Foundation, I am, you know, doing a recap. So, their husband could not take the torture of the wife. Husband said, hey, please shut your mouth, I'll give you some 20,000 rupees per month. So, quarreling, constant quarreling. So, the husband started giving money to the wife. If it was not written and registered, then agreement is void. Balfour versus Balfour, if you remember. But if it's written and registered, still is it valid or void? Still it is void. Because here, written and registered agreement was there, but it was not arising out of love and affection. General rule, agreement without consideration is void. Exception, written and registered agreement arising out of natural love and affection. So, when there is social obligation, Balfour versus Balfour, no contract. Even if there is a written and registered agreement, if there is no natural love and affection, then it will be what? Uh, still, it will be void. That is why taking the features of contract act in this case law, they are telling that natural love and affection may be good consideration, be good consideration. So, there is an exception under section 25 of Indian Contract Act. It is not adequate consideration for the purposes of 64.1. Correct? Basically, here what happened was one fellow gave the uh, free asset free of cost to the wife. Assessing officer clubbed the income. He said, no sir, consideration she has given. What consideration? Every morning she gives me food. She takes care of my family. She takes care of me. She takes care of my children. So, that is adequate consideration. For that I am giving. Quoted a cheating because love and affection cannot be measured. Unconditional love and all you will tell no, all that yes. Unconditional love. See, we can be good with so I mean, we can change our accent, change our uh, English as well with some classy people who generally who meet with unconditional love and affection. With normal people, our friends, love, oh, love, we are doing all that. Thing, okay, so keep changing, guys. Come on, we should be like chameleons, keep changing and mingling with people. Even my t-shirt is like one gift wrapper, correct, no? I am seeing now in the screen. Looks like some gift wrapper, full shining, shining. Obviously, it has to be the gift wrapper because I am the gift. Yes or no? Yes. I know you are clapping there because of this dialogue. I am the present. So, obviously, it should be wrapped by a gift wrapper. Yes. Sir, color, color dress and all you come and wear. Fancy dress competition. Are you a teacher or a fancy dress fellow? Everything. Yes. So, natural love and affection will be good consideration, but not adequate consideration. Throat is full, gone guys. <coughs> Excuse me. This mic captures everything. So, if I am drinking the water going inside, everything will come. Yeah. That is what it is. <coughs> now, what used to happen? Can I do this? Husband gives a loan. Smart boy, loan to wife. Wife buys some debentures. Debenture will fetch interest. Interest, can it be clubbed? Please see here. Asset is transferred. Loan is not an asset. Loan is not an asset. Important point, you are already given. All these they will ask in the exam, MCQ. Husband gave a loan to wife at 
zero percent interest. Oh, suddenly inadequate consideration. Gave a loan irrevocable transfer. Oh, irrevocable sixty two. Guys, do not go to sixty one sixty two. That is why it says other cases. Other cases revocable, irrevocable. Yes. Here you see for spouse. I don't care. For spouse and son's wife, I don't care. Specific section will override the general section. So for spouse or son's wife, whether it's revocable, irrevocable, all this should not matter. Specific section will override the general section. What if an NRA gives some shares to the wife? So guys, wife of in, uh, wife of uh, an NRA, but the company's Infosys. Infosys shares. If I give again, if you go to section nine of uh, you know Income Tax Act, any income arising or deemed to accrue or arise in India will be clubbed. So if a non-resident gifts. shares of infosys to wife since shares of infosys is from it's a resident because the office is in india correct so it is deemed to accrue or arise in india and hence clubbed hence clubbed so similarly if you see i think there was a question also this mahesh and madhunika are non resident living in amsterdam they have interest in rental income in india as well as abroad minor child kai is living with grandparents okay this is the children so we'll see that later this is for the wife 64 one we'll come to one and see that later don't worry so this is uh, govindram t jarani is law New Delhi, Govindram T. Jarani. See all that I've written it down. Analysis, right? Govindram T. Jarani. An individual asset transfer an asset without or for inadequate consideration of the son's wife. Any income derived from such will be taxable in the hands of the individual. If any individual transfer any asset, this we have told for the future thing. Yes. On the other hand, Sixty four, one, four, and six. Any asset? If I am using it as a capital contribution in a partnership firm, what to do? Asset which is transferred, like for example, money. Husband gifts money to wife, or wife gives money to husband. Husband uses it as uses it as a capital contribution in a partnership firm, or he can invest in business. Money, for example. If it is invested in business, the proportionate income is clubbed. For example, I gave money two lakh. You invested six lakh, out of which this two lakh is also included. Correct, and you derive for the entire income, you will derive some sixty thousand rupees income. So what is it? Sixty thousand rupees income. Is for full six lakhs. So for two lakhs, how much is it? Twenty thousand rupees will be clubbed, proportionate like that. No, it should be clubbed. But if you put in the capital contribution in a partnership firm, 
इनकम डिराइव फ्रॉम द पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म इनकम डिराइव फ्रॉम द पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म इनकम डिराइव एज सैलरी नो क्लबिंग बिकॉज गाइस सैलरी एज गॉट नथिंग टू डू विद द मनी दैट यू आर पम इनकम डिराइव एज वट यू से शेयर ऑफ प्रॉफिट guys if you know share of profit is an exempt transfer under 102a anyway exempt so it will not come what is club then any interest on capital we have seen no in partnership firm interest on capital this only will be clubbed this only will be clubbed hope you got it that is a part that would be clubbed nothing else same thing given here transfer as a individual to spouse son's wife without or for adequate inadequate consideration yes income from the business my example 60000 into value of transfer 2 lakh by capital of the business 6 lakh mr bun mr han see same thing profit is 3 lakh profit taxable mr han 3 lakh into 2 lakh by 7 lakh 8515 other one is remaining amount clubbing provision shall not apply when the gifted amount is not part of the opening balance of capital because guys see here it says capital of business on the first day of the previous year here on 142021 if she had gifted on 15th april 2021 right then this both was on 1st april that's why i took you know overall 7 lakh if this was gifted on 15th april 2021 and for the year 21 22 this gift of 2 lakh will not be considered it will be considered for the next year 22 23 onwards it will be considered hope you understood that right so basically here very clearly capital of the business on the first day of the previous year is what you should consider in my example bun and uh, you know got the amount on 1st april assume she got it on 10th april when i do the denominator here generally i take 7 lakhs right so your 7 lakhs will not come that year 7 lakhs will come next year so keep that in mind right so all these things hf also similar thing cross transfers and one important this whatever i have given no extremely important pointers for mcqs general law applicable to the clubbing for club clubbing of income so let us now do for minor child okay minor child will do before minor child i will show you the video for what i will show you the video as i told you to revise till now whatever we have done correct this video is for us to revise till now whatever we have done we will revise hello my dear friends as you know a person is taxed in respect of his own income but what happens when the tax payers make an attempt to reduce their tax liability by transferring their assets to their family members like father mother brother sister wife etc such that they can continue to enjoy the benefits in order to curb these practices the income tax department introduced the sections 60 to 64 and these provisions are called clubbing of income provisions which is very very important for ca inter and ca final Hello my dear friends my name is Punarvas Jaykumar and welcome to my YouTube channel Punarvas Jaykumar classes today we will be discussing some interesting aspects in clubbing of income before we begin i request you to please subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you can always be updated about such videos 
Let us see some interesting illustrations to understand the concept of clubbing. Let's do it. If a husband transfers his house worth 1 crore to his wife without adequate consideration, let's say for 10,000 rupees, then the income generated from that house, that is the rental income, would be clubbed, that is added to the husband's income. Clubbing would still apply if the asset is given to the daughter-in-law instead of wife. Rental income would be clubbed with the father-in-law's income. If the husband transfers his house to his wife and the wife in turn transfers this house to their daughter-in-law, would clubbing provisions apply? Yes, because section 64 subsection 1 clause 6 covers direct or indirect transfers and here there was an indirect transfer. However, if the wife buys the home for 1 crore rupees from the husband, there would be no clubbing because this would be adequate consideration. Also, if the husband has given his house as part of divorce proceedings, that is alimony, then there would be no clubbing as well. In order to circumvent these provisions, an individual used to form a trust in which the beneficiary is the individual's wife or his daughter-in-law. The individual then used to transfer a house valued say 2 crore to the trust for just 10,000 rupees. Let's say the house earned an income of 10 lakh rupees every year which has as per the trust deed accumulated for around 15 years and then the amount of 1.5 crores would be paid to the beneficiary that is the wife or the daughter-in-law. Would this income be clubbed with the individual? The Supreme Court said that the income was accruing to a trust and not to the wife or the daughter-in-law. In order to nullify this Supreme Court judgment, lawmakers brought in 6417 and 6418 to include association of persons as well, for example, trusts. So now the income of the trust that is 10 lakh rupees per annum will be clubbed in the individual's hands from year number one itself. Whew, very nice examples, don't you think? Let us see some more interesting examples, my dear friends. A husband gifts his wife some gold. Wife sells this gold and buys shares of a company. Will the dividend income received on the shares be clubbed with the husband's income? Interesting to note that the clubbing shall continue to apply even if the transferee has converted the transferred assets to some other form. So in this case, the dividend income would be clubbed at the hands of the husband. The husband transfers 2 crore worth of debentures to his wife, which fetches a rate of interest of let's say 10%. The wife will earn an interest of 20 lakh rupees. She deposits this 20 lakh rupees and creates a fixed deposit on which she gets an interest of let's say 1 lakh rupees. Would this 1 lakh be clubbed in the hands of the husband? It is interesting to understand that the income arising out of income earned on transferred assets will not be clubbed. Therefore, this fixed deposit interest of 1 lakh rupees will not be clubbed. Yes, my dear friends, income on income will not be clubbed. Next example, husband gives his wife 10,000 shares of X Limited. X Limited issues bonus shares of let's say 1,000 to the wife. Now the wife sells these 1000 bonus shares in the open market. Would the capital gain arising out of sale of bonus shares be clubbed at the hands of the husband? The law says income arising from accretions that is additions to the assets transferred will not be clubbed. Next example, the husband gives an interest free loan of 1 crore to his wife. The wife deposits this amount as a fixed deposit and earns an interest of 10 lakh rupees per annum. Would this 10 lakh rupees be clubbed in the hands of the husband? It is very interesting to know that loan is not considered as a transfer. Clubbing will apply where assets transferred by the individual to spouse, assets must be transferred. Giving a loan is not considered to be transfer of assets. But instead of a loan, if the husband had gifted the same amount, then the income of 10 lakh rupees would obviously be clubbed at the hands of the husband. 
these were just a very few examples my dear friends there is still a lot more to learn in the chapter of clubbing please support this initiative by liking subscribing but more importantly commenting below if you want part 2 of clubbing chapter and also let me know what other concepts you want me to handle thank you so much my dear friends for all your love love you all punarvas jai kumar signing off yes guys so hope you enjoyed the video yes it took a lot of efforts to do that video hope you enjoyed my animated avatar right okay so done let's see minor child Sixty four one A. In computing the total income of any individual, there shall be included all such income as arises or accrues to his minor child, not being a minor suffering from any disability under ATU. So, if you see. this was inserted in 1994 by mr manmohan singh provided that nothing in this subsection shall apply in respect of such income as arising or accrues to the minor on account of any manual work done by him or activity involving application of his skill talent or specialized knowledge and experience So, guys, as far as minors are concerned, minors' assets or minors' income is clubbed in the hands of the, you know, parent. Which parent we will see, but under sixty-four one a. But there are three exceptions. Exception number one, where he does manual work, no clubbing. Child labor, though there is obviously child labor prevention of child labor act and all was there, but now anybody above fourteen can definitely work in India. Unfortunately, that's the truth. They work, so you will get that. Uh, what do you say that money that you make will not be clubbed then anything activity involving skill talent knowledge prithvi shaw at the age of 16 years earned some 1 crore deal when he was picked up by i think one of those teams mumbai if i'm not wrong no not mumbai no, mumbai only right yeah then now then he shift was across various places he went then uh, yashasvi jaiswal he is also 16 17 year old kid like that child actors all many child actors you would have seen in many wonderful movies all these people if they get money it will not be clubbed third one manmohan singh added that disability clause if you are disabled where you are claiming deduction for your child under atu as in if your child is disabled handicapped so of course uh, whatever planning you do like this that is okay so apart from these three in all cases it will be clubbed one doubt may arise if you are a minor married child again in india all this happens guys clubbing will happen under 6414 which is the spouse husband's thing or it will be under 641a again the specific section should override the general section here it's very generic in nature but this is clearly saying specific and if you see 6414 it doesn't say spouse who is uh, major and all that that you have to cl clearly see here spouse of such individual who is a major nothing they say so everything will come into the picture for the purpose of this subsection where the marriage of the parent subsists in the income of that parent to total income is greater so if the parents are married then where will it be clubbed in the hands of the mom or dad whosoever total income is excluding this income whosoever total income is higher 
or where the marriage is not happening does not subsist if the income of that parent who maintains the minor child in the previous year maintains the minor child in the previous year basically here it means that who has custody who has primary custody there will be joint custody also but primary custody also who has primary custody so that's custody that will uh, come here whoever has custody that parent it will be clubbed in their hands where any such in one included of course once included in one parent will not be included in any other parent as such if both the parents are dead then it's a different thing uh, you know we'll have to see what to do so will it be included in the legal guardian correct so income of the minor child what do you think will there be clubbing when both parents are dead no because it's here, clearly sees here where the marriage of his parents subsist or marriage does not subsist talking about marriage what if their life only is no longer there if they are dead then obviously it will not be clubbed so minor will have to file income tax through her guardian once clubbing of minor's income is done same thing child includes obviously step child and adopted child of that individual but does not include illegitimate child step child is there definitely so basically if a person gets married to one more uh, a lady who is already married with children who was married before divorced with children then of course yes step child or adopted child legally if you have adopted some child that child also will come illegitimate child so anything born out of wedlock will not be covered under that you need to remember so when any income of the minor is clubbed with that of the parent exemption of 1500 rupees per annum chapadasi exemption or income clubbed per minor child whichever is less shall be taxable useless shall be uh, available to the parent not taxable shall be available to the parent 1032 income of to a minor by way of winning from lottery so exemption at section 1032 cannot be availed by the parent if the minor wins some lottery income of minor married daughter would be clubbed in the hands of either parent one part or you can write husband many courts have held husband also correct because it is specific section overriding the general section minor unmarried that's okay minor married it is specific section override and section there are many areas where this is also covered many areas is also covered in the exam you can write either uh, in the mcq generally stick to the husband thing only clubbing shall not apply when disability all these three things you have already done any investment made out of the income of the minor which cannot be clubbed with that of the parent so if that income whatever the minor earns if it is uh, what do you say invested somewhere and that interest is earned yes interest income earned on such investment will be clubbed with that of the parents that is one part of the story other part let's see what is the other part investment will not be clubbed but the income on investment will be clubbed so in this particular case in these three cases especially let's say your prithvi shaw's dad prithvi shaw earned 1 crore rupees prithvi shaw invested that 1 crore in an fd will that be clubbed in the father's hands no but the income from that see interest income earned on such investment will be clubbed with that of the parents so yes investment will not be clubbed the fact that you invested that will not be clubbed but the interest will be clubbed that you need to keep that in mind eleventh one is a normal point twelfth one also i have seen i have told you already disabled no clubbing interest dividend rent from investments clubbed in the hands of the parent manual work taxable in the hands of the minor child alone no clubbing income derived by minor from the activity involving application of skill etc taxable in the hands of the minor child alone no clubbing but interest on fd derived by minor child when money received by such minor child is from manual work or application of skill interest on fd that is clubbed in the hands of the parent prithvi shaw receiving 1 crore that is not clubbed 
But when Prithvi Shaw puts it in a FD and gets interest, that will be clubbed. Similarly, where a trust is created for the benefit of the minor child without any rights attached to enjoy such benefits, but deferred to a date after he attains majority, income could not be clubbed till he attains majority. So, income will not be clubbed if there is any trust. So, from the 19th year onwards, obviously, or 18th year onwards, it will become his property only anyway. Income of minor child of a non-resident cannot be clubbed if such income accrues or arises outside India. Such income is taxable in the hands of the minor child if he is a resident only. Section 5 cannot override 64. Based on that only one question had come. See. Mahesh and Madhunika are non-resident living in Amsterdam. They have interest in rental income in India as well as abroad. Minor child Kai is living. Uh, is with grandparents in Delhi and is resident of India. Kai earned interest income from fixed deposits held in banks and companies both in Amsterdam and in India. Mayesh and Madhulika filed returns disclosing their Indian income and interest income of minor child earned in India clubbed. Separate return was uh, also done as guardian. Here wants to club everything. Section 5 restricts scope of income only to income received accrued or deemed to accrue arise in India. 641A envisages to club the income of minor child in the hands of the parents. Any income of resident minor child earned in India alone shall be clubbed. Any income of resident occurring outside India cannot be clubbed. Hence, bank interest from Amsterdam, etc., cannot be clubbed in the hands of his father as he is a non resident. <coughs> so, where a member of the HUF has transferred an asset with or for adequate in, uh, inadequate consideration to HUF, income arising from such asset is taxable as the transferor member. So, this was a, uh, what do you say, tax evas evasion, tax evasion tool, tool for tax evasion whereby a member used to create a HUF and HUF used to invest. <coughs> so, I mean, in earn income. So, there also is clubbed in the hands of this. All that I have given here, very Interesting, we will see that in a while. General notes and other things. Especially this one. General law applicable to clubbing of income. Study that and go. For clubbing, it is not essential that the SSE's own income, excluding income to be clubbed, must exceed the taxable limit. There is nothing like that. No, nothing. It says that excluding the uh, clubbed income, it should exceed the taxable limit. Nothing like that. Everything will be clubbed. Husband or wife have equal income or no income apart from what needs to be clubbed and it cannot be established whose income is greater. Clubbing fails and income shall be assessed in the hand of the minor. Deadly. Basically, parents have no income. This fellow has income. Clubbed. Then uh, uh, under whose name? Nobody's name. So, it will be clubbed in the minor's name. Minor's chi minor child's income of agriculture will be included in the hands of the parent with a higher income for the purpose of aggregation, even though such agricultural income is exempt under 1011. Where a member of the HF has transferred with or without, yes, the transfer asset is subsequently partitioned. So, if partitioning happens, where I will uh, transfer an asset to a Hindu undivided family, then no, I mean, then normally if it is income arising from the asset, is uh, you know, clubbed there. So, when it's transferred, Till the date, till the date of the, what do you say, actual participant. So, let us say, Mr. A puts this property in the HUF on 1-1-2022, till 30th, 6, 2022. On 30th, 6, 2022, it is partitioned and it is divided 20% each. 20% to wife, 20% to minor son, minor daughter, major son, major daughter. Now tell me guys. Till From the date he transferred till the date of partition, it is clubbed in A's name only. Correct. That's a 10% to the wife. And 10% to A also it will go, no? Now, after the partition happens, the income etc. will go where? Partition happens but it continues, the investment continues, interest will keep getting. So, 10% will be taxed in A's hand only. 
whatever has gone to the wife will be taxed in A's hand only. Minor son, minor daughter, tax in A's hand. Only these two things, major son, major daughter, that will not be taxed. In A's name, it will be taxed in their individual names. That is what this says. Clubbing provision shall be applied only when there is a transaction of gift. In case money is lent to another person, loan already, which creates lender-borrower relationship, it is not a transfer already discussed. If the asset is sold by the transferee, then the capital gain also shall be clubbed. No mercy. We have seen that in the whatever we had uh, shown. Income from for clubbing purpose also includes loss. Yes, you can club the loss also and you can also... When you club the loss, it will be benefit for the person, right? It's good. Benefit is also allowed. Income is a subject matter of clubbing shall be first computed in the hands of the transferee under the appropriate head with all permissible exemption, deduction, etc. Net income only will be clubbed. So when I transfer house property, etc., that fellow will transfer, I mean, not to the spouse, let's say to the son's wife. Then the son's wife will, uh, I mean, uh, subtract all those municipal tax, etc., everything and whatever remains, only that will be clubbed. Who in turn sells it for capital gain? Capital gain would be first be computed in our hands with all relevant exemptions and deductions like 54, 54 EC and then net taxable capital gains only shall be clubbed. Cross transfer. Two transactions are interconnected. Mr. A sells it to Mrs. B. Mrs. B and Mr. B gives it to Mrs. A. Full cross connection. And Mrs. A transfers to the, like this cross transfers. That also will be clubbed. Device for evasion of tax, clubbing provision shall be invoked. Sharuk gives a sum of 10 lakhs to Mrs. Karina, who is the wife of Mr. Saif Ali Khan. Here you see. Sharuk Saif Ali Khan. Sharuk gives a gift of 10 lakhs to Karina. Saif Ali Khan gives a gift of 5 lakhs to Gauri. So this gift will be in the hands of Sharuk Khan. This gift in the hands of Saif Ali Khan. Nothing can be done. Keshav Murarji, case law, Supreme Court. Income from gift received from Mrs. Karina will be clubbed in the hands of Saif Ali Khan. Cross transfers. In case of clubbing, person in whose name the asset stands shall be liable on the service of notice of demand by the AO. So yes, AO will send a notice of demand at 156. It will be clubbed. Who will be given to? Whose name the asset stands. Name matters. The so general law for the chapter of clubbing, the clubbing shall continue to apply even if the transferee has converted the transfer to some other form. House property is transferred to son's wife and she sells the house property and buys debenture. Income from debenture also will be clubbed, we have seen. Chapter of clubbing income shall include loss also. Loss is also to be clubbed. Even if the transferee sells the transfer as a capital gains also shall be clubbed, we have seen. Income arising out of income has, you know, has not to be, will not be clubbed. We have seen that already. Clubbed income shall be retained under the same head. Therefore, business income of a minor child shall be clubbed in the hands of parent under the head PGBP. Deductions available under five heads of income shall be allowed and income after such deduction only shall be clubbed. Interest-free loan as discussed, loan is not transfer. But if gift is given, then clubbing shall apply. Cross transfer, just a revision tool, revision. HOF is a partner in a firm ABC through its karta, Mr. X, and has 25% share in the profits of the firm. Wife of Mr. X guys, wife of Mr. X is employed by firm ABC. It's there corrected in your thing. Don't worry. In this case, clubbing shall not apply because Mr. X is a partner in the representing or not in the individual capacity. So here, HUF is the partner of the firm ABC. How will HUF be only through the karta, right, Mr. X? And it has 20, HUF has 25% share in the profit of the firm. Wife of Mr. X is employed by the firm ABC. And wife is being paid salary. Will clubbing apply? No. Because X is a partner, not in his individual capacity, but in the representative capacity. 
So kindly see this very interesting word here. In uh, 64.1. In computing the road limb of any individual. Doesn't say HF. Page F1. It says individual, right? So only individual thing should come there. Hope you got the point. If a trust is created for the benefit of a minor child, then the income of the trust shall be clubbed with the income of the parent under 64 1A. This shall apply even if the trust deed provided the income shall be accumulated by trust and shall be given to a minor child when he attains majority. Clubbing provision under 64 1A shall apply since the income accrues for the benefit of the minor child although it may be given on attaining majority. So this 10th point is what is followed in ICAI. This is an exception to this particular law. After that many cases came, this first one. Correct? So this you can ignore if you want. Because it was nullified by this. This is what you need to follow. ICI. Okay. So if a trust you create also, it will be clubbed. Then deemed donor, we saw deemed donor will just quickly, it's house property, deemed donor. One is this one, deemed donor. Holder of an impartible estate shall be deemed to be the individual owner of all the properties. So earlier, no, for all the, uh, what do you say? Uh, people who were going and telling the secrets to the British, the British were giving property as rewards. So that reward is called as an impartible estate. And that will be deemed to be the, I mean the holder of the impartible estate. That is passed on to various uh, generations. Whoever is holding that estate, though it doesn't belong to him, but it belongs to his parents, father, whatever it is, that person is also deemed to be the owner, just to make it absolutely clear. Similarly, in these homes, etc., uh, if you are registered as a cooperative society, the cooperative society holds the uh, all the houses there in the apartment and shares will be given to the owners in the cooperative society. The building, etc., the land will, and building will be owned by the cooperative society and the owner of that particular flat will be given shares. So is he the owner of the shares or owner of the flat? Obviously deemed to be owner of the flat is what this point number 3 says. Then other thing you leave, it's fine. Other, these three things are enough for us to understand. One more thing guys, just we can, for your knowledge, we'll just do that also. Section 65, once that asked in MCQ, I'll just cover that. You can make a note somewhere. Where by reason of provisions of 27.1, income of any asset or from membership in the firm, including the total income of the SSC, person in whose name such asset stands or a member of the firm will be what? Will be attributable. Where it is held jointly, jointly and severally payable. It's there in the notes here. In whose name the asset stands shall be liable on the service of a notice. Means what? Person in whose name the asset stands shall be liable, which means if my property is there and I have given it to my wife, whose name is the property in now, it's in the name of my wife. And let us say there is a tax demand on me and I am unable to pay. Then the this section says assessing officer can ask the wife also to pay. Assessing officer can ask the wife to pay. So for example, if my total... Uh, Income is 30 lakhs after clubbing, of which I have to pay, uh, let's say, 3 lakh amount. And in that 30 lakh, 10 lakh is the one that is clubbed. So, proportionately, 3 lakh into 10 by 30. That is 1 lakh can be recovered from my wife. That is what this actually means. 
section 65. So that my dear buddies completes clubbing of income easy provisions. Please go through all the questions and solve. Okay. Very much in depth we have done. Beyond this not needed. Everything we have covered. Okay. Ciao.